Test. One, two. Test. Test.
downstairs <laughs> okay. all right well good morning everyone on this rainy Santa Fe morning we're very blessed to have the rain with us today um, and as we do for every event that we have at the Institute of American Indian Arts we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement the Institute of American Indian Arts respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the traditional homeland hey, Siri, of call Bob Martin Sorry. Calling Actually. Robert Martin. <laughs> hey, Lauren, could you uh, mute your Zoom? <laughs> Thank you. Um, for the land acknowledgement, the Institute of American Indian Arts respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the traditional homelands of the Tanawan and Kara speaking people. We honor and thank them for their graciousness as stewards for the land for time immemorial. We're fortunate today to be gathered for a symposium celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Institute of American Indian Arts and the 50th anniversary of the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. Today's program will consist of five panels, including a keynote panel presented by Mr. Lauren Kiva, IAI board chair, Dr. Robert Martin, IAI president, and our very special guest, Ms. Carrie Billy, president of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. We will have three panels of alumni representing the three historic campuses and closing panel with the heads of each of our divisions sharing their current work and visions for the future of IAIA. Each panel will conclude uh, with a 15 minute Q&A session when we welcome questions from our guests. We will also have a lunch at noon and we'll, that will include a performance by our student performing arts club. For those in person, we please ask that you not stream this event on your phone in order to avoid feedback. For those joining via Zoom who wish to ask questions, Please use your raised hand function during the Q&A so we can acknowledge your question. Please be sure that you have your name listed on your Zoom video so we can call you by name. And once called, please unmute yourself to ask the question. Thank you again for joining us today on this historic celebration. And without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Robert Martin, President of the Institute of American Indian Arts. Thank you, Felipe, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this 6050 symposium. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, we've been celebrating all year. Our theme is making history, and today we're going to reflect, we're going to share some memories of each of our decades, and we've invited alums, as uh, Felipe said, and uh, it's, it's my honor to serve as president here. and at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and I've been here for 15 years, and uh, we've, uh, we've come together as a team to work on uh, seeing what we can do here to uh, enhance the mission of the Institute of American Indian Arts, and that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. But, um, you know, we have uh, uh, a storied history, and we opened in uh, 1962 at the Santa Fe Indian School, and uh, we've had an evolving mission since. We were a high school then, and, and we brought students from all over the country, uh, about 90 tribes represented, and uh, we, uh, we brought them together and allowed them to, for, uh, uh, to uh, develop their own creativity. In fact, it was their culture and their heritage that uh, have allowed them to, that was the basis for uh, uh, their artwork and their, uh, their expression here and 
we had a, it led to a bold new movement. Movement. We had the curriculum. We had the uh, uh, the faculty and the staff here, and we had the facilities at various institutions, starting with Santa Fe Indian School, and then of course the, the College of Santa Fe, and then here at our beautiful campus in Rancho Viejo. Um, but all along, it was the students, the philosophy, the guiding philosophy from Lauren Kibanu and uh, others that allowed the students to take their culture and their traditions and develop their own creativity and, uh, through cultural expression. And so that's led to a bold m movement and eventually to our compelling mission to empower creativity and leadership in Native arts and cultures. We, um, you know, we, this movement led to the, uh, you know, we, we've said that we are the birthplace of uh, contemporary Native art. This is where it all started. This, uh, we began a movement here. And we started, as I said, as a high school. We quickly evolved uh, to post-secondary, where we started offering an associate degrees in the 80s, and were accredited in the 80s. And then, of course, in 86, uh, our enabling legislation uh, was enacted by Congress that made all the difference in the world for us, and we'll be talking about that as well. And then, of course, in uh, 1988, we received the land, 140 acres here in Rancho Viejo, that allowed us to, to for the first time, to have uh, to build our own campus. Um, and permanent campus, and that led to a lot of stability that we'll be talking about with our panelists, uh, Lauren Kiva and Carrie Billy. Uh, so we, and, and then of course in 89, we received the deed to the federal building on Cathedral across, uh, across from the, the, the Catholic Church, and that allowed us to uh, move our museum from uh, the, uh, to into that building, we had a permanent building there and it's an ideal location off of the plaza. Uh, so then you continue uh, to see an evolving mission when we came here uh, in 2000, it was 2001 that we were accredited to offer bachelor, uh, bachelor's degrees and Bachelor of Fine Arts. And then uh, in 2013, uh, we, uh, we were able to become accredited to offer our first MFA program in creative writing. In uh, uh, 2020, we were accredited to offer our second one in studio arts. And then in uh, this year, in 2022, the cultural administration out of museum studies, and we're, we're training professionals um, to lead arts and cultural and museum organizations. Uh, so we, we've had a storied history and we're continuing to see our students uh, be celebrated for their success and their artwork and also as uh, tribal leaders, business leaders uh, in, in all of the professions in film, creative writing, uh, as, and as scholars as well. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Lauren Kiva that could not be with us, but he is... Uh, joining us virtually, and he'll be speaking in a few minutes. Um, he is, uh, of course, chair of our board of trustees. He's been on the board since 1994. He, uh, he was appointed by uh, President Clinton to serve on our, our board, and he's been uh, ser serving continuously since then. And uh, his leadership uh, was Im uh, so important as we evolved our mission, as we moved uh, to this campus, our first permanent campus. So he, uh, he'll be sharing some memories and some stories from uh, his service on, on the Board of Trustees and what he's witnessed over the years. Um, he's also um, you know, a celebrated attorney in the San Francisco area. He's consistently ranked as one of the top lawyers in the Bay Area. Uh, he uh, graduated from, uh, with he went to Stanford for his undergraduate work and then at UNM received a law degree and then at Oxford University also a law degree. Uh, we also have with us Carrie Billy, who is president and CEO of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium and there's 37 colleges a part of that consortium and we are one as well. Um, you know, she's, uh, I first met Carrie when she worked for Senator Bingaman and she was 
Also working on our 1994 land grant legislation, she, she drafted that, was part of that effort, and uh, that's paid dividends for us here at the Institute of American Arts. If you see our uh, community gardens, our greenhouse, our orchards, and of course our thunder bees and their hives are here. Uh, so that's an important component of our mission as well, and all of the tribal colleges have benefited. Uh, Carrie is an attorney. She graduated from the Georgetown University School of Law, and uh, she's really uh, supported Institute of American Arts and all the tribal colleges in enhancing our mission. So I'm going to right now turn it, ask Lauren to share his, uh, you know, his memories about especially about moving to this campus from College of Santa Fe uh, and then uh, the legislation itself. Good morning, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Ocio, bienvenidos. Welcome to everybody from San Francisco. Um, it is very personally fitting for me to be part of this 60th anniversary celebration because I actually have known about IEI for 60 years. It seems strange, but I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My father was a doctor, my mother was a lawyer, um, but their real love was art. And they came across this young artist, this young art professor named Fritz Scholder. And Fritz and Ramona came, became very good friends with my parents. And I remember going to IEI shows and exhibits really starting 60 years ago. Um, my first formal affiliation came in 1994 when President Clinton appointed me and the Senate confirmed me as a trustee. Uh, we've been up and down and down and up, and right now we're just continuing on an upward trajectory. Um, I'd like to personally thank Bob Martin for his leadership. Under his leadership, IAI has just made leaps and bounds in terms of where we've come, uh, not only the footprint of our campus, but more importantly, the imprint of our campus and our education on Native American culture and arts throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, I will tell you a little bit about how IAIA <clears throat> came to get to its current place, but first let me give you some background. Um, our enabling legislation is noteworthy for what it says about who we are. Um, Congress, in, its, in, its, in passing our enabling legislation to start IAIA, <clears throat> found that Indian art and also Native Hawaiian art and culture have contributed greatly to the artistic and cultural richness of our nation. They also found that Indian art and culture and Native Hawaiian art and culture occupy a unique position in American history as being our only Native art form and cultural heritage. Everything else came from somewhere else, but Native American art is our Native indigenous art form in the United States and in North America. Uh, Congress also found that IEA's establishment would enhance and preserve the nation's native art and culture and have a fundamentally positive influence on the American people. Um, they also said that it was appropriate for the federal government to support research and scholarship in Indian art and culture and to complement programs for the advancement of that art and culture by tribal, private, and public agencies and organizations. Um, that's the background by which Congress founded this small institution. When I came on the board in 1994, um, we were housed in substandard space at the College of Santa Fe. Uh, our classes were literally in temporary Quonset huts that had been built during World War II that were supposed to have been torn down long ago. Um, we had a thriving campus, however, uh, 450, 500 students, and all was well. Um, Unfortunately, what happened was that um, a, a new Congress came in, the 105th Congress under Newt Gingrich, and when we had, we had at that point a, I think about a nine or $10 million annual appropriation. And the first year of that Congress, they came in and cut our appropriation down to 6 million. Uh, the next year they came in and cut our appropriation down to 4 million. Um, that was bad enough, uh, but then they said, we're not gonna give you any more the next year. And so the Board of Trustees had to decide, what are we gonna do? <clears throat> um, uh, our president at the time resigned and sent out letters without the board knowing it that IEA was gonna close down. And so we explored a whole bunch of ideas and we said, well, um, the good people at the Rancho Viejo have given us 140 acres. Uh, we also had a $12 million quasi endowment. And so we, the board said, well, let's start building a campus. And so we took half of our $6 million quasi-endowment, 
and used it as, as, as the, the, the funds to build the new campus, which was simply a bunch of casitas where we put the students and uh, the academic building, which is where we are, now have our academic building. Um, <clears throat> we then said, we'll take the other six million and we'll re reduce our curriculum down to a core and keep going for the next two or three years if we can. And so um, on a cold February day, I think it was 1998, we were out um, on the campus with native elders saying prayers and literally planting corn in the ground. Uh, and I can remember it so vividly because there was nothing here. Uh, there was not a road, there was not electricity, there was no water. You could look out, as Carrie Billy said in one of our emails, it was a gorgeous site with lovely pinions and lovely views, but there was nothing here <laughs> uh, as far as the eye could see. And so we uh, literally started hammering ourselves. The first building was our Hogan, and the trustees were out there with the faculty and the students literally pounding nails into the Hogan, and it's still there, amazingly, as a, as a cultural symbol of our founding at the IAIA. The other thing we did is, is um, I called up my friend and I said, who's the best Republican lobbyist you can find for us? And she said, well, Manuel Lujan happens to be a friend. Manuel Lujan, as most of you know, or some of you know, was a former congressman from New Mexico. Uh, he was also the Secretary of Interior under Ronald Reagan. And so Manuel Lujan and I and other people went back and we wandered through the halls of Congress um, telling our story about why IAIA was so important. And miraculously, it worked. Um, uh, we restored our funding gradually coming up. Uh, our, our, uh, <clears throat> our enrollment had dropped down to about 150, 200 students, uh, but gradually it started coming back up. And we started building more buildings. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 15 years ago when Bob Martin came on board that he had this vision. But more importantly, you know, he has what I call roll up your sleeves, let's get it done vision. Um, mm. And he was able to bring together all sorts of constituencies um, to make sure that we did the right thing uh, through a, a supportive faculty, so a supportive board, supportive community, um, and supportive outreach to, to Native America. And so I believe that at this point we have, I'm looking at Catherine Tiarina, who's on our screen, who was one of our, our uh, original presidents shortly before I came on board, uh, and she's been a longtime supporter. Uh, and it's, this has been a, a, a family group of people who are supporting all of this, but um, if I have to think of one person who's had such a fun fundamental impact, apart from our founders, Lloyd Kiva New, of course, who was just an absolutely wonderful human being. I remember when I first came on the board, <clears throat> he said, well, I'm Lloyd Kiva New, and you're the new Kiva. Mm -hmm. And we had a fundamentally a wonderful relationship, and um, he continued to support IAI through, through so many ways. So that's the Lauren Kiva story of, of um, uh, my 28 years on the board. Um, uh, graciously, President Obama reappointed me um, in 2015 to another term, and so I get to keep going. Um, and it's been a labor of love. It's not been a labor of love. It's simply been a work of love. Um, and I'm so proud and so, so excited. I go out to that campus and I literally jump up and down uh, because what was nothing there is now a magnificent jewel um, but more fundamentally, I described this before, it's like a sacrament. Uh, it's the outward and visible sign of an inward, invisible grace. And that grace is what we're doing with Native American culture and art and communities. So let me turn it over to Bob. <clears throat> Thank you, Lauren. Now I'm going to ask Carrie Billy to give uh, some of her memories about uh, uh, the early days of, of this campus and the enabling legislation and, and some other uh, wisdom and insight that she would like to share with us. Carrie? Yate, Bella Dana Nishni, Tots Oni Bashishen, Tabaad Bashishek, Ani Dashanali. I am Carrie Billy, the president and CEO of AHAC, which is the 35 accredited tribal colleges, and we have two developing members. Uh, and first, I want to say it's such an honor to be here. It's, it's an honor to just come to this campus at any time and see. You know, because I can really see the work that we've done over the years, um, which I really like doing. It makes me feel good to see um, what we have, what started as an idea and see it come to reality. Even um, 
beyond our wildest imagination. So, and, and that is a lot in large part due to President Martin. So I want to just Thank you. honor and congratulate you for everything that's been accomplished in the last 15 years. But President Martin has been involved with the tribal college movement long before uh, coming to IAIA. He was president at Haskell Indian Nations University and, and led that institution and helped it grow tremendously. And then he started, as many of you probably know, uh, the first president, I think he was the first president, maybe second, but second. one was just the interim, um, at uh, Tonatum Community College uh, on the uh, Tonatum Nation in Arizona. And that is, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of IAIA, seeing Tonatum Community College, which also <laughs> started out in beautiful, sacred land. Um, that is, as um, Lloyd sa um, Lauren said, uh, filled with grace. Beautiful land, mm -hmm. but there was nothing there. No structures, no electricity, no water. And from that, a beautiful campus has grown just like here. And I think that's one of my, my biggest memories is um, I wasn't working in the Senate when the legislation passed in 1996. Uh, it passed as part of what's called the Higher Education Act. It's a big conglomeration of all of the major higher education bills. Uh, and it's, it's supposed to be reauthorized every, about every seven to eight years, but sometimes it'll go 15 years before it's mm. reauthorized. We're kind of in that spot now. right okay. now. Yeah, we're desperately trying to get a bunch of amendments done. But fortunately, it was uh, passed in 1986, and that's what allowed IAIA to become the independent institution that it is now. And to me, that's the most significant thing, that prior to that, IAIA was part of the federal government. It was a federal entity operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and in the Department of the Interior. And you know, they did what they could, but the Department of Interior, is, they're not experts in education. <laughs> um, and so we thought, you know, when we came to the campus and saw, um, and the, the staff who worked on the, the legislation before me saw the Quonset huts and, you know, the way IAIA um, was operating, we knew that they knew that something needed to be done and that was becoming an independent institution. And that's what's the most significant, well, there's two really significant things, maybe three, about the legislation that created IAIA. One is that it, it created that independence. It allowed IAIA to operate as an institution of higher education uh, on the level of other institutions of higher education in this country. And that's really significant. So that's what led to the movement beyond associate degrees to um, bachelor's degrees and now master's degrees. That probably wouldn't have happened if IAI had st stayed part of the federal government. Uh, it may, I don't even know if those Quonset huts are still there, but possibly could still be in Quonset huts or other old federal buildings. Um, because the vision to build this campus in a space that had nothing didn't exist in the federal government. So that was just tremendously important. And when it happened in 1986, it was an experiment. That's why, um, that's why in 1995, I think Congress was able to begin to sort of, to try to defund the Institute of American Indian Art. All along the intent was to see if IAIA could um, move from a federal entity to a, a congressionally chartered public institution, but that operated like a, a private institution that didn't receive federal funds. Um, but it was an experiment. And that was the point that we made to, to other members of Congress back in the early 1990s when there was this effort to defund IAIA, that it was an experiment to see if it would work, if we could um, totally remove federal support and that experiment didn't work. And that's not bad, right? Mm -hmm. It's not bad when an experiment fails or an experiment doesn't turn out the way that you might think that you, you want it to. What it said to us was, 
there is a clear federal obligation and responsibility and need for funding of the Institute of American Indian Art that has to continue on forever. That's a federal obligation. And so Congress realized, yeah, you're right, that experiment didn't work, we're gonna continue to fund it. So, so they did. And we've been able to continue to grow that funding over the years. And the way that's been done is different from any other institution uh, of higher education. That I, This is the second significant thing. And that's that IAIA has a direct appropriation from Congress. So IAIA is funded through the Department of Interior's appropriations bill. But IAIA takes its appropriation and goes directly to Congress, and then Congress funds it, and the money comes directly to IAIA. It doesn't go through a federal system. And if any of you are involved with the federal <laughs> government, you know how significant that is. Uh, it's extremely significant to not have to be subject to um, going through a process where the Department of Interior might propose lower funding, or um, sometimes OMB still does. They're not supposed to. but. We're, we'll continue to work on that. But um, that direct communication and, and relationship with Congress, I think, is ex extremely important and something that always has to remain and that has allowed IAI, IAI the freedom and also the, um, the funding to do a lot of things that, that IAIA has been able to do. Um, and then the third thing I think that was really significant um, was creating you know, there is vision in the 1996 legislation. I always thought that parts of it needed to be rewritten. I still do. Um, and we're going to get that chance through something else. Um, but we, um, not, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I don't mean rewrite your legislation. <laughs> um, I mean uh, something else I'll mention in a second. But, but the third thing was creating that independent um, board of directors, the board of trustees for IAIA. Mm -hmm. um, rather than making it um, an advisory board that's accountable to the Secretary of Interior, for example, or even the Secretary of Education, which could have happened. Um, it was, but like I said, it was an experiment to see if it would work as an as a independent but yet federally funded entity. And it is uh, a great testament to, um, I think, innovation, creativity, uh, to grace and to um, faith that Congress enacted that legislation and we have the institution that we have today. Really, it's just so exciting. And w when I mentioned um, two other things, and I won't say anything else, we, um, we have two other federal entities, tribal colleges, that are federally controlled still. Haskell Indian Nations University and Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute, which is in Albuquerque. And I really believe that we should take this model of IAIA um, that was an experiment, an experiment that has worked with some changes, and do the same thing for Haskell and Sippy. And not everybody agrees with me on that, but we're going to try it definitely, I think, with Haskell um, next year. Next year, 2023, is AHEC's 50th anniversary. And I think it's really appropriate at our 50th anniversary to make that, that next bold move into really, truly tribally controlled higher education and create uh, legislation that would authorize Haskell as an independent entity. So all the things that I think need to be changed from IAI, we're going to try to put in the Haskell legislation. Um, so that's what I meant about that. Um, the last thing I'll say, um, which Lauren mentioned, was that Manuel Lujan was involved in helping, he was a strong supporter of IAIA when he was Secretary of the Interior and also in Congress. Um, but at the time in 1996 and throughout until 1994, um, there was always strong, and I think actually for IAIA it continued beyond that, but very strong bipartisan support. You know, the way that legislation happened as part of the Higher Education Act was because Senator Pete Domenici, Senator Jeff Bingaman, um, Senator uh, Del Kildee from Michigan, in, uh, not Senator, Representative Del mm -hmm. Kildee in the House, and Representative Don Young. Um, so polar opposites, that's Don Young and Kildee, not Domenici and Bingaman. <laughs> um, but 
But they came together to support this idea and this experiment of mm. IAIA. Um, and the same thing in the Senate with Senator Domenici and Senator Bingaman. Um, the, the need to um, support American Indian and Alaska Native art and creativity was transcended partisanship. And it was through that working together, that bipartisanship, that th that legislation was enacted and that the funding continued to, to grow and has continued to grow over the years. And you know we just don't see that uh, in the Congress anymore and um, we need to get back to that. I, I think, you know, I wonder if this would have happened if we had the kind of political climate that we mm -hmm. have now. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's just something I think that's really important to acknowledge that the, um, the, the source that created this was a bipartisan or nonpartisan spirit. And um, I think we have to continue to strive to achieve that. Uh, Carrie mentioned uh, the Office of Management and Budget, and we're fortunate in that we get to go in as an ind independent agency uh, and by ourselves to present our budget to OMB. And so, uh, but it's based on need. It's not based on some kind of formula. And so we're able to uh, express our needs in, in, in a budget justification to OMB. And since I've been here at the Institute of American Arts, we've had only one budget cut, and that was 5% in 2013. And uh, that was the sequester year. Now, and so we, we had to deal with that, but that came from the United States Congress. Uh, and I would ask Carrie to expound on this. Uh, Every year, or just about every year, they'll come and say, give us a budget, uh, not current level funding, but maybe a 5% reduction. And then a day or two later, they will come back and say, that's not applicable to you, don't worry about it. Just whatever, uh, just present your budget, your needs, and justify it. So I'd like Carrie to explain uh, what the implications for the Institute of American Indian Arts in, in that regard. Yeah, um, well, OMB shouldn't actually be saying anything um, <laughs> yeah. because, because, because you're not a, a federal entity. And the Office of Management and Budget kind of oversees the, the federal budget. IAIA is a direct appropriation from Congress, so the relationship is with Congress. So IAIA's budget should be submitted as you, based on the need of the institution, it should go directly to Congress, but it has to go in a in some way. You know, there has to be some transport, some mechanism, conduit to get it to Congress, and that's the Interior Appropriation Bill. But it should just be tacked on at the end, un, w without any comment. Um, and so I don't know wh what what they're why they're even saying a five percent cut. But I think that's pretty typical of federal agencies. Usually there's this weird process where um, you go back and forth, first within the departments. That goes on for probably two or three months where the different agencies, you know, each, each uh, depart uh, department has a set amount of money that they're gonna get allocated that year. And that, so within the department, all these little agencies are fighting with each other over the funding amount, so it goes back and forth within the department. And then finally they settle on something and then it goes back, then it goes to OMB and the same thing happens at the department level where all the uh, 12, 13 departments are fighting with each other uh, over the overall budget and then um, reach some kind of agreement. And so different things are cut. Um, there is always, there used to always be for several years until 2000, um, 19, I think, the, um, there was a budget agreement that put budget caps on, and so that was the sequestration. Um, there was, I don't, I don't know if you all remember this, but back in that 2013, um, the idea of sequestration, which is sequestration is an across the board cut to every single program in the federal government. And if you, and it was thought to be so bad because every, you know, everyone, every member of Congress has their favorite pet project they don't want cut. 
uh, the Department of Defense, military spending, uh, Los Alamos research, education, um, food stamps, everything. Things that couldn't, shouldn't be cut at all. But sequestration was, if you guys can't come to an agreement, you, Congress, then we're just gonna do an across the board cut of everything to get us within these budget caps that Congress had imposed. And um, lo and behold, Congress could not get its act together <laughs> and reach any kind of agreement. So sequestration came, went into effect that year. So every single program was cut, including IAIA. Um, you know, if they had come to any little minuscule agreement, that would not have happened. Uh, but that, that budget agreement lasted, of 2011, lasted for several years, and the threat of sequestration was there would be these ratcheting down 5 to 10, 15 percent cuts. So I suppose that's why they were saying reduce it by 5 percent, thinking they weren't going to reach a budget agreement. Fortunately, we don't have a budget agreement, well, a budget act anymore that is imposing these caps. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on politically where you are, but um, for ease of sequestration, not going into effect, it's fortunate, um, because it actually would have gone into effect the past few years because Congress hasn't enacted a budget. This year, they don't have a budget. So um, can, can I add the one funding thing levels, they're really high now. But they're Let not me add a couple, a couple points on this that, that are important. Um, one of the things that Bob has been able to accomplish miraculously is to get forward funding. Uh, in the quote, old days before we had forward funding, um, whenever the federal government shut down, we had to shut down, and we had to go into a sort of, you know, um, huddling mode of, of laying people off momentarily, and then you have to try and put Humpty Dumpty back together again when you got the money. Well, what we now have is forward funding, so we get money a year in advance, and when Congress then doesn't appropriate money for the entire federal government, we get to keep going. Um, and I think that's really an important thing in terms of how we go about working forward in, in, in what we're doing now. Right. That helps. Um, you know, because Congress doesn't have its act together, forward <laughs> funding is really important. It, um, normally, Congress is supposed to pass their appropriations. For, well, the fiscal year begins October 1st. So what, what are we right now? October 7th. So has Congress passed the appropriation bills for this year? No, right? No, they haven't, and here we are, 17 days into the fiscal year. Um, they're not going to pass uh, appropriation bills, possibly until December, but now, I just heard this morning, they actually don't even think they're gonna pass them in December. They think it's gonna go over until January or February, so IAIA would be without the operating funding for this year, if that forward funding hadn't happened, it just means basically that you get like a third or a three fourths. Seventy five percent. Yes, three fourths. Three fourths of your funding in advance, so you can actually budget it. We received that in July, which really makes a big difference for us in terms of planning. This yeah, is the just the a. Thing yeah. that, oh, go ahead. The other thing that's important um, is that. Um, we have created a rainy day fund. We set aside a part of our annual budget <clears throat> to build up, uh, on the, I, there's probably a, an official word for it, but I call it a rainy day fund. When somehow if, if, if the, the, the stream of the waters from Congress stop flowing for a while, we can keep going. Um, the other thing that we've done is, is we've also built up our endowment. Uh, I think most people here know that um, uh, Mackenzie Scott, uh, formerly known as Bezos, uh, gave us $5 million out of the blue three years ago and then gave our museum another $2 million. And that <clears throat> has made a significant difference in our ability to just not, not only grow, but re expand our programs and our vision. Yeah, that's, we've been able to build a, a reserve fund. And I, I remember when I first came, Lauren, uh, after I signed the contract, said, by the way, we've got a $2 million debt that we need to, to pay off. And so uh, now, now we have uh, a reserve uh, and funds, uh, you know, we set that aside, as Lauren said, and that's through uh, the, the wisdom of the board and uh, board of trustees. Uh, 
so that's, that's so important. Uh, also, I'd like Carrie to speak to uh, the advantages of being a part of AHEC for the Institute of American Indian Arts. I know when I first came to campus, uh, we, uh, a number of people associated with the college didn't like the fact that we were referred to as a tribal college because we are unique. We're different from all of the other tribal colleges in terms of our mission and uh, what we do, we're intertribal and fine arts, and uh, we're unique not only among the tribal colleges, but among uh, fine arts institutions in this country and worldwide. Uh, but th there are certain, it, uh, not certain, but a lot of advantages to being a part of AHEC and to be a tribal college. Uh, so I'd like to uh, ask Carrie to speak to that, those advantages. Yeah, well, I think it's really important. Well, first of all, people should be proud to be a tribal college because a tribal college is a tribally directed and controlled higher education. It's American Indians and Alaska Natives taking control of our own education and our education systems. And to, to do that, at the K-12 level, you have to have control at the higher education level. Um, so it's absolutely essential to have institutions of higher education that are controlled, owned, and operated by American Indians for American Indians. That's what a tribal college is, where culture is the core of everything that comes, grows from that institution. So everyone should be proud to be a tribal college. And then, so everybody's all proud to be a tribal college, it's still a small number. There's only 35 accredited tribal colleges, so you definitely want to work together um, because you're much stronger together than when you're apart. So even though there are actually five different operating funding sources for the different tribal colleges, um, and IAIA has its unique funding source, we, we all still work together, like the forward funding. Um, Forward funding was, we did it in increments with different groups of the schools and um, that was achieved by working together. Being part of the land grant system, the 1994 land grants. Um, when Congress worked with AHEC staff to, um, to enact that, to draft the legislation and enact it, and Senator Bingham and the senator I worked for introduced the legislation in the Senate and so when they first brought the legislation to us, IAIA wasn't in there, you know, in that list. Uh, for land grant, you actually have to be named in it. IAIA wasn't named and SIPI wasn't named. And, uh, you know, I worked for Jeff Bingham and so I look at this and I'm like, oh, there is no way we're introducing this bill without IAIA and SIPI listed as land grants. Um, so uh, anyway, we, we had to convince the president at the time to include uh, IAIA as a land grant, because most people don't know what a land grant is, you know, so they, they didn't know, but it didn't sound like mm -hmm. anything to do with arts. So, <laughs> so, but anyway, that worked out, and it, it just seemed to really fit that IAIA is a land grant institution. But I think it's things like that, legislation like that, being part of the whole congressional legislative process, working with administration, the administration, those are all things that come from working with AHEC. Just also having the community of other institutions. You know, IAIA is a great competitor in the annual AHEC student conference that's coming back this in 2023. In fact, you all are hosting yes. one of the hosts. Mm -hmm. So that'll be really exciting. Um, but then also in 1989, AHEC created the American Indian College Fund. And to participate in college fund scholarships and programs, you have to be a member of AHEC. So that's a, a, no, a number, another thing that's critically important to um, tribal colleges, uh, to, to IAIA and to students in particular. And I think that um, Lauren mentioned the uh, log cabin. That was actually started, I think, with uh, a, a college fund, American Indian College Fund support. So your first building wouldn't be here if you weren't part of the yeah. But it's not a log cabin, it's a hogan. <laughs> oh, sorry, we call it a log cabin. I don't know why, but that's the whole name of that pro project, the log cabin project. Uh, maybe you know, I don't know. 
Well, Gail Bruce will be here next week with the College Fund, and she'll, she'll remind us of uh, the, the integral uh, role that she played in uh, bringing the cultural centers to the, the tribal colleges. But the initial concept, as I recall, was to go to uh, log uh, cabin manufacturers and ask for those to be donated to, uh, to the colleges. And, and then the college, what was supposed to happen with their own labor uh, would uh, construct that uh, cultural center, or in this case, a hogan for us. And I know Lauren's told stories about um, working uh, in to help build uh, our uh, hogan, uh, but th the that did that fell through on the log cabin uh, on getting the logs donated. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. that never. You happened. don't want to know that story. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's... Actually, Bob, Bob you're, 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 I, I believe you're wrong on that. There was a, our logs came from a company up in Las Vegas, New Mexico, that donated the logs, if maybe, I remember correctly. Maybe for, yes, yeah, some of them, they did come through, I assume, and maybe it de depended on the individual institution, but if you go to a lot of the cultural centers, uh, that they're, they weren't constructed out of logs, but uh, they... Uh, Gail Bruce, I remember her coming to uh, AHEC meetings for about five years talking about the, her log cabin project. I thought it would never happen, but it did. And she's got some other ideas now that she's... Uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. can, can I add a couple of things? As I say, Catherine T. Hirena, who is um, uh, LaDonna Harris's daughter, um, is on the thing, and she reminded me that uh, LaDonna was incredibly helpful in uh, changing the dynamic. Instead of native crafts, it's native art. And uh, we, I mm -hmm. would be remiss if I didn't um, thank uh, and recognize Lee and Stuart Udall, uh, former Secretary of the Interior, former Congressperson, and father of Tom, uh, for all the support that they had given uh, to help IAI get off the ground and keep going over the years. And I, I would also, again, just re-echo what, what Kerry said. Uh, Jeff Bingham in particular, uh, and his staff were so important to IAIA, um, and we've had an, a, an amazingly warm, good relationship with the Alaska delegation. Um, Don Young, notwithstanding his politics mm -hmm. that are much different from New Mexico's politics, was always a major supporter. Uh, Lisa Murkowski has been there for us through, through thick and thin. And it really is a bilateral, bipartisan group of supporters who are looking at Native American and Alaska Native um, issues, not Democratic or, de or Republican ones. So that's, that's really been important in terms of our, 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 our DNA here. Yeah. I, I would certainly concur with that. We've had a lot of support over the years in, in terms of our evolution, uh, our history of development here, and from the Board of Trustees to our congressional delegation uh, to local donors here in Santa Fe, and of course at the federal level with Kerry's leadership of AHEC, and uh, it's all crucial that we have to have everybody working together and believing in the vision. Uh, but I, I know that uh, if, as we go throughout the day that we're gonna be talking about uh, the Santa Fe Indian School campus, College of Santa Fe, and now here, but wherever we've been, uh, the students have have been uh, the difference, the difference maker. They have uh, uh, brought their energy, th their creativity, their talents to, this, to these campuses, and uh, they've become successful artists and uh, entrepreneurs and leaders and scholars and filmmakers and performing arts or, or whatever. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's that, uh, that, that what really is the foundation for us is that philosophy that Lloyd Kivanu brought that it's the students with their creativity and their expression of their culture uh, that has made a difference through, you know, that's been the, the one common denominator. Um, we, we wanted to leave some time for some questions if you have them, uh, any questions for Lauren or Carrie uh, take advantage of while they're with us to uh, ask them some questions. Yes.
she's asking about the uh, the budget and the federal funding and then our reserve and our endowment. We receive uh, the core funding from the federal government and then uh, as Carrie said and Lauren, we, we have the, we're independent in terms of uh, developing our own budget. We have our own personnel system. We have our own uh, finance and, and we have control of this institution, which is different from Haskell and, and Scipion. And I've uh, returned to both of those campuses and uh, you know, I know they have such potential, but they're not able to move forward with that. But yes, we have a, a budget and uh, it, it's around 11 million now. And with that uh, 11 million, we, we can address the needs here. So we, we have uh, all of our uh, institutional needs and so we budget for those. And then as Lauren said, we've set aside 3% of our budget annually that, uh, uh, you know, for the reserve. And so that we've been building that and sometimes we'll transfer part of that to the endowment, the quasi-endowment, but the, as Lauren said, the endowment has grown and we've, uh, when we uh, get a legacy gift uh, for an endowed faculty position or endowed scholarships, uh, he mentioned Ms. Mackenzie Scott, we've received other donations and uh, I know during the pandemic, we had some of our best fundraising years because it, the pandemic elevated the disparities that you see in Indian country and. Uh, the, the challenges that our students face with uh, uh, the disparities in terms of health, education, uh, and you name it. So uh, we, we've been doing pretty well, and I think the College Fund has, and AHEC. Uh, AHEC received $25 million from Mackenzie Scott, and that's part of an endowment, correct, Carrie? Mm -hmm. It's extremely important because as Lauren said, uh, you, you never know what's going to happen in Washington, D.C. and somebody could come along and uh, try to zero us out or, or whatever. I don't think that's gonna happen. We have too much support. We now have the permanent campus. Uh, that brought about a level of stability and continuity uh, that we didn't have before. And so that, that's made a big difference uh, for us. But the endowment, uh, we can use for scholarships, we can use for endowed positions, and, and that's the key. Uh, we just recently received a $1.2 million legacy gift, and that's to, uh, we had, it required a match, which we use McKenzie Scott funds to match, but now we have an endowment for an endowed professor, or endowed chair uh, in Native art history, and we've, uh, Native American art history, and we've had a certificate program uh, up to date, but now we want to develop that BFA and eventually an MFA in Native American art history. And that'll be a good foundation mm -hmm. curriculum for us. And going forward, we're looking at indigenous liberal studies and uh, we've submitted a proposal for funding to continue to develop that program and incorporate indigenous liberal studies throughout all of our programs. But we hope at some point, our vision is to offer a, a PhD in that area. That would support all that we're doing. Can I add a couple things, points to that, that uh, I'm assuming somebody will cover this later on, but I think what is important to also know is we do a tremendous job with our founders, not our founders, our, uh, our foundation and our friends of raising scholarship funds for our students so that every student who needs a scholarship or needs the funding gets it. The other thing is the board, uh, along with Bob, we've made a conscious decision that we are not going to let our students take out loans for their, for their education. So they mm -hmm. don't have the, the burden of when they graduate or when they leave us of having to not only, um, you know, put the bread on their table and, and pay the rent, but also have to pay back a government loan. And I think that that is a far reaching fundamental part of, of, of what we do with our students. And, and in terms of fundraising, what's really made a difference, the first question that most donors will ask will tell us about uh, the support of the Board of Trustees. Are they supporting the college monetarily or whatever? And they have. And uh, Lauren mentioned the foundation. Uh, that helped to uh, expand their network of donors and supporters. And, uh, and so they've done a great job too. And uh, our annual uh, gala, uh, we uh, 
the gross was over uh, about 850,000 and 600,000 of that's going to scholarships for the coming year. Uh, but we couldn't do it without the Board of Trustees, uh, our foundation, our faculty, staff, and especially our students and alums. They, they make the difference for us in, in ensuring the success of all of the fundraising that we do here. Yeah, can I just say one quick thing about that? The, and so the operating funding comes from Congress from the federal government, but it's just enough to operate. It's like bare bone, not, not maybe a little more than bare <laughs> bones, but bare bones operation, you know, it's enough to turn on the lights. It's not enough to be creative and grow. It's like what you need to stay where you are. That's what the federal government operating funding provides. Um, so in the 1996 legislation, authority to create an endowment or quasi endowment was established and I think they funded it at $500,000. So it's great to see how much it's grown over the years. But it's that endowment, it's really essential to allowing IAIA to continue to advance. So, so they're separate, but really important. Yeah, OMB reminds us of that every year we receive a, a, the pass back, which has our proposed budget amount. And it always says, we expect you to match this core funding from the federal government with private sector fundraising. That's an expectation that, that we, that they have for us. Mr. McGuire. Wonderful comment and another question. The comment is, do you just follow up the federal agency with the state funding? And in the 90s, I, I wanted to felt this is dead. And I did it. Because I felt The, the, the question for Mr. McGuire is, uh, for our federal core funding, are we able to address our capital outlay needs uh, in that budget? And capital outlay is mentioned in the legislation. And we do, when we go to, uh, uh, to OMB to present our budget, we'll say a, a new facility, a new program first, and then a facility is coming online and that's our justification for asking for an increase but with all of our uh, capital uh, outlay the all the buildings we've used a combination of federal funds title three uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned that Carrie but title three uh, you know we receive on the average 1.4 million dollars every year for title three and we can uh, that's in a five-year budget uh, and, but we get that every year, so we've, we've used Title III, uh, we've used uh, USDA rural development funds that we're eligible for because we're a tribal college, and state funds. We're a public institution, so every building here, or most buildings, we've utilized uh, state funding as well. Carrie? But that funding is very minimal. There's, there's no... Um, there's not a, a funding source to seek real construction funding, you know, to construct a building. There's $400,000 or $200,000 to buy part of the building, but not, there's not, um, for example, the uh, historically black colleges have at the Department of Education um, a, 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 a a fund for construction, for facility, it's a facilities loan program. Um, so they can actually leverage funding to do a big project, but tribal colleges don't have anything like that. 
No, we don't. In fact, it was, we opened in 2009 our science and technology building and our sculpture and foundry, but that was the last competitive grant from Title III, and we were blessed to receive, I think, around $9 million. Six, at that I time. think it was. Yeah, that, uh, and it, it went away after that, so we've had to cobble it together since then, yeah. Uh, I saw Catherine Tiarina, and uh, Lauren mentioned that she's on. I saw her just a minute. Uh, did you have a comment or a question, uh, Catherine? She's uh, one of the first presidents when uh, the enabling legislation was enacted here and we became independent of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. <clears throat> Um, before Carrie just mentioned uh, that we got, uh, or I think you mentioned that we got state funding, again, that goes back to the Udall family because um, under the New Mexico Constitution, uh, one isn't allowed to give money to a private college. Only public colleges get the money from the state. And Tom Udall was attorney general at the time that I was president, and so I um, sent in a request to have a declaration by the Attorney General's office that we were a public institution, which is what allowed uh, Tom let us <laughs> have that designation and appropriately, I think, and uh, that's what allows us to get state money. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, for the past few years, I think they've uh, they've abandoned the effort, but. For, for a number of years, Catherine, every time we went before the state legislature, somebody would question whether we're eligible or not, and are we a private institution? And uh, we have that documentation from Senator Udall, but we also, the Higher Learning Commission, we are a public, we're designated as a public institution, and most of the tribal colleges are. I think there's one or two that might be private. Uh, and, but to be public, your board has to assume responsibility for the institution. And that's what we have with our own uh, uh, board of trustees enabling legislation. Without that, uh, we wouldn't be eligible to be a, a, a private, I mean a public institution and eligible for funding. But yeah, we've received uh, dual credit, high school dual credit reimbursement. Our students are eligible for the lottery scholarship, the, uh, the uh, Opportunity Scholarship, all of those our students are eligible for for financial aid and, and it really makes a big difference. And, and so we have excellent relationship with the Secretary for Higher Ed. She contacts us and wants to know what our needs are and uh, we're recommended for, uh, from, by her, uh, Stephanie Rodriguez, to uh, get a sizable increase uh, for dual credit reimbursement and also for uh, uh, the capital outlay, we're, we're recommended for over 500000 so that we can uh, more Real secure our building. building with electronic uh, entry uh, throughout the campus, with key cards and those kinds of things. So uh, it's great to have support at every level, from donors, from state government, the federal, even the city. We've received funding from the city uh, as well. So. Uh, it's so important, but again, what makes a difference is our faculty, staff, and especially our students and alum. The, the stories that they tell and you're going to hear throughout the day. And can I just say, well, first of all, it's so great to see um, Catherine T. Arena. Um, so, hi, Catherine. It's wonderful to see you. And, you know, she was president during some of the most difficult times back in those early days when mm. nothing was easy, everything was a fight. And so just I just want to underscore the, the depth and excellence of her leadership of this institution. Just so amazing what she was able to accomplish when, like I said, everything, everything was difficult. And I, I think we're here, IAIA is here, where things might be a little easy, but even remember, dual credit was not easy. None of this has been easy. It's always been a, a struggle and trying to convince people 
of the need for this funding or this support or even just including tribal colleges and IAI in these programs. And it's because of people like Catherine Tiarina and President Martin and Lauren Kiva who, who just continue that fight and the students who tell their stories so amazingly well. Um, but this has not been an easy task. So I just want to acknowledge um, all of all of your collective hard work. It's just so tremendous to see what you've been able to accomplish. And I'll also just close by saying thank you to Stuart Udall. He's been mentioned <laughs> twice. I, I loved him. I, I love him now. Um, I love to just read what he's written, but he was such a great supporter and it was his support that led Tom Udall to be such a strong supporter, and you know that legacy just continues. So, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Lauren, did you have any uh, concluding remarks that you wanted to make? No, um, I've got to go off to do a few other things, but I'll, I'll circle back at the end. Um, have a lovely uh, morning and, and afternoon, and I'll see you later on. Thank you for sharing your memories and perspective, Lauren, especially uh, to you, Carrie. Uh, as well, and uh, she's made a, a big difference for all the tribal colleges, but especially here uh, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She mentioned uh, the New Mexico tribal colleges. She's been supportive of all of us, and I know with uh, even the COVID relief funds, uh, we've been able, you know, there was about six or seven million that came through uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, Bureau of Indian Education, and they said, well, we don't have any contracts in place uh, to get that money uh, over to IAIA and some other institutions. And, and she worked with them to, to ensure that those funds, the way they had to do it was they sent a check, they had a contract with AHEC uh, for, I believe, consultation, some other things. So it, it came over to, uh, uh, to AHEC and then Carrie would send us a check you know, I think the last one was around six million dollars. So that that makes all the difference in the world to have somebody of Carrie's uh, stature, her uh, eloquence, and, and being able to uh, to lobby for us and advocate for us. And I just wanted to make a presentation to her, uh, if if I could, if you'll bear with me. We've got a, a blanket over here that uh, it's the IAIA a blanket, uh, the first one that we've had made since I've been here, and it, uh, it's a design by uh, Benny yeah. Buffalo, who uh, is Southern Cheyenne, and uh, he was here in the 60s. This is material break. This came from our collection, has our logo on it, the Thunderbird, and uh, just thank you, Carrie, for all your support, being with us today, uh, coming, and uh, it's, uh, you, you really added to, to the panel. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Carrie. Can you stay at least to the lunch? Yeah.
I just remember it being, you know, it was an old post office. Yeah.
who's on the other who's on the other panels? Oh, oh. You're ready to start. <laughs> we're started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, as I mentioned, <coughs> as we were wrapping up the last panel, I understand that uh, my initial announcements might not have gone out online, so I just wanted to make a repeat of those. Um, so uh, we are very fortunate today, of course, to be gathering for the symposium celebration of our 60th anniversary for the Institute of American Indian Arts, the 50th anniversary for the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. And today's program is consisting of five panels in total, including, of course, the keynote, which you all just saw. We'll also have uh, three panels representing the three campuses of IAI's history. The first panel is going to be the Santa Fe Indian School panel, followed by our College of Santa Fe panel, and lastly, our Rancho Viejo panel. And these will include alumni from our three campuses. Uh, each panel will also conclude with a 15-minute Q&A session where we welcome questions from the audience. Um, and we will also be having a lunch at noon, which will include performances by our Performing Arts Club. Uh, just a reminder for those in person uh, today, if you would please refrain from streaming the event on your phone to avoid any feedback. Those who are joining online via Zoom, um, you may ask questions. However, please use your raised hand function, and then we'll call on you to ask the question and unmute yourself once you hear your name called upon. Uh, to that end, too, please also make sure that your name is included on your Zoom information. Oh, good. <laughs> and uh, just thank you again to everybody for joining us today uh, for this historic commemoration of our history. Um, so our first panel uh, of alumni is actually going to be representing our originating campus as a community, our, our campus at the Santa Fe Indian School. And, um, you know, despite many of the founding conversations on, on the founding of IAI taking place in Arizona, it was apparent pretty quickly the Bureau of Indian Affairs really uh, almost immediately assigned the Santa Fe Indian School to be the originating campus of IAI in early 1961. <clears throat> there was about a year and a half long renovation that took place um, of the nearly 100-year-old existing boarding school campus. And so IAI didn't actually open its doors until October 1962. Um, and welcomed really what became its first cohort of multi-tribal art students. Um, this was actually done for a few different reasons. Generally speaking, there was a lot of dissatisfaction at the time, uh, not just with boarding schools in general, but Santa Fe Indian School. And a lot of the communities in the area were saying really the education that students were receiving at SFIS were just wasn't up to par at the time. In addition to that, the BIA was really in the process of a pretty significant paradigm shift towards sort of postgraduate education, so they were looking for opportunities to use these campuses to educate broader and deeper. And as it sort of happens oftentimes in history, there was also an awful lot of interest at the time. Um, the Southwest Indian Art Project, the Rockefeller Foundation were making uh, significant investments, and when they realized that the SFIS campus uh, would potentially become available for the foundation of a new type of school, um, it just was sort of the right place at the right time. Of course, in addition to that, Santa Fe was already a firmly established center for Native Arts, um, and owing to a long history of education under instructors such as Dorothy Dunn, the Santa Fe Indian School Art Studio Space was a place that was ready-made for the future students of IAIA. Little tweaking, little renovation here and there, but an awfully good place to land. Um, and of course, although IAIA was founded to really break away from the classic studio model, um, it was something that uh, really suited our purposes at the time. And with the visionary work of founders such as Lloyd Kiva New, IAI really set to work in its new home, creating a wholly new language for contemporary indigenous art. Um, of course, IAI is located in the homeland of the Pueblo people. And even still today, many of our students, many of the youth of the Pueblo communities make up a significant portion of our student population. Um, and so SFIS was not just a campus where really IAI had its institutional origins, but is really a place where our institutional matriarchs, patriarchs, and first students instilled our deepest core values of community, family, and commitment to one another, um, which I hope all of those who are visiting and all of those who will visit us can still feel today. Um, even though our campus is 10 miles and 60 years apart from its place of emergence, we continue many of the traditions, many of the, the ways of our institution as it existed for the last 60 years. And in looking into how I would present and introduce this panel, something that uh, many of you may be familiar with from our uh, 50th anniversary text written by our own archivist, uh, or I should say edited by our archivist, Ryan Flayhive. Um, in 1962, there was actually a, a um, composer by the name of Lewis Ballard who wrote uh, an IAI alma mater entitled Home in Santa Fe. And drawing on its theme of this place, uh, the memory and the remembrances uh, that he so fondly recalled 
Um, we're really fortunate as a community to still have this piece of our history, and I wanted to share it with you today. Um, so for those who haven't heard, again, this is called Home in Santa Fe. This is the alma mater of our institution. Oh, the cottonwood trees are swaying all around us here today, and all our thoughts are staying to our home in Santa Fe. IAIA, we sing to you the school where dreams come true. Within these halls, our hearts will stay, though we are far, far away. And so the SFIS campus really remains such a significant part, um, a sense of really who we are as an institution. Our sense of self is rooted in that place. And it's still taught to our students today through things like our symposium, through our courses, through the work that we do. The work really of those first students holds a place of great reverence in our collections, in our archives, and is shown proudly and prominently to each new IAIA student. The first generation of IAI alum remain some of the most prolific, inspirational, and powerful artists, thinkers, leaders in indigenous history. And we're so happy and honored to be joined today by two of the most incredible and remarkable IAI alum from this period, Linda Lomaftoa and Dr. Alfred Youngman. I'd now like to introduce the bios of our panelists for today. Linda Lomaftoa is Hopi and Choctaw and attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe in 1962, uh, the year of the school's opening. So she is one of the founding cohort. Upon graduating from IAIA, Linda learned, uh, earned a scholarship to attend the San Francisco Art Institute with fellow IAIA alums, T.C. Cannon, Kevin Redstar, and Bill Prokopov. Loma Optawa earned a BFA and MFA from the San Francisco Institute of Art and has also received honorary doctorates from both IAIA and SFAI. Lamafta was a lifetime educator who has taught in the Ethnic Studies Department at the California State University, Sonoma, the Fine Arts Department at the University of California at Berkeley, and spent over 40 years as an IAIA faculty, nurturing generations of IAI students in drawing, painting, and printmaking. Upon her retirement in 2017, she was named one of IAI's first emeritus faculty. I think you might have actually been the first emeritus <laughs> faculty, if I remember right. Um, a prolific artist, Lomaftawa's work spans multiple disciplines, from printmaking to drawing to painting, and a diverse range of mixed media. She has participated in innumerable group and solo exhibitions, including her eponymous 2021 Mokna exhibition, The Moving Land, 60 Plus Years of Art by Linda Lomaftawa. She has been listed in the Who's Who of American Arts and twice in the Who's Who in American Indian Arts. In 2001, she won the Roberts Rauschenberg Foundation Power of Art Award, and her work is featured in collections around the world, including the Wheelwright Museum, the Millicent Rogers Museum, Southern Plains Indian Museum, University of Lethbridge, the Native American Center for the Living Arts, the Center for the Arts of Indian America, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian, the US Department of the Interior, and of course, our own IAI Museum of Contemporary Native Art. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Loma Optima. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce virtually, he's joining us via Zoom, our second panelist of our first cohort from IAI, Dr. Alfred Youngman. Dr. Alfred Youngman is a Cree artist, writer, educator, and an enrolled member of the Chippewa Cree tribe located in the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation in Montana. Dr. Youngman attended the Institute of American Indian Arts from 1963 to 1968 and went on to study painting, film history, and photography at the Slade School of Fine Arts in London. Uh, under the influence of director Sir William Coldstream, some, some name might be familiar to many of you, an incredibly influential uh, member um, of uh, the institution at the time and somebody who really shaped quite a bit of the history, um, in his time in England, Dr. Youngman met and worked with many famous and significant artists and musicians, including Richard Hamilton, Jimi Hendrix, Stephen Still, David Hockney, and was tutored and mentored by Bernard Cohen and William Townsend. Dr. Youngman earned his MA in American Indian Art at the University of Montana, where he studied and was mentored by George Longfish, Seneca Tuscarora. He completed his Doctor of Philosophy degree in Anthropology from Rutgers, where he was a student of William Powers. An art teacher since the early 70s, Dr. Youngman has taught on several reservation schools, including the Rocky Boy Elementary School, the K.W. Uh, Bergen Elementary School, as well as the Flathead Valley Community College, 
where he helped to found the Total Community Education Television Training Program. He served as a Native American Studies Chair at the University of Lethbridge, where he also taught in the International Exchange Program with partner institutions such as the Hokai Gakuen University in Sapporo, Hokkaido, Japan. Dr. Youngman remained a 10-year professor at the University of Lethbridge until 2007, when he chose early retirement and began work as a department head of Indian uh, Fine Art at First Nations University of Canada, Regina. In addition to his teaching activities at the First Nations University, Dr. Youngman also worked as an archival curator and custodian for the school's 1,500-piece art collection. Dr. Youngman continues his teaching as an adjunct professor in the art department at the University of Calgary. Most recently, Dr. Youngman completed an artist writer's residency at the Paul Bardwell Central Colombia Americano de Medellin in Medellin, Colombia. He has spoken at numerous conferences and other venues held on every continent in the world. His work featured in museum collections around the globe and is extensively published on a variety of subjects related to the contemporary indigenous arts and cultures. Pedagogically, Youngman teaches his courses from a native perspective, something that even today, very few native arts professors of whatever category claim to do. So again, thank you, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Youngman and Dr. Linda Lamaftova. Thank you very much. So we have a few questions for our panelists um, in an effort to hopefully engage in a discussion for them to share with us, with our community, with all of those joining virtually, and with our students about their history on the SFIS campus, uh, what life was like, and how it has led them to where they are today. So my first question for the panelists is, what was your fondest memory as an IAI student on the SFIS campus? And whomever would like to start first. <laughs> Alfred, do you want to go first? <laughs> Hi, Linda. I was going to ask you to go first. <laughs> um, would you repeat? Well, we were on the uh, Santa Fe Indian School campus, and um, I just remember, you know, it was a whole new experience for me uh, coming from Arizona to, uh, to, the, to Santa Fe. It was my first time coming to Santa Fe. And the campus was, you know, very welcoming. Um, there was a lot of trees uh, on the campus. Now it's all torn out after, uh, I, I don't know what they're going to do with that space now, but the Santa Fe Indian School was there. And, you know, meeting new people from all over. Uh, from all the all the tribal people from all over, it was just so what such a new experience for me, um, and we we all just learned from each other. Thank you, Dr. Youngman. Yeah, thank you for inviting me uh, on the 60th anniversary. It's uh, Amazing, I, I has made it this far. <laughs> we certainly didn't envision it when we first went there. <clears throat> I'm a product of boarding schools, having gone to boarding schools all my life uh, in uh, Browning, Montana, Cutting Boarding School. And uh, <clears throat> up here in Canada, uh, the residential schools, same thing, uh, are terrible places. They, uh, they have dug up. Uh, hundreds of children's bodies that have been uh, buried around campus, all without uh, the knowledge of the parents. It's just a horrendous, uh, terrible, inexcusable uh, uh, transgression on our lives as native people. And that might be putting it mildly. Yeah. I have no doubt that in the USA, you'll find the same thing. They start digging around. Because when I was going to school at boarding school, at Cutbank boarding school, we hear stories of children dying and being buried. And that's how it started up here. They started looking out for, for those with ground penetrating radar. I uh, took that experience I had for the first uh, 16 years of my life in boarding schools, and I brought that to Santa Fe, another BIA boarding school. Uh, so things weren't that differently at that school, I found. Uh, it was still the same patronization, there was still the same uh, uh, punishment for us for doing things wrong, as we always got punished for doing things wrong. 
uh, we were, uh, as students, uh, we were uh, a talented bunch, I would say. Uh, we got the best of the lot, I think, when we started out. Uh, every, uh, everything from uh, Passacoatomy in Maine down to uh, uh, Mission Indians in California to, to uh, up in Alaska. Uh, the thing about the, the IAI campus at that time was that everybody who went there had to be an Indian. You couldn't get in there if you weren't. You had to prove it uh, with your enrollment card, and uh, you were then let in or accepted. Uh, most of our professors, I would say, came from uh, off reservation. <clears throat> A few were Indians, which I liked. Ellen, <clears throat> excuse me, need a drink. <laughs> Ellen Hauser, Ali Lonema. Uh, they were the great influences on my life uh, as an artist. And uh, Alan Hauser was my teacher. Uh, he would teach in the, the most uh, fundamental way I thought that an Indian could teach, which he would sit in the classroom and he would do his paintings. And he would say, watch me. And we'd watch him. And uh, we would watch him finish his work. And uh, he wouldn't say much during that whole process. He would just make sure we were watching. Uh, I've never had any professor ever do that since then, and I still think it's one of the best ways to teach in painting. Uh, the uh, life on the, uh, on the campus was one of a boarding school. Uh, we had to get up at a predetermined time, go to lunch, go to breakfast, go to dinner at a predetermined time. Uh, we were forbidden to go off campus a lot of them did. Uh, generally speaking, I didn't go off campus. It was told uh, to me that we couldn't do it. Uh, we had to have our room spick and span. Uh, we could not be dirty. Uh, uh, the uh, dorm uh, heads would uh, note down your physical appearance, whether or not you were dressed properly. You couldn't go out without having your shirt tail tucked in, perhaps, you know, for instance. Uh, we would work in a dining room, some of us, after the after we got through eating, and we'd clean up that dining room to make it spick and span. Uh, we had uh, uh, little Ms. Perez uh, who would inspect our work, and there couldn't be a fingerprint on any of the stainless steel surfaces. We were fastidious. And part of that, I think, uh, was drilled into me when I was in boarding school as a young child. So it came naturally to me, naturally in the sense that I was totally brainwashed into it by that. I didn't have my own uh, sense of reality. Really, I was just like a little robot doing this and doing that. And um, I really wouldn't get out of that until I went to the England where I met uh, real foreign people in a real foreign country who didn't know who I was and who didn't care furthermore and where I found freedom for the first time and I didn't know how to handle it. In a sense, I was, I found myself at IAIA, comparatively speaking, uh, under a form of uh, incarceration. And I had been in boarding school all my life. So I didn't know the difference. Uh, I could barely speak English properly. Uh, in Eng England, I could barely understand the English that was talking, that was being spoken. And I could never understand coffee. I had no idea what that was. Uh, I didn't know their monetary system. Uh, I was starting from ground zero again. And uh, the only upside was in uh, Santa, in uh, London, uh, when my classmates found out I was a Cree Indian from Montana on a reservation, immediately they got interested. And all of a sudden I found myself being invited to all kinds of backyard uh, dinners and parties and people wanted to get to know me people, because they said uh, you were the first uh, Indian we've ever met. It's good to real, meet a real American. They said uh, most Americans who come over uh, to England or Canadians are looking for their ancestry. You're not. That's different. <laughs> this is, yeah, why would I? Uh, so uh, I could go on and on and on, but uh, the early years at Santa Fe, I think, uh, 
did establish something in me, and that is that they did provide, in spite of all I've said, uh, great painting uh, opportunities. Uh, they provided us with paintbrushes and uh, with paint and canvases, and uh, they said paint. They never gave us too much instruction. Uh, Shoulder didn't instruct us at all. Uh, he would talk about uh, other artists. That's about it. Uh, he would come in and make us paint over our work if we had work he didn't like. He was destructive in that way. He didn't let us continue with what we were working on. He said, I don't like that. Paint over it. Destroy that. Uh, he seemed to have a, a kind of a love-hate relationship with us. We never could figure him out. And uh, uh, it was only later that I found out that he was actually German, that he wasn't really an Indian. And so that made sense to me because he really didn't seem to understand us at all as uh, Indian artists. Um, I think I'll stop there. I think I've talked long enough. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Go yeah, on, but. <laughs> this is definitely part of, part of the conversation that we were hoping to have is to really talk about these stories, talk about what life was really like. Um, and I know and I understand, of course, you could also contribute a chapter to our Celebrating Difference text in 1950 where you really talked about that, the regiments under which the students really operated at the time, the, the uh, decorum and, and hygiene and cleanliness requirements, um, the way that, you know, even to the point of having to wax the floors every week and, you know, the way in which right. that was really regimented. <clears throat> so it's even made all the more remarkable the kind of work that the students were able to accomplish under those conditions and the way that, you know, really that work was such a foundational part of who we are today. Thankfully, we've lost a lot of the vestiges of that past that we wouldn't want to repeat. Um, but it's, it's you know, very, very interesting to hear. Um, yeah. And actually, in some ways, you've kind of led right into the second question, which was, uh, what is the greatest challenges uh, that an IAI student at Santa Fe Indian School campus faced? What were the greatest challenges that you experienced as students? <laughs> Think, Go ahead, Linda. I think just getting used to the whole system of how everything works, but I didn't think about talking about all that stuff, you know, like boarding school experience. Um, my first, we had just moved back from um, California to Arizona, and, and I started boarding school in the eighth grade at the, at the Holbrook Mission School, and that was horrible. <clears throat> and um, after that, I went to Phoenix Indian School, and then I came to IA. Um, and when I applied to come to IAIA, my mother always said um, it was like the FBI had to do a background check on us to see if I qualified to come to IAIA. So I had to do a por whole portfolio that came out to Hopi and visit us, visit our family at the village. Um, it was Charles, Charles Loloma and I think Mr. Mc Jim McGrath. And, um, and, and Alfred is right, you know, all the, uh, how, how strict everything was. It wasn't as bad as I, um, IA wasn't as bad as the mission school and, and Phoenix Indian School, but, you know, we did, at the Phoenix Indian School, we had to, girls on one side and boys on the other side, march to the cafeteria. Um, the girls had to wear skirts and we couldn't wear pants, and um, it, was, it was really strict. We had to clean all the time. Um, and I, you know, I did get in trouble and had to work off points, you know, in the kitchen a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was kind of strict, but I forgot what, now what the question oh, was, all oh, the challenges. <laughs> so I guess those yeah. were kind of challenges, you know, le learning how to live that kind of life. And, um, uh, Alfred is right, you know, about in the studio, uh, courses that we really didn't get any instruction. We were just, you know, here's here's the supplies, just go ahead and work. The only the only instruction I think I really got was in um, maybe drawing and I I was taking commercial art. So with K Weast and with that you have to have, you know, uh, some instruction like how to use the tools and how to take care of them. But in painting I I didn't start painting until my last year of high school, and uh, Jim McGrath was my teacher, and um, but here again, you know, he would just come in and say, 
what size canvas do you want? And do you need more paints? You know, and so <laughs> we would tell them what we needed and we were just all learning from each other. And, um, and he would just come in and say, oh, that's beautiful. You know, everything was, was beautiful. And so we all just kept working and, you know, learning from each other. And um, we didn't have any critiques. Uh, so I, we were just all, I guess, critiquing each other, help, helping each other um, grow that way. Well, and I remember- What's the challenges? Yeah, oh, so go ahead. I was just gonna say, we were on another panel before this past year, Alfred and I, and they showed a picture of him in the studio with a still life set up and he was you know, painting from that. And I said, well, I noticed in that picture you were painting from a still life where was that from a class? And he said, "No, I just had I just did it on my own." So, you know, I, I thought was, he was in a class when and he had a still life set up. Yeah. Go ahead, Alfred. Yeah, yeah. The challenges uh, were many, and I found one of the biggest challenges was this idea of the Indian. Okay. What was the What's Indian? It? And. Uh, uh, there were no computers back then. Uh, the world was largely governed by the anthropological concept of what the Indian was. And uh, a lot of the government policy, a lot of the education was pedagogically presented in a sense that we were Stone Age people. We would hear uh, other st uh, students, I would hear my friend, uh, Doug Hyde, for instance, you'd say uh, the school, the students, the white students who are Santa, uh, Santa Fe Indian School, Arpa St. John's College, they're 30 years ahead of us, 30,000 years, 30, years ahead of us. We're 30,000 years behind them because we're uh, categorized by anthropology as primitives and savages. And that permeated the entire uh, curriculum, I found, in one way or the other. And uh, I found myself questioning who I was as an Indian. That was the biggest challenge because then people would come up and say, hmm, you don't look Indian. Or Indians don't wear glasses or Indians don't have a sense of humor or you're not a real Indian. And uh, in spite of the fact that if you go to Browning, Montana today, you see Indians all over the place. That's where I grew up. And uh, when I grew up, uh, we didn't have any electricity, we didn't have any running water, we didn't have indoor facilities, we all lived in little cardboard shacks. Uh, uh, that, that went on right up until uh, 10 years ago on that reservation. Uh, nobody will help us, the government won't help us, our tribe won't help us, the Blackfeet Reservation wouldn't help us, we fell into this black hole. And uh, uh, it's, it's scurrilous how something like that can happen in the United States, but it does to people. And uh, so one of the biggest challenges was fitting into these stereotypes. What are these people talking about? And when I went to Europe, uh, London, the same thing happened. They wanted me to start fire rubbing two sticks together. Uh, they, they wanted me to behave like a Hollywood Indian, uh, riding a horse, war bonnet. Uh, you're not a real Indian if you don't do that stuff. And uh, it wasn't only until I got to uh, Canada where they changed their name from Indian to First Nations, where I was able to finally find myself as a, as a real person, because people don't come up to you and say, hey, you don't look First Nation. <laughs> uh, they still say you don't look Indian uh, down in the States, and I think that's stupid, anybody that says that. But uh, that's the ideology that you find in the United States, and it's still going on. And you find it in Europe as well. They have this self-concept of themselves that is based upon a, a media uh, that uh, was really born out of film and anthropology. And I think artists are uh, uh, afflicted by that as much as anybody else. Uh, so that, that was a big challenge. And it's still a big challenge today to teach that to students at the University of uh, I teach at Mount Royal University now in Calgary. And uh, to teach that to students who have never met Indian people before or First Nations people before. Uh, they're just waking up to the fact of all those residential school deaths of children buried, uh, 
they figure there might be as many as 15,000 or more. Uh, they're still digging them up. Uh, Canada's undergoing a great uh, self-reckoning over this because they've always seen themselves, much like the United States, as self-righteous. We brought civilization to uh, the savages out here and all that nonsense. Uh, I find that uh, uh, teaching the, uh, the genius of Native people is also a challenge as well because we've had uh, a lot of genius among our people that uh, that came up with incredible things uh, that we still use today uh, from agriculture to mathematics to architecture you name it and getting those out there on the same level as you uh, talk about uh, roman history or greek history uh, in the same breath that is the big thing because uh, once you start doing that, the students who are uh, the non-Indian students who are ideologically already brainwashed, and we see a lot of that today, uh, about who they are, uh, it's hard to get them to uh, turn around and then look at us for who we really are. And that's that's our next great challenge, I think, as educators. Thankfully, it's coming along okay, though. We do have reconciliation up here, and uh, they're finally accepting us for who we are and who we say we are. So we become then, then the uh, experts rather than the anthropologists or anybody, anybody who's not native in this uh, field. Yeah, I think that that speaks quite a bit to, to kind of maybe your experience too, Linda, at, at this campus and the work that you've done as a faculty here is, you know, identity creation and discussions of authenticity and indigeneity. You know, it seems like that that was hotly, you know, debated back in the 60s at IAI and very much still is today. So really speaks to the way that as much as we have evolved as a culture, as a, as a country, you know, when it comes to indigenous people, there's still an awful lot to learn. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot that, that IAI can really do to continue to share that um, through its students and through empowering them to be that voice, as you said, Dr. Youngman, to, to wrestle away from the anthropological interpretations, uh, that sense of identity and who we are as people. So, oh, yeah, all the years that I taught here, I uh, always try to encourage the students to, um, well, you know, obviously people knew who they were, who they were, but, you know, encourage them to um, know who they were and where they came from and, uh, and to not be afraid to talk about your culture and use it in your work. And um, when you go to the library, if you read things in the, in the books that, uh, that are incorrect, go ahead and correct it in the books, you know, because they're, they're all written wrong. <laughs> and, you know, just encouraging students to always use their uh, cultural background in their work, because that's where you get your inspiration from. Um, but mainly, you know, you have to enforce that identity and not enforce, but, you know, encourage that identity. Um, and, and I learn from them as well because, you know, we all taught each other. And I think that's still, that happens still today that, um, that teachers learn from their students as well. We're all sharing together. Definitely so. So I know we've touched on it a bit already, but I'm wondering if you could both give us a little bit of a picture of really what uh, what was life like on campus. I know that you know in our in sort of our history, and we have a fantastic lib guide that's now up on our website. I encourage everybody to visit the library page on the website and see it. But there's uh, you know accounts in there that talk about the amazing bands that students are putting together, the kind of events, of course, in our slideshow as you've seen in the interims. You know, it looks as though there was. Difficult times, but also some some fun times. Like campus fun life time, was yeah. really something that a lot of the students enjoyed. Maybe being together. So, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that, what was what was life like on the campus? Oh, you know, we had uh, activities like yeah, like there was a rodeo club, there was basketball and um, choir uh, with, with Lewis Ballard in the chorus and. Uh, other other kinds of clubs that, that they would have, and you know we could go off campus and um, 
do whatever it was our club did, you know. Um, and I, I kind of remember being on the basketball team, but I wasn't really sure. And Karita always says, don't you remember you, you played on the basketball team? I said, no, but I remember being a cheerleader. And <laughs> so um, well, she, she said that I was on the basketball team. And I said, well, I was probably, I didn't play like, you know, the first round or anything. I probably was sitting on the bench or something. <laughs> but she said she remembered that. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the bus in Santa Fe, the transportation was either a taxi or the bus, and the, the local bus in Santa Fe was a, an old school bus that would go up and down Cerritos Road and take us into town. So that, you know, we, that's how we had our transportation into town. And um, we would go as groups because, you know, we were told not to go by yourself, you know, because of the, how people were the, in Santa Fe. Dr. Yeah, it's a, there was a lot of uh, good things that happened on campus. Uh, and we kind of made that thing run. Uh, it wouldn't have probably ran without, without us. Uh, there were a lot of uh, energetic students there. And there was something like 87 different tribes represented there. And I still think that's the best uh, school I've ever been to at that time, in spite of all the uh, misgivings I have about how it affected me personally. But uh, as an artist, uh, I couldn't have been in a better place at the time at the right time, because we had all, all kinds of great influences coming in. And uh, to, be, to in, be influenced by Kevin Redstar was great. Uh, to be influenced by Earl Eater was great. Uh, Tommy Cannon, he was there a short time, but his impact was felt. Uh, Linda, she was a great painter. Uh, he used to look forward to going and seeing her work. And uh, we'd get together, I'd get together with Bill, uh, Earl Biss or maybe uh, Bill Souza or uh, <clears throat> uh, Beetle, remember Beetle? <laughs> we would, uh, Frankie Metcalf. Uh, and uh, we would talk about art. Uh, we would talk about uh, uh, what kind of art we liked. Uh, we uh, ch exchanged ideas. Uh, we looked at each other's art. We critiqued each other's art because no one else was doing it. Uh, we were way beyond our time, I think, uh, for what we for the uh, years we were there. Uh, Tommy, of course, uh, painted off campus. Um, First Shoulder was still doing his striped canvases when he was there. And I think we had a great influence on him. There's one time he says, Alfred, I want you to come out to my studio. Look what I'm doing. And I said, oh, I get to go see his striped canvases. <laughs> so we went out to his uh, little studio we had out in Arroyo out there. And uh, uh, it was a little garage. And uh, the, uh, the door wouldn't close all the way, and it was about an inch and below the door where the draft would come in in the wintertime, snow would blow in. And he was in there throwing wood sticks in the, uh, the stove to keep the, keep the place warm. He's freezing out there. And uh, he unveiled his, his canvas, which was probably about uh, eight, feet, eight foot by six foot. And it was an Indian and a rhinoceros. I said, whoa. <laughs> I thought to myself, we've broken through to this guy. Look at what he's doing. He's doing Indian paintings. Because up until that point, he was telling us to be uh, abstract expressionists. And uh, we didn't think that had anything to do with us. Because we were involved in something of a different nature. And we all knew it. And uh, T.C. Cannon would later uh, graduate and go away to Vietnam. Uh, he would go to the San Francisco Art Institute, out to uh, out east uh, school there, and then go back to Santa Fe and paint. And then, of course, uh, I, by that time, I was teaching up here in Lethbridge, and I invited him up to come and speak at a conference. Unfortunately, he had that car accident, and I didn't get a chance to get him up here. But uh, just a couple of years ago, he had a retrospective of his work at uh, Peabody Museum in Salem, where all the witches are. And uh, there with uh, 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 Georgie O'Keefe. And I thought, wow, this guy has made it big time. And uh, 
they invited me out to be on a panel to talk about, just like this, about our time at IAIA. But uh, we would get together as students, uh, all of us uh, students who were Navajo, who were Pueblo, or Plains Indians, Northwest Coast, we would hold our own little sessions and we would exchange and talk about our mythologies. We would talk about how we could turn into animals. Uh, we would talk, tell stories of uh, how a medicine man might turn into a wolf. And we took these seriously. We did not uh, put them down to superstitions. We did not, as anthropology would do, uh, say that we were cavemen who believed in superstitious mythology. We knew these things to be real and we exchanged these, that information. And uh, today we still know they're real. Uh, I don't uh, at any time tell my students uh, that I teach that uh, these things are mythological, they don't, don't exist because the universe is a strange place. And when you're with Indian people, and you hear the real stories, you find out it's a strange place. Uh, we're not, uh, I'm not uh, out there delivering some kind of an ideological Western stories about who we are as human beings. We know who we are now as human beings and we tell those stories. And uh, that's what we started doing at Santa Fe. That's one of the uh, things I loved about the place. Was I had such a rich, experience there, knowing all the students who are from all over the United States. And uh, we love that school, all of us, uh, so much that uh, in most schools, students try to drop out. Uh, we would uh, want to be there. I remember my friend, Don Chunstudy, he could not get a ride from California to Santa Fe. So he hitchhiked to, be, to go to school. It took him two weeks to get there, but he hitchhiked. <laughs> That's how much we loved the school and what was going on. It inspired us. We inspired each other. Uh, and uh, to me, it still inspires me. It's still there. And uh, it's good to see you all doing such a great job. Yeah. Thank you. That, and that was another thing that I uh, <clears throat> remember telling students is um, when you talk about your culture and you talk about your stories, they're not myths. Those are real. You know, you, uh, these stories that were told to us, that um, they are real. Yeah. We're excited, of course, in the contemporary that we have so many more ways to tell those stories mm -hmm. and make them, make them real for the larger world. As, as you said, and, and Dr. Youngman, you know, these are not myths. They're not, these are, these are part of our, how we became who we are. This is how we identify ourselves. This is how we understand the way that our world is and our place in it. So it's exciting to hear that also was happening <laughs> back on the old campus that you know these stories were being so so widely shared and told and that it inspired and of course not only students and peers but even the faculty um, back in the time of, of the SFIS campus. Um, you know my, my last question uh, before we open up to, to Q&A is really with regard to uh, our student audience that's with us here in the room today and of course joining us virtually and those who will see the recordings of this session in the future. Um, and that is, uh, what would you want the current IA and future IA students to know about what, what it is to be an IAIA alum and what it is that you would like them to know and take with them from this place? I always say that um, any student that attends here at IAIA uh, is part of the IA community, part of the IA family. And, you know, once you get that connection, um, you'll always have other people wherever you go um, to support you. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great place to come to school and um, sometimes people would really find themselves, you know, in, in who they are as, as an artist. And um, they just become part of the community. Um, there is a, um, uh, I think, an ambassador program. Do you still have that? If they have that here, um, I always, I always think that any time you come from another culture and come to this school, you're part, you're an ambassador of your of your people, that you you represent your people, and people will always look for you or um, look to see what you have to say when you come to IAIA. Thank you. 
being an alumni, I think, is always something that uh, I uh, value very highly. Uh, I'm proud to have been there when I was. <clears throat> it did get me going down the road. And uh, I always harken back to my experiences there whenever I uh, was I'm teaching or I'm traveling. Uh, I keep in touch with other IAI alumni. Uh, just uh, I, on email with BJ Goodluck just a few days ago, uh, kind of ask each other how each other's doing and uh, update, update each other on the, on the, what we're doing, I suppose. And uh, uh, I used to keep in con contact with Billy War Soldier and we wanted to do a history of IAI before he passed away and we were working on it. Uh, unfortunately, his untimely passing uh, put that to an end. Uh, I wanted to write a book uh, on that, on the 60s, on what we gave to IAI as alumni. And there were some incredible works that came out of there and you can categorize them and you can see where everything came from. Unfortunately, in our world today, uh, we need to get permission to use the imagery. I've written the text already. We need to get uh, the permission of the artist to use the, uh, uh, the painting in your uh, in your book, and you should be paying the artist for that. Uh, and it's just too much work to do because I have about 45 paintings that I have included in the work. All uh, all that work that was done around the 60s and how they influenced each other and how we influenced each, uh, how they influenced me. Uh, it's it's just a, a incredibly rich rich story, and I can. Uh, still see the conversations we had and uh, the artwork that we were doing and we would have traveling shows back then and uh, we went to Anchorage, Alaska one year and I went up there with the show James McGrath and uh, it was uh, our show was greatly uh, accepted up there. Uh, Alaskan uh, reporters uh, from the newspapers they said it was one of the best shows they had up there all year. So we as students were making inroads and uh, people like Doug Crowder and Alfred Claw and uh, 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 David Montana, uh, Parker Boyd and all those, all those people are included in my book because I remember them like they were yesterday and uh, what a great influence they had on me. Uh, uh, Richard Yazzie and uh, I can go on and on, uh, Phyllis Fife. Uh, they, they just continue to have, uh, uh, play a large part in that history. And I don't think they should be forgotten. And I was, I, I wrote the history. I just cannot get it published. I can't, can't get the money. Well, maybe we can assist with that. <laughs> uh, as many of you know, please course, do. <laughs> as our panelists probably are aware, you know, the, the Institute of American Indian Arts, and we'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon, but. We're preparing to embark on a, on a pretty significant uh, advancement in our history with the founding of the Research Center for Contemporary Native Art, um, which really yeah. pairs together the amazing collection, the physical collection of, of our Museum of Contemporary Native Art with our archival collection. They're actually going to exist side by side in, in, this, in the same space, really revolutionary. And of course, the hope is that it will lead to uh, the production and publication of the same sort of works that you're talking about, Dr. Youngman. These so um, crucial pieces of history that are currently missing um, that you know we all sort of loud and take advantage of the benefits of but don't necessarily understand where they're rooted in. Um, it would so be so great if we could get that out. Uh, that is a large part of uh, Native art history that I, I miss when I teach. Uh, I talk about it I'm free to do it in my classroom but I can't publish it. I can't get it out there in the public domain mm -hmm. where it needs to be. Yeah, it's just totally missing from the public. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure we would we would greatly benefit from that, as would our you know current and future students. So, we look forward to maybe talking with you more about that in the near future. Um, Hope so. And that is certainly yeah. you know where where we're where we're going with a lot of what we're doing right now. You know this this symposium panel, our ongoing uh, alumni profiles, and what we're doing into the future is really about recording this history for posterity. Um, of course, teaching it ourselves, but really sharing it with the world. Um, so I thank you both for, for sharing your stories and sharing your remembrances and, 
again, keeping this alive, keeping this history alive. That's so, so important. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you all. Yeah. And before we wrap, you know, I'd like to, to open up the floor if there's any questions from any of those who are in attendance or potentially online. So I think I saw Rosemary's hand go up first. <laughs> Let me, let me repeat the questions really quick. So we actually had two questions in the room. Um, the first was, what made uh, our two panelists apply in the first place uh, to IAI? And uh, did they in their time, uh, or have they since, felt the impact of Lloyd Kiva New on their work? Well, I always knew that I wanted to be an artist, and when I was, um, going to school at the Phoenix Indian School, my mother had read in the paper that, that there was gonna be a new school opening up in Santa Fe that was, uh, uh, that was gonna be an art school for Native people. So she had called me up and said, do you wanna, you know, I read this article in the paper, do you wanna go? And Lloyd knew he was gonna be the director. And she said, do you wanna go? And I said, of course. So that summer we worked on paperwork to uh, the application to come to IAIA. And um, so I always knew I wanted to do my art so that Santa Fe, the IAIA was a perfect place to come to for uh, Native American art. And I did have Lloyd New as a teacher in um, uh, uh, fabric uh, screen printing, so textile, textile design and fabric uh, screen printing. So. Uh, he was one of my teachers, and he was also um, in the in the class that was uh, was called Indian Aesthetics at the time, um, where all the native instructors would be, in, we'd all be in a room, and they would tell each one of them would tell us their story of um, who they were, how they did their artwork, and how their culture um, uh, gave them the uh, creativity to create their work and. Um, he was one of them that was in, the, in that class in, uh, as a teacher at that time, too. Thank you. Yeah, I came to uh, IAI not as an artist. Uh, I was on my way to Flandreau Indian School, Indian School and uh, waiting for a place to open up. There's some of us Indian kids from uh, around Browning on the reservation, Fort Belknap, who were... Uh, all waiting for places to open up. Our boarding schools uh, didn't have enough space for us. So they were gonna ship us off to uh, uh, Sherlock or someplace like that. I turned up, I was in Conjo uh, boarding school, waiting for a place there. And my brother was with me and uh, place opened up in this new school called IAI, Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And I said, where is that? What is that? <laughs> and uh, they put us all on a bus and they shipped us out to Santa Fe. We arrived in the middle of the night. We didn't know where we were. I had no idea where we were going. And uh, we got off downtown Santa Fe, uh, around San Francisco Street where the old bus station was. And it was dark and there was a little dim light bulb there. And we got out and we saw all these weird looking buildings around. And what is all of this? all this adobe stuff we never seen before in our lives. I thought, holy man, where did they send us? And they took us on a bus down to the IAIA campus and they let us off way down at the women's end and the boys' buildings were on the north end. <laughs> so we had to walk all that way at night uh, to, our, uh, to our building, to our, where, we, where the boys were. and. Uh, the assigned us rooms. Yeah, we didn't know what, what we were doing there, Had, hadn't a clue. They said, you're in an art school. Well, what's that? <laughs> so uh, from there on, we were assigned our classes and all that. We sort of got used to uh, being there. And uh, I like to paint anyway. I like to draw and that sort of stuff. So I thought, huh, this art must be something here. So uh, I... Uh, got right into it and started some of my earlier paintings I think IAI still has uh, probably someplace stopped away uh, but uh, oh, yeah, with uh, Lloyd New he would come along later I would know him and I think I got there before he was 
I would only know him as a uh, administrator. Uh, I knew he was a printmaker. Uh, he did a lot of uh, uh, silk screens and uh, doing uh, cloth as prints. And I went and I tried that out, and uh, I found it to be very pleasant. Uh, he was a very uh, knowledgeable person. I was uh, impressed by him. Uh, he was a very kind person, kind-hearted, and uh, I found him different from a lot of the other instructors. Uh, uh, I never got to know him personally because uh, he didn't. He was a uh, administrator and I was a lonely student, but uh, I always uh, looked forward to whatever he was talking about. He'd come and address us and he would always be the most uh, respectful uh, person you could ever meet. He was just amazing. So Thank nothing you. but good things to say about him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I think I saw there was a second person with their hand up. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, as alumni, what, what would they like to see, curricular-wise, uh, as an institution, what would they like to see available to, to the future students? Uh, Alfred, I'll let you go first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was the first template, I think, for our curriculum that I've ever seen, which went across a wide breadth of uh, art, uh, uh, mediums, everything from jewelry to uh, painting, silk screen to zinc plates, uh, to music, uh, to beadwork, uh, ceramics, drawing. And we got a chance to experience all of that. You don't get that in any art school, any place you go. Uh, you specialize in one thing in an art school. I specialized in painting when I went to Slate and uh, film history. Uh, but I've never seen that anywhere else. And because we have that wide breadth of experience and we have an opportunity to uh, dip our foot in the cold water there, uh, we got to find out what we wanted to uh, do. And uh, I made some silver uh, uh, necklaces and uh, I did some zinc plates and uh, I did some photography. Uh, got into just about everything. And I found all of that to be of uh, use when I went to painting because I applied all that to my painting. And down the years, I used all that in my painting. And uh, I learned from uh, Richard Hamilton at the Slade School. He was the guy that did the Beatles White album. And I just happened to be there at the right time. And he was talking to me and he says, yeah, you just do anything you want. Don't let anything stop you. So I didn't. I, I literally put everything to use that I had at my disposal. And I think that's what uh, art students should do. Uh, whatever you uh, experience, get as wide a breadth of experience as you can in all the arts and apply them to, if you're a painter, apply them to painting. If you're a printmaker, to printmaking, so on, photography. Because it all pans out. It all, it all works together. I, I agree. Um, I, I think we need to bring back uh, the, like the fashion uh, design, fashion um, <laughs> program, because there's a lot of uh, students here, and and they have been in the past that can really design and create, you know, native fashion. I think it's incredible. So we need to bring that back. But the interdisciplinary of all the courses, I think, is really helpful. Um, I would have liked to have taken maybe some museum studies pro, uh, pro, uh, classes, uh, because as a, as a uh, visual painter and printmaker, um, I like to see how things are, are selected and arranged in a museum or a show how to light your work and um, uh, publications. Um, maybe we could have a publication program, mm -hmm. produce books. Um, but it, it all, like Alfred says, it all goes together. Every, everything 
you never know what's gonna, how you're gonna use it in your work, but it all, it all helps. Thank you. Oh, I think there might be a question online, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, uh, what did the students do during their off time? What did they do in the evenings? What was their off school time like? And uh, importantly, what were the meals like? How was the food back in the day? I, I remember one time in the cafeteria uh, at one of the meals <laughs> um, that we would all have to rush in and get to a table and it'd have to fill up before we could uh, get our dinner served to us, and like Alfred said, you know, the guys had to tuck in their shirts, and they'd come around and correct everyone for their neatness. But I remember one time Larry Desjardins eating a piece of steak, and the steak flew off of his plate because it was so um, uh, tough. <laughs> <laughs> But everyone was hungry all the time, and uh, we had rules like you had everyone had to finish um, taking our food out of the the main dishes, uh, food bowls, uh, before we could uh, order for seconds. And someone would have to raise their hand, and they would come and bring our uh, uh, seconds for our foods. <laughs> um, but off campus, I used to like to go up on the corner street to. Fred's drive-in to get a Frito pie. That was always one of my favorite things. Um, like, and like I said, you know, we'd take the bus to go downtown or go to the stores. And um, some, some of the students, our kids, used to walk across the street and um, work in the, uh, it was a soda shop or, that was across the street. I can't remember what it was called. But they used to work over there. Um, hmm. Go to the movies, I, I guess. Yeah, we would uh, never be at a loss for something to do. We were a creative type, and uh, we had bands, school bands. We'd always play for uh, school dances. And uh, uh, one of my favorite bands was when I and Kevin Redstar and Earl Eater and Tommy Cannon had a band, and uh, we got together and uh, we just knocked them out. Uh, there were about three or four different bands on campus, and I was part of each one of them. One of them uh, appeared in Life magazine one year. Uh, it was great. Uh, there was a battle of the bands statewide at one of the Pueblos uh, down by Albuquerque. And we went down there, and we entered, and we won. Uh, we were a good band. Uh, we went through several names. Uh, the Foves, uh, the Jaguar, uh, Jaggers, the Playboys. Uh, uh, we were always uh, thinking of something to do. And uh, we would, uh, when we weren't playing music, we were painting. Uh, you couldn't keep us out of those studios. Uh, we would paint. Uh, I'd paint 24 hours a day if I could. Uh, it was just that much energy around. Uh, Gloria Guggenheim, I think her name was Gloria, Peggy Guggenheim, she came on campus and she was the uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And she immediately pronounced us an art movement. Uh, she says, you're, you're like an art, you're like a Bauhaus or something like that. You guys are a full-fledged art movement. And that really picked up our spirits. Wow, you know, Peggy Guggenheim. And so this book that I'm writing, I call The Last Great Indian Art Movement of the 20th Century. And that's what happened at that time. There was that much energy around, and it was being drawn from all over the place. And uh, which is, I think, which is why a lot of us went on to be uh, in San Francisco Art Institute or the Chouinard Art Institute or Slade School. Um, we uh, helped each other. We pushed each other. We uh, had confidence in each other. Uh, we just had a great time being doing the art. And as far as the food goes, that was pretty good, I guess. <laughs> it was okay. We learned we learned a family style of eating. That is. <laughs> <laughs> 
civilized us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was called, family style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think I saw a hand up. Is that you, Taylor? So the question was from a current student um, asking our alum, did they have any doubts in their time, uh, in their work, in, in what they did? And then especially as, as uh, alum who came from out of state, although some with tribal connections to the state, you know, did, they, did they feel they wanted to stay here? How did, they, how did they make that decision? I don't remember having any doubts. I, you know, just being in school, there was a lot that was being offered, uh, a lot of courses, and um, there was, there was a lot to do, so um, I, I don't remember having any doubts. It's just just keep moving forward and getting your education. Yeah, it was it was a self-driven school. I think it's often said that uh, uh, art schools make the artists. I think it's the other way around. Uh, I think that artists make the art school, and uh, I found that in all art schools that I've gone to, uh, the artists make the art school. And uh, I learned that in, uh, in England, uh, art is your highest source of knowledge. And uh, I took that seriously and I took it to heart. And I still do. And I've learned that nothing is off bounds when you're doing art. Uh, virtually, it's wide open. And uh, I use that philosophy when I teach and also when I uh, teach from the native perspective. If the Native perspective criticizes Western society, it's not because I'm being radical, I'm anti-Christian, I'm anti-anthropology, I'm anti this or that. It's that this is what it's called for, it's wide open. This is what freedom, academic freedom is about. You're out there and you are uh, uh, scientifically, if you will, which I learned in anthropology, uh, looking at society and uh, history and you're drawing conclusions from that. And uh, uh, I learned that nothing is off bounds. And if you limit yourself, if you, uh, if you get your legislators uh, legislating against knowledge, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your, your society. You're hurting your country. You shouldn't be doing that. One thing in Europe, in London, they don't do that. They just, everything is wide open. Uh, and that's what I liked about London the freedom that I gained there and how to use that freedom and uh, how to always uh, guard against uh, someone telling you what to think. Because once you are being told what to think, you stop thinking freely. Uh, you've got to always get that old mind working and uh, uh, think for yourself. And that is what creates new art. That is what moves us forward. And we should, uh, I always teach my students, don't be afraid to criticize your traditions, if you see something wrong. Uh, at the same time, don't be afraid to speak out for your traditions. Uh, they are really what your art is about, who you're about. Um, our traditional things that we do, uh, we try to teach them as much as, I try to teach them as much as I can, but there's a limit to what I will teach. I won't teach everything. There are things I'll hold back on for a reason, and that's, if they're sacred, I don't think that the academic world is necessarily the place for them, or the scientific world. They belong in a certain place, and uh, this is a part of my teaching philosophy, so. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you both. Were there any other questions, either online or in the audience? Let's just say just one last thing. Thank you all for uh, listening to my uh, uh, experiences. Um, I noticed some furrowed brows and what have you. Uh, this isn't about uh, criticizing anybody. This is seeking the truth, and that's all it is. 
uh, and your artwork should be based on the truth of nothing else. Uh, that'll make it a better art than it uh, otherwise it would be if you made it up. <laughs> you, like Hollywood does, makes up so much of the stuff, you know. You, <laughs> so many Indians that they made up. <laughs> Just uh, be careful. So, thank you. I think I saw one yeah. one more hand go up just as you were talking. So the question was with, with regard to our alumni's teaching philosophy, since they're both educators in addition to alumni, how did they take what they learned at SFIS and applied it at the uh, different institutions that they've taught at? What is their philosophy? How was it guided by their experience? Are you talking about being a student at the Santa Fe Indian School? Because we were on the campus. We, we were a shared campus, so it was a... Uh, only yeah. the public no, council that Yeah, no, I think the question was more towards how did the experiences you had as a student uh, help to inform how you are now as an educator and how you were as an educator in your career? Um, I guess, you know, wanting to learn things that I didn't get. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we were guided in ways, you know, in, in the classes, but um, maybe a little bit more instruction in the studios. Um, and how you know how we can use that to apply to our to our artwork, um, and that's what I try to you know try to do when I when I was teaching here at IA. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that came across. <laughs> so, Doctor, I would uh, oh. I would say that uh, prior to the nineteen seventies seventy four. Before the first Native Studies departments were established in Canada, uh, there was no Native perspective. Everything I'd learned was from the non-Native perspective. Uh, and it became very difficult to deal with that stuff because it was so pejorative, a lot of it. Uh, how do you become savage and primitive, say, if anthropology identifies you as that? Uh, I wrestled with that question. What is that? How am I supposed to be that? And. Uh, I learned uh, from all the students, the 87 different tribes there, that they were all humans like I was. We were all humans. We were all, we were all students. Uh, we all had feelings. We weren't savages and primitives. We came from different, vastly different backgrounds. And uh, I kept in contact with uh, alumni over the years, and we would talk about these things. And that informed my teaching, and that helped inform my uh, pedagogy. And I, I could argue and talk about uh, Native art, Indian art, uh, with a great deal uh, more confidence than I could otherwise if I just came at it from an anthropological perspective. Now, I got my PhD from Rutgers University, and it's in anthropology. Uh, my reservation in Rocky Wood, Montana, they list me as the only tribal anthropologist, <laughs> which I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I don't know if they're taking that whatever out of me, but uh, <laughs> you know what they're like. But uh, I, I instilled all of that in me, and uh, I still rely on it today. And uh, keeping in contact with people like BJ Goodluck and uh, uh, seeing Linda every once in a while. Uh, where we, our paths coalesce, cross. Uh, it's always a good thing uh, to see all that because it takes me back to a time when uh, all of this began and uh, how it was formulated. And uh, I thoroughly appreciate it today because teaching a native perspective is what I, I do at a university level. And uh, it's always good to have all of that in my background and refer to if I want to uh, say that, see, this is the truth. This is what I'm teaching. Thank you. I just want to add that um, when I was still in, in California at the Art Institute, um, um, there was a group of us that were, were showing uh, uh, George Longfish, Harry Fonseca, and different people like that. and. Um, Alfred invited us up for a show up in Lethbridge when he was there, and 
when we got there, they were getting ready for their spring powwow, and we got, we, they took us to the academic building where he was at, and they were drumming away, getting ready to uh, have their powwow for the next day, and it, that was just the most amazing thing I saw or, you know, experience that, um, Wow, why can't we do that here? You know, just have drum sessions in the in the classrooms. You know, I think it's great. Well, thank you again, both, for joining us today, and we we'll look forward to continuing these conversations, and of course, making them um, a really cornerstone of what we do here and the creation of our new collection in the Research Center for Contemporary Native Art. So we'll wrap the panel with that. I'll, I'll invite everyone who's here in person. We do have lunch, and we're very fortunate we also have the Performing Arts Club to come and drum for us and play for us over lunch. So we are incorporating it. <laughs> but thank you all again. And for those online, we'll resume the Zoom sessions at 1 with our next panel, which is uh, alumni from the College of Santa Fe campus, where I, I occupied for a period of time. Thank Ask you very Lee. much. Ask Lee. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, welcome back everybody from lunch. Uh, for those who are joining us via Zoom, we're just about to start uh, the second half of our symposium today, which will consist of three panels, first of which will be our panel with alumni from the College of Santa Fe campus, second will be alumni from our current campus, Rancho Viejo, and then we'll be closing out the afternoon with a look into our future. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan Flayhive, Chief Archivist of the Institute of American Indian Arts, who will be moderating the College of Santa Fe alumni panel. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Everybody can hear me. My name is Ryan Flayhive. I am the archivist here at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Thank you all very much for being here for our Making History Symposium. This is the On the Move IAI at the College of Santa Fe panel. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of context before we get on and uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. In 1969, the United States Senate recommended that IAI become an accredited college to provide a model for other tribal schools. Throughout the 1970s, Lloyd New and his administration worked to formally accredit the postgraduate program through various accrediting bodies. A number of loose credit arrangements were established, first with Antioch College in 1971, then with Rhode Island School of Art and Design in 1973. Finally, Middle college status was given by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1975. During this process, II eliminated the high school program in 1979, which drastically cut student numbers and threatened our federal per capita funding. After cutting the high school program, just a year after the retirement of Lloyd New, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and II agreed the students from the Albuquerque Indian School should be transferred to IAIA for 10th, 11th, and 12th grades supervised by the All Pueblo Indian Council. During that process, the Pueblo Council gained the support of Secretary of Interior James Watt and Senator Pete Domenici to produce legislation that would return the entire Santa Fe Indian School campus to the All Pueblo Indian Council to use as a junior and senior high school. The assumption was that IAI was underusing the Santa Fe Indian School campus. IAI was given then three choices moved to the Albuquerque Indian School, which was being renovated, moved to Haskell Indian Nations University, or three, find other suitable quarters in Santa Fe. John Wade, Flandra Sioux, was president at the time, approached CSF for a temporary home for IAIA. This was followed by a temporary exchange, an experimental exchange between College of Santa Fe and IAIA that started in 1976. By the spring of 1981, an agreement was worked out between the schools to lease space to IAI for classes, athletic activities, dorm space, portable classrooms, and cafeteria services. IAI was allowed to keep the IAI museum as well as 3D course studios at the Santa Fe Indian School campus. During this entire period, efforts to accredit our college program through the Higher Learning Commission stalled around 1984. Reports say the full accreditation was not possible unless IAI had a campus to call its own. This experience led IAI leadership to draft legislation that would release IAI from the many restrictive bonds imposed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to become a more independent entity and to build its own campus. While the arrangement at College of Santa Fe was not ideal, the story is one of resilience and rebirth. So with that context in mind, I'd like to invite our panelists, who are all alumni, to introduce themselves before we started with some questions. Please. Thank you. Buju, Nenisa Nishinabe Anin Ka Wababaganakak. My name is Jesse Riker Crawford, and I'm an alumni of IAI. Um, I uh, graduated in, oh my gosh, 2000. <laughs> um, and I, then came back to IAI and became a faculty, and I've been at IA teaching for over 18 years now. Um, yeah, so welcome. Hi, um, my name is Dina Velarde. I'm Hickory Apache. Um, I'm an alumni of IAI. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in museum studies in 2010. Um, I also, um, at the time, it's kind of interesting, um, Jesse was my, um, my advisor um, 
but we worked out um, just, uh, I ended up um, graduating with a double major, so I also did an associates for studio arts. I'm, I'm currently um, employed here at the, muse at the um, college, um, but yeah. Hello, my name is Jameson Chase Banks. I'm a graduate of IAI with an associate's degree in 96 to 99, and I've been teaching here for the last 10 years. Hi, I'm Erica Lord, I'm Athabascan and Inupiaq, and I did not graduate from here, but I was here between 99 and 2000, and I was granted a year off from my four-year school to come to IA, even though it was just two years at the time, um, because I knew about this tribal arts school and thought it was really important. And so they granted me a year off so that I could go to school here and then return there. I swear it was the year that made me an artist, that the artist that I am today. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all very much for those introductions. Um, generally, and I'd like to start with Chase. What was life like on the call to Santa Fe campus? Well, it was, uh, for me, I was, you know, just 18 years old, so it was really uh, relevatory. I felt like it was a place that I belonged, and I was really very grateful to be able to find this place. Uh, I think, you know, growing up, it was really hard to fit in as a Native person. And I mean, sometimes it still is, you know. So I feel like this was a real uh, kind of a homecoming for me to find this place. I was able to meet so many people who had the same kind of convictions and like, uh, you know, experiences in life. And so to be able to find this place was, uh, you know, in a sense, a way for me to find myself. Uh, in a nutshell, that's. That's kind of how I can say it. But, you know, to the overall experience of, of being at IAI as a young person, it was, it was really great to learn from people like, like Linda Loma Hoftawa, uh, Melanie Yazzie, Karita Coffey, uh, Charlene Teeters, and then, you know, a bevy of non-Native instructors as well, and they were all super supportive. They all listened to us and made us feel valued and a part of the community, and I think that was really what was, you know, missing for uh, myself. I mean, I came from the Seneca Cayuga com community, but it, it wasn't the same type of thing. I mean, as artists, when we come together, we have so much ideas and so much to share. But beyond that, I mean, we all come from such unique experiences and unique cultures and regions, and then also such unique ancestry. And so I really felt like, you know, this, I, I can't say enough about it, about how it helped me find myself. Uh, so that, that really encompasses like those, those first years when I was here in the 90s. Well, not here, but at the College of Santa Fe. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was just really, really invigorating to my own soul to be able to find this place. And I know that might not be exactly what you're looking for, but that's a roundabout way of answering it. That's a great answer, Chase. Thank you. Um, do any of the rest of you have any other comments on social life on campus? How was the interaction between College of Santa Fe students and IAI students? Ten tense at best. It could be <laughs> violent at, at worst <laughs> sometimes. It was like, I know there was always yeah, trying to pick fights with this, and there was a lot of tension, I remember, between the dorms, like, I don't, know, I don't know that I remember any tension. Actually, I was a student of College of Santa Fe first, right. and so I did take, um, but yeah, even then I could see that there was some type of division. I don't think I ever got into mm. any kind of skirmishes with anybody, but the, you could definitely see, I mean, sharing a cafeteria, you know, mm -hmm. um, some of the classes in the barracks, there was definitely a divide. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that it was necessarily intentional. It just was. I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, you were there a little bit later, right? Then that's like. Um, I actually mm -hmm. um, graduated in '86 from the Santa Fe Indian School, so 
I even remember the students there um, from I um, taking classes there on the campus of the Indian School. Um, but shortly after, I started school at the College of Santa Fe. And then eventually in 90, 1990, I um, took classes um, okay. at IAIA, which was yeah. entirely different from shared, I mean, even though we yeah. all shared the campus, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, and those really bad experiences weren't, were the exception, of course, but like I remember one memory that comes to mind was like, we were all wearing black armbands on Columbus Day. <laughs> And we just kept getting taunted and taunted, like cafeteria and going to the dorms or going between classes. Like they didn't understand why we were wearing them. But that was like, you know, at its worst. And I think over time, yeah, most of them maybe didn't understand but wanted to understand. And so there was there was a lot of good interaction, but yeah, there was those moments that I remember there was definitely tension. And, Maybe it, maybe it would have been different. I actually was an off-campus student, so maybe mm -hmm. it would have, uh, you know, there was probably a lot I didn't, you know, experience mm -hmm. being off-campus. I do remember some uh, interactions. Most of the times it was good, but there was that divide. We didn't have the support that the College of Santa Fe students had. Like, as you said, yeah. our classrooms were in the army barracks, these kind of like yeah. mobile, kind of spaces with the rotting floorboards. And I remember mm -hmm. if it rained, you had to move your artwork out of the way yeah. to, you know. Well, that and, still happens in drawing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but I do remember um, a time where we um, rebelled together and mm -hmm. it brought students. So that was in uh, 99. Um, so um, Dr. Martin, this was not at your time. Um, we, were <laughs> we were censored in our art uh, exhibits of what was being put up at the time. Um, um, so both mm -hmm. sides, not knowing that each of us were experiencing this, our mm -hmm. presidents would go through and take off artwork from on the wall um, that was being exhibited, and I'm museum studies students, um, and we rebelled. Um, so we set up an exhibit in the evening um, on campus, on the Santa Fe College campus, um, and did a co-exhibit, uh, co-curated by two um, IAI students and two College of Santa Fe students. Um, mm -hmm. And it started the IAI um, uh, Art in the Raw, um, which mm -hmm. we continued on to this day. So it's over 20 years at this time. Yeah. Um, but that was really powerful. Um, and then I think everyone came around and, and said, okay, no censorship. But um, that was a time where we did come together and um, fight the good fight mm -hmm. for art. Yeah, yeah. And I felt like there was a lot of that sort of um, I don't know, revolution or something in the air, like fighting for our school to continue to exist. Because I remember we were being threatened to get shut down by Congress that year, and I think our operating budget was half a million dollars for the entire school. Like we didn't have paper in some classes. Like but still, like, it, it was an incredible year. Yeah. Yes. I, sorry, I thought it was silence. <laughs> okay, <Sorry>. so it, <laughs> obviously sharing a space is part of what created the tension. Somebody mm -hmm. lay out the land for us. What buildings were you in? Where did you take what classes? What dorms did you have? What, what did that physical space look like? We only had one dorm. Right, Kennedy Hall. Kennedy um, Hall. I All believe so. At that point, we yeah. only had one. At, by the 90s, we only had one, one dorm, and that was Kennedy Hall. So most of us mm -hmm. were. It was a co-ed uh, situation. So most of us were that were living on campus were in Kennedy Hall. I believe by that yeah. time. I think. Mm -hmm. I think, going to from one school to the other, yeah, definite um, difference. You know, in the dorms from the College of Santa Fe and then going to, you know, I mean, I did have friends there on campus um, in the IA dorms and yeah, definite mm -hmm. difference. And then even in the classrooms, um, you know, having classes in the barracks, it was just kind of interesting. Um, but the cafeteria did exist within that same realm of those barracks. So mm -hmm. it was, 
honestly kind of shabby, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, really? Huh? Yeah. yeah. And, and those were army barracks and from World War II, so they were built yeah. in 1940. So. so it was also partially part of the internment camp? Yes. I remember because right. like every time I go to class at night time, I would start talking to the guy. Please don't show yourself to me. I'm not ready for it. I'm like my my family was interned, and I remember thinking a lot about that every time I would, you know go to class. It's hard not to think about that. And then like Jim has all the scary ghost stories. <laughs> you know, lots of ghosts. Yeah, I mean, so on the College of Santa Fe, there were um, uh, the Santa Fe or College of Santa Fe um, uh, buildings um, that they were using, and those were the newer buildings. We shared a library space, so on the bottom floor was College of Santa Fe Library, top second floor, very nice library oh, yeah. was IAI Library. Um, but then, yes, we had the one dorms, um, Kennedy Hall um, for everyone, and then the classrooms were for the Santa Fe College students were the brand new or newer mm -hmm. classrooms and we were in the army barracks. So I took one or two classes in the newer classrooms and they were just so lovely. Um, and the other mm -hmm. ones, but, but, the, but what happened within the classrooms um, was not different because it was always, like you said, our faculty who cared mm -hmm. and brought us along. And um, yeah, and, and I'll mm -hmm. just share that um, I came to IA homeless with a three-year-old uh, daughter and six-year-old son um, living in a car and drove 1,500 miles um, and drove up and told them I'm coming. And when I'm accepted, come outside, knock on the door of my car and tell me I'm in. Um, and by the time I got to IA, IA they had rushed my portfolio through and I was in. Um, so that kind of care um, has not changed. I don't think it's changed from our first space to our second space to this space. Um, like you said, uh, Jameson, it's, um, it's a welcoming, it's a homecoming. A lot of, for a lot of us, it was a, um, a homecoming that had never happened before. Um, I'm from, uh, schools in extreme inner urban spaces of Chicago and Seattle, and no one told us that we were of worth. Um, we were yeah. being primed at that era of this new thing called fast food. Um, and they were just telling us, like, we're just gonna give you a high school diploma, you flunked most of your classes, and they did, they just gave it to me, um, because that's your destiny. And um, I was something very different and taught me to write. Thank you, John Davis, and thank yeah. you, Evel Evelina Lucero. Arthur Z. <laughs> taught me to uh, think critically um, and taught me that my voice had uh, something to say um, and that my um, cultural background was of worth. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the spaces yeah. look very different from here at where we're at now, um, the soul and the heart never changed. Yeah, yeah it was just, um, I remember I was reminiscing with you that I was like, do you remember the bookstore that was in one of those trailers and it was just the closet and you had to like lean in and try point which books you wanted? It was just a tiny closet. Um, but yeah, like you're saying, it's, there's something special here. I transferred from Carleton College, which is a top tier private liberal arts school, like who has all the money and power in the world. And, but they gave me a year off and like, God, just a mess, sorry. <laughs> um, and let me start talking with my hands. <laughs> but yeah, that they have all the resources and money possible. But I remember telling them that, you know, if you can't provide me with the education that I need, then you need to help me access that education. So can give me a year off so I can go to the school that has all the things that I need. And so they let me come here. And I remember, yeah, first being kind of shocked because I went from this school that just had oodles of money to these barracks and stuff. But, but again, it was like that was the most magical year because of the teachers, because of the students. Like, I went to school with you three. <laughs> and, like, and so much of our very small class that we were has gone on to succeed that it was this sort of like scrappy 
success that we're going to fight our way through. And, and it was infectious, I think, to all of us. And that was, it was really exciting. It's, it was really exciting. I mean, to be taught by David Bradley. You know, who cares yeah. if it was in the barracks or wherever, you know? I mean, you reflect on the people you've come across and, um, you know, having drawing classes with Larry Desjolais and printing classes with Jean Lamar. I mean, yeah, they were, they were so inspiring. And, um, you know, you think about the instructors that we've had, um, like she said, um, you know, the people we're, we're walking with, you know, our journeys are all together and, you know, it's so inspiring. It almost doesn't matter where, where we're at, you know. Um, it's been such a good journey, for sure. I mean, even the, when we broke ground on the new campus, I remember I even came back later and that I took a few bagfuls of that dirt as I, it found its way into one of my installations because I wanted to <laughs> set the ground as this like new hope. And I was like, this is like a perfect metaphor for it. <laughs> yeah, it's, nice. it's in every part of our lives. That's right, they, they threw us in back of trucks. There were no roads out here. Yeah. And so we're just bumpity bumpity in the back of I trucks. I remember they were like, turn at this dirt pile and then there's yeah, like. No, yeah, there, there was really nothing. And um, the first building that went up here was the Hogan. The Hogan. And so we were like. They gave us the day the off of school if we went and helped they with it. Did. I still have my yeah, hard hat. Della. Like, yeah. I still got a little have my hard hat. Yeah, on it. absolutely. Still got it. <laughs> yeah. It's a testament to this place that all four of you now work for the institute. Yeah. After attending Call to Santa Fe, right. and I, I, yeah. it was so many years ago. Um, so I want to ask you a question about memories, and hopefully they, they interact. So you can answer it a couple different ways. Your favorite memory or your most significant memory of that campus? Because I think there's a couple different ways to approach it. Well, I've been blessed that um, our founder uh, would come to all the events, and they'd pull up a chair for um, Lloyd Kiva New. And I remember his totally beaded cane. And he'd sit there, like, you know, <laughs> looking at his kingdom of broken up barracks. But, yeah. his <laughs> but you could see the pride in his yeah. eyes of our students. And of course, we were just in awe. And that's yeah. my favorite. Yeah, yeah we'd have, like, we, we, I remember, uh, what was it one of the award things? We were like, it's wind in his hair. Wind in his hair is here to give us our award. Like we couldn't remember his name, but right. I think I think one of my favorite memories, honestly, might not be attached so much to a certain um, occurrence, but just knowing um, the learning that I was getting, it was just so it was just so powerful to me. Mm -hmm. It was probably attending the school then that I realized, man. I don't know where this is gonna take me, but I so want to, you know, continue with my artwork. Um, I felt like that was really an important step in my life. Um, you know, and like I said, I didn't know where it was gonna take me because the, you know, eventually there became so many options. I mean, and then coming to this campus, I, I was just like, oh my gosh. I can't get into jewelry. I'm already doing pottery. I'm already drawing. I'm already, you know, there's just so much that, um, I mean, it, it's inspired me so much. Photography, everything. I'm just like, what else can I do, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was really special for me. I'll echo kind of like what everybody says here a little bit. Uh, I do remember meeting uh, Lloyd New and that being such a big, uh, kind of experience for me. Uh, you know, meeting the founder of this school uh, really stuck with me over the years. Uh, but then also, you know, individual experiences that don't necessarily kind of supersede others, but there's like this just conglomeration of memories of being in the barracks, whether it been in ceramics or printmaking or photography. Um, you know, we all kind of come from these uh, lower income situations oftentimes and so 
I actually didn't even really see that being much of a hindrance. Um, it was almost kind of like aesthetic, uh, something that was aesthetically pleasing to me to be in this older building that had such a history. Granted, there was certainly haunted stories. You know, I never encountered any of that, but um, certainly not yeah. to discredit any of it either, but uh, there was a real magic. Uh, that's kind of the word I kind of always come back to, and I know that has kind of Western connotations, but the magic that was kind of just in the rooms. It didn't even have to be people in there. There was already this energy that existed, and it still exists today. Mm -hmm. I feel that that energy permeates my own studio, the printmaking studio. Well, it's not mine, but I teach, I teach it primarily. Right. And I, and I really feel like, yeah, I really feel like uh, that energy still exists and it's kind of one of the reasons, you know, we can't quite put our finger on exactly what it is that, that draws us to these places or, or we're um, constantly kind of being reminded of them and I, I think it goes back to having that, that energy or that, that magic that we all really participated in and, and kind of became infectious, like you say, but it also becomes addictive. Um, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons why we all kind of make our way back, circle back in some form or another. Yeah, like at, yeah, Carlton, you know, it was, I didn't have anyone that understood like why I couldn't pay for all of my books at the same time or where I was coming from or that my suitcase was like a garbage bag, you know, something like that. But it was just from, all of those experiences to come here and immediately find people that I could relate to on so many levels and that supported each other and was was amazing you know just I remember like the first couple days I was here like m meeting someone for five minutes and being like hey you I saw him across the parking lot I was like I don't remember your name I don't have a place to live do you know what <laughs> he's like you can live with me it's like great and it was just these like and I'm still friends with Shalom Begay, like, um, that these like instant friendships and support, and there was so much, I remember so much like helping each other out with different projects that, and I don't know, just so much of this ex excitement about learning and wanting to like, and that, that alone was just, yeah, it, it was just very, very special. That and the ghosts were memorable. <laughs> <laughs> challenges. What were the primary challenges for IA students at the College of Santa Fe, other than having to go to class and make grades? Well, I think financials were always the issue for a lot of us. So yeah. for us in that era, we heard about the golden era of IA, where tuition was free, books were free. Yeah. supplies for free and we were like dang yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know but we I think we all made it um, um, we went out and we worked at the Kmart and we you know went worked at the restaurants um, uh, for me I knew a lot of the students we, we struggled to make it um, and we all had, if not part-time jobs, and some of them full-time jobs. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, we were so dedicated. The, the educational um, feeling, um, the environment was so very different. I think at any other college, I probably would have dropped out and went, well, this is just too much. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't raise two little kids and get up at five in the morning and open up a store and go to a school and then go and work until evening and do it all over again and then the weekends. But um, I think that was always the, one of the hardest things for us as students was trying to find those finances to just make it through. Yeah. I'd, I'd, um, I'd probably have to say just um, in comparison to what we have today, I would, uh, you know, all the spaces that we have to create here I mean, it's amazing. It's it's really amazing compared to the spaces that we had back then. To me, that would have been a challenge as well. Um, you know, the, the, just the barracks were dark and cold, and you know, um, and not so specific to what we were needing to accomplish. 
accomplish or need need you know just space to create to learn um, mm -hmm. I, w I would say that was probably a challenge for yeah. us yeah. challenges um, yeah they were kind of plethora um, you know finances but uh, you know moreover just kind of finding your way to fit in you know finding your style I think that was always something that it felt like, you know, being surrounded by all these legends, we were all feeling like, oh, we gotta, we gotta perform like yeah. immediately and we need to find our signature style. That always seemed to be kind of on the forefront of people's minds when we would have discussions. It would be like, oh, we're, I'm moving into this new style or, you know, that, that seemed to always be kind of conversations around the dinner table mm -hmm. or discovering a new artist that, that made you think in a different way um, you know, those were challenges that were not necessarily kind of inherent to the, to maybe what we thought we were going to encounter, but they certainly were there. Um, but yeah, finances. I, I remember um, discovering that uh, studio monitors were, were a thing. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I was earnest in my, um, in my desire to get a studio arts or a studio monitor position. And I, and I couldn't believe it. I actually worked for Linda uh, mm -hmm. for a number, of, a couple of years there, being the monitor. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is, this is a real catch, you know, sitting here and like yeah. making sure the doors open and making sure people mm -hmm. can get their paint. Yeah. Uh, but, and while I was able to do my own work, I thought, wow, this is, this is great. I'm uh, very grateful mm -hmm. for that opportunity, Linda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and a studio monitor in sculpture, <laughs> which was, uh, and my teacher was Will Wilson, who works at the community college, and I still work with him on projects and stuff like that. Um, sculpture was way out on those storage units, sculpture and jewelry, way, way out in these storage units on Siler Road. I remember that was another sort of just interesting hiccup hmm. that we had to drive a little ways away from campus to go like roll up the storage <laughs> door. Do you guys remember, we actually, the first few years I was at IA, we, we shared the campus with the Santa Fe Indian School for the sculpture uh, uh -huh. department. So I remember going over there and, and that was when Paula Soleri was still around, the, the amphitheater. Mm. And I remember catching a couple of um, like reggae shows or some concerts yeah. you could hear right out the back of the, and I was like, wow, this is, this is like rock yeah. star stuff, you know? Yeah. It was really pretty special for an 18-year-old kid to witness. Yeah. And I mean, like, yeah, with all of those challenges, like some of the, you know, we've had that conversation with n numerous students that I'm like, listen, like of all the schools where you have teachers, um, us teachers here genuinely understand the struggles you guys are dealing with. Like, so ask us for help because we, we've gone through this ourselves. We've seen this over and over. We can help you. Like, because of our experience, like, and ha having those struggles and then seeing them in students now, I think, and then the support that we can give them, I think that's both the struggle and, and also the really great benefit or wonderful thing about this, because like you're saying, the, the teachers were just so, so dedicated, like Linda just helped us everything, and Will Wilson would <coughs> come in after, after hours to photo to show me like, how to do certain extra things that I, I wanted to learn because I just want to learn everything. But that, you know, so many teachers would help and support and put in all that extra time and effort. Like, it, it really meant the world. I mean, and probably why we're all teachers now. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add that. I think, you know, listening to her, I think a lot of the tutelage that I got really kind of forged the kind of behavior the way that I wanted to teach or that I wanted to support other people who were coming up who may have those same type of experiences. Really, really had great uh, instruction to being an instructor. Yeah, because I feel like I've had that conversation numerous times with students where they're like, but I, you know, I didn't know how to ask for help or I didn't know I could ask for help. You know, and I'm like, well, maybe you didn't feel comfortable doing it before, but you can hear <coughs> that we really genuinely want you to succeed and we'll help you get there. Just 
ask. So the conversation is leading us into a chat about faculty and about our teachers. And obviously these challenges probably affected staff and faculty as much as it did the students. Who were some of the instructors that affected your lives? Well, I, I uh, started off Studio Arts, and so Linda, thank you mm -hmm. for your patience. Char, thank you for more patience. Um, mm -hmm. And um, but Chuck Daly, um, we had I had an elective, and um, I didn't know what museum studies was, and I took a museum studies course, and that was it. I was gone, man. Um, I lo I like doing artwork, but I love other people's artwork and being able to like present it and support artists. Um, so yeah, Grace, thank you for being there, helping me in the library where I didn't know where anything, what is a Dewey system? Like what, like, so those teachers, yeah, were just so powerful and so kind. And um, again, we're so patient. Um, I, even in grade school, no one cared about us. You know, I turn in papers and not get any feedback. And that first time in a creative writing class, it was all marked up in red here, but there were explanations. You know, you can use a comma here. The, a semicolon does this. And I was, what? Like someone was actually telling me what some of these words were that I had, I had heard them, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to utilize them. Oh my gosh, I was just like draft after draft and they never shot me down. Like for every, every assignment, writing assignment, I was turning in three drafts um, because the red marks weren't, you're wrong, you know, yeah. zero. F again, Jesse. It was, you know, you can do this a little bit better if you do this and um, that patience taught me how to be a mm. faculty in the correct mm. way, um, and which I had never gotten K through 12 or the few times I attempted college before and dropped out quickly. Yeah. Um, like me and Jameson were talking about how, you know, over and over it's proven that like being, um, that most people work harder if they're given positive support and encouragement more than that, yeah, that like, no, 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 like, this is wrong, you can never do enough, like, which is what I you know, felt like in other schools, like, just, I'm still trying, but it, it felt kind of hopeless, and yeah, to have that positive support and feedback, like, I, I remember I stumbled into John Davis's class, because I, I didn't like the class that I was in. He started class out by saying that the old thing that we used to hear too much, there is no word for art in any native language. And I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I was like, Wait, there is. Um, and so I remember asking, like, what else is, what other classes are during this time slot? And they're like, you can take poetry. And so like I wandered in. And by the end of the class, he was like, are you a creative writing major? I was like, no. He was like, why not? So he talked me <laughs> into it that first day. And like, yeah, him and Arthur Z were incredible. Dorothy Cranwell, like. <laughs> in photography, just lasting relationships. I feel like um, I've had so many, um, I've been so fortunate. I feel like uh, Larry Desjardins with my drawing. I feel like Linda Loma Heftewa with my drawing. Um, I remember taking classes with Corita Coffee and I feel like I really got down my handles for my pottery just taking that class. <laughs> um, I think of Chuck Daly um, and, of course, Jesse, um, just the inspiration that they were for museum studies. Um, I think of um, David Bradley, of course. Uh, it's kind of funny because I come back across David Bradley years later. I'm working at Mayak, um, which I feel like, um, in some ways, you know, Chuck Daly, I feel like, was still with me then. Um, Jesse still with me then. I feel like um, being able to work in the museum there. But um, I come across David Bradley. He was putting up an exhibit. And, you know, just seeing him on the day to day. And all of a sudden, he tells me, Oh, hey, I put you in one of my paintings. And I'm like, What? You know, <laughs> it, it was just so awesome because there we are. There's. Um, now I can't even remember anybody I worked with at Mayak, 
but he had, you know, a little section of us standing at the Pueblo, um, at one of the Pueblos, I think it was Giwa that he had painted, and um, there's um, Della, and I don't remember who else. There were a few of us that were employees at, at Mayak. So in one of those paintings, you can see my little eye like this. <laughs> he just put my li just this little corner of um, my head. It's funny, and I was like, oh my gosh. So yeah, yeah I mean, I feel like there's been so many people who have inspired, um, you know, just at my time at I, and it's been over a duration of time as well. So um, I've gotten really, I feel like I've been very fortunate in just some of the people I've been able to work with. Yeah, that's, uh, that, I kind of echo that. There's a lot of people that deserve to be thanked. Um, Linda, again, her ears are definitely burning. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, Charlene certainly uh, helped me in a lot of my own conceptual kind of process. Uh, but there was, there's one gentleman named Fred Nowuksky, and I might be pronouncing his last name incorrectly, but he used to be the director, I believe, of the museum. And uh, when I first came here, I, w I was, you know, primarily doing painting. And I had made, I think it was an, about five little paintings. They were maybe, I don't know, a foot by nine inches each. And they all kind of talked a little bit about identity and um, things that I was working through at the time as an artist. Um, and, I, and Fred invited me into this kind of conference room when I was there one time and had asked if I had some work. And uh, I, I had with me some of the work. And so I, I busted it out. And he was like, hey, let's, let's make another appointment. And let's, let's see the rest of it. So like another couple of days went by and I brought the work in. And um, lo and behold, he actually bought it like on the spot for a commission. Mm -hmm. And so I think I sold them for like 200 bucks a piece, which was an immense amount of money to me at that time. I mean, it still is. But I thought I left there thinking that, wow, this is, this is phenomenal. I have just hit the lottery, you know? So I went back home and earnestly started to paint more. You know? uh, but, you know, on a serious note, like he really founded in me kind of the, the impetus or the, the confidence that something that I made can be valuable. And it really, it really changed a lot for me. Um, and then, you know, of course, the list goes on with like Carita Coffee, um, Dorothy Grand de Blois, all these kind of like legendary characters that were, that, that stood as like this wall of <laughs> talent, you know? So it was almost like every day I came into school, I was gonna be benefited somehow uh, interacting with these people and so I couldn't wait. I actually remember all, a lot of times being kicked out of the studios at like midnight. I think midnight yeah. was the time. But there would be times when the, the studio uh, security would actually mm -hmm. start to kind of know our, our seriousness and our ability to get things done and be mature and not destroy things. Yeah. And so they would give us kind of leverage and maybe be able to stay in there a few more hours certain nights if you know during midterms or finals or whatever. But I mean, even my own students, I kind of have to compel them sometimes to stay in there, you know. So mm -hmm. that older time, we actually had to be pushed out. Mm -hmm. We just, I mean, that was like our home. We didn't want to go back to the dorms. We wanted to keep working and keep experimenting. So those, those chances to do that and, and the people who allowed that really deserve a lot of credit. What is it that you would like current IAI students to know about your time at the College of Santa Fe? I always tell them they have no idea how lucky they are. <laughs> I was like, these barracks, and I, I remember Dorothy Grandwell being like, and that's the dark room, and that's this, and don't be afraid if you see an old man like sitting there watching you de develop photos. He just likes to watch you develop photos. It's not, and I was like, just terrible. <laughs> what did I get myself into? <laughs> But that just the the resources and yeah, not leak mostly not leaky buildings and just that it was there's there's just so much and that it's ours that it really is like our little corner here. I felt like on that campus we're often distracted by everything going on around us. We're right in the middle of 
I know that there was a lot of distractions for some students, but like being out here, yeah, just to, f to feel like we have our own space is, I don't know, it's empowering. Maybe they don't realize it yet, but we'll. <laughs> Right, just just in my like I said, the span of time I've I've been associated with, um, I I it's just like wow, I mean even since mm -hmm. the time I've graduated in 2010, just coming back, I'm like holy smokes, all this stuff has mm -hmm. happened since I've graduated, and um, you know it was already special enough to me to come here and man to feel like you were home, you know, I mean. Like he was saying, staying in, I, I remember staying so late in the photography studio, in the dark room. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I must have talked about it all the time because people used to tease me about it. But um, yeah, just, just the amount of space, the places we have to study, um, places we have to create, it's, it's just so amazing. And like I said, just uh, since I've graduated, I'm just amazed at how much has happened since then in 2010. Um, but just the amount of resources, not only in the physical buildings, but um, you know, just working with Jesse. Um, I, I mean, the idea of teaching or learning online, I mean, even that's insane. Mm -hmm. uh, just the amount of resources that students have, and it's like, you know, push it, use yeah. whatever you can, you know? Yeah. That's, that's what I would say, there's so much here and you're so fortunate. Yeah, I just want to mention something too that, yeah, the, I mean, the changes that have happened from having just a corner in the library, I mean, one of the challenges is that there's, there wasn't enough books, there wasn't enough resources about Native artists or, or art history, and now we have a whole library, and now we're building a research center, and like I remind them, like, so we, we can get library learn, but we don't loan our, out our books because they're that special guys. <laughs> like, you know, these really special, unique collections and it's why we're building the research and archives and all of this. And having the artist in residence program, you know, that they can learn from and meet more of these superstars and just continually expanding and having more resources, just very exciting. I just want to remind students uh, now um, that you are legacy and you are making history and there are times when it's rough and you know, there are times when you're going to think, man, I wish I had blank, um, like we did um, when we were like, man, I wish I had a chair that didn't fall apart. <laughs> but um, remember that you are a part of a really powerful history that's going on that was hard fought by our for, by our ancestors for us. Um, and so to be here at this place, um, education is supposed to be sacred. Um, we make it so, and it doesn't always feel that way, um, but just remember that um, you are so powerful and you are gonna change the world um, just this 35 year old waitress did. And when she went, well now what do I do? Um, you have the power, and, um, and we're really glad that you're here. Uh, you make us who we are as faculty and staff. Um, yeah. Kudos. Thank you for that. I'd like to open it up for questions. Anyone on the floor have a question for our panelists? Yes, sir. I'll repeat the question first. Uh, the question on the floor is how, how connected do past graduates from either the Santa Fe Indian School or the Call to Santa Fe campus feel to our current campus? I feel like it's the people that made, you know, made this place special, so it's still the people that we came back, you know, I would come back and visit over and over again and, yeah, look for those same offices of those people. So. 
it didn't matter to me, the space. I mean, there was memories, and I'll go drive by the barracks every once in a while when I would visit, but um, yeah, it was, it was coming back to see people here. I think um, one thing that's really cool about how we connect to who's come through, you know, I mean, through the history, I guess, um, you know, you walk into so many different spaces on campus and you see artwork hanging from the people who have, you know, learned here or who have created here. I think that's really cool. I mean, it's like I walk into offices all the time and I'm like, holy smokes, wow, that's such a cool piece. Uh, it's so exciting. I feel like that's a, a good connection. And there are times where I'm able to say, um, hey, I saw your work over there in the offices. Um, you know, I would hope that that would connect um, them to the place. Uh, as far as how we do that, um, wow, the, you know, I, it seems like the alumni connection um, probably would just depend on the individual, but IA does reach out to its alumni. And um, yeah, I would hope that they would come back and feel really welcome in these spaces because sometimes their, their work is here, you know, still after they've left. So to your question, uh, I think, you know, events like the powwow, the annual powwow, and now we have two a year. I think those types of things are always, um, you know, just real a connective thread for Native um, people in general. So to know that there's kind of another one to add to the list of maybe ones that you already enjoy, I, I feel like that's a real kind of um, strength that we have that maybe, you know, um, maybe mainstream society doesn't necessarily uh, entertain. But then, you know, also, um, like the Alumni Association, always kind of making different events or connections with different people. Um, but then, you know, just overall, the art shows. The art shows are something that, and the, the writings or the readings, different things yeah. like that, those different types of events. Um, or even things that are going on down at the museum, too. It's kind of a full spectrum kind of way of keeping keeping tabs on people or, or them keeping tabs on us. Um, so I think, I think we do a pretty good job um, connecting, connecting those worlds. Yeah. yeah, I first came back because of the artist in residence program and decided to stay. <laughs> I knew, knew it was time to come back and was really thankful for that. And I see so many of the alums coming back that way even if it is just for a month or two, like, it, it's huge. I think the museum has a lot to do with us keeping in contact with our alumni um, of presenting their artwork and having a store that's available for them to sell their artwork. Um, but I think it's really hard, too, for um, Native people to know how to reach out. Um, we, as, as alumni, we don't have $10,000 a year to give. Um, which makes us feel bad, right? Um, but I think uh, we forget that we have time um, that we can offer, and we probably should be um, reminding our alumni, um, just come into the classrooms and talk about your experiences and where you are now, and what was it like when you were a student is so important. Um, I think our students feel very, um, like they're, in an island sometimes, especially during midterms and finals. They seem to be really stressed out about then. Um, and it's just you have to ha be reminded um, that people have come through these hallowed halls um, in front of you. And um, it's just to share that story and, and uh, would be really helpful. I'm looking at you, alumni. So, so I, yeah, but so I, I think we can do more. I think we can reach out to alumni more and go, we just need you to come here and um, share some uh, of your insights and wisdoms is really helpful, even if you don't have $10,000 in your pocket. Yeah. Or 10. Or 10, <laughs> yeah. Other questions, comments from the audience? Yes, sir. I have a comment. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Like that connection. And at the time I went during that golden age you were talking about when it was free, and we did have two dorms. We had Alexis Hall besides Kennedy, and that's where those two sculptures were. And mm-hmm. then creative writing had the only designated room like in a brick building, which was in Benovis Hall, mm-hmm. the second floor. And it was a corner that wasn't just like we were in there once a day, but we had access to it all the time. So we were in there writing on the old printers that made that noise, and he tore off the paper on there. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, faculty, creative writing faculty, James Stevens. When did you graduate, James? 90. 1990. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. Questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, so our relationship with the museum, so it was far away, um, but at that time we still had the museum studies classes down there, so we would all climb in the van and drive down and take the classes and come back, and um, there were times where we were the curators of the exhibits. Um, yeah, so it was, but it, like even though it was from Santa Fe College to, oh wait, I'm going too far. <laughs> I'm going as a faculty, um, but you call it, uh, when we were at the Santa Fe College, um, yeah, it, it, it was a little bit of move from being closer when it was at the Indian School. Um, it's, it seemed farther. It was a little bit more difficult, it, yeah, but um, we, we were in there hammering and, um, and talking about ghost stories, like that basement is something else there. I think. Was that yeah. the morgue at one time? The, or the morgue Alexis was next Hall, next to it? Yeah, that was freaky. Down the Are you talking about the museum? Sorry. Yeah, the museum. Oh, the museum. Yeah. So yeah, I mean I think historically that was part of the covenant, right? Like across the street from the from the church. So yeah, there's probably some some stuff going on there. Oh, all I know is that yeah. was creepy. You didn't want to go get pedestals <laughs> at two in the morning, but we had to. Yeah. Yeah. I remember always hearing Alexis, I think it was Alexis Hall, that was the morgue, and our cafeteria was the uh, hospital, and whatever photo and printmaking was between, was between the hospital and the morgue. We were like, I don't know what was there, but it's between those two, and maybe why it's so haunted. <laughs> Would have been a great place to make a horror film back then, actually, thinking yeah. back on it now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm just glad I'm barely hearing about it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's when students are like, I heard something here. And I'm like, it's wind here. Like, you guys have no idea. Like, <laughs> don't. <But>. Took a turn. <laughs> Any other questions? It's Halloween. <laughs> Thank you very much to our panelists for coming today. Thank you. We will take a short break and be back around 1.30 for our next session. Thank you. No. Maybe my shoe. Yeah, good job you.
a place to embrace the past, present, and create the future. The Institute of American Indian Arts.
lot taller. Yeah, right? <laughs> Right, and welcome back everyone to the last of our alumni panels. Uh, before we launch into this panel, I just wanted to give a reminder, especially for those that are going to be on Zoom, uh, that they please be sure that if they're going to ask questions, they have their name labeled on their Zoom icon. That way we can be sure to call on you by name. Uh, if you do want to ask a question during the Q&A, please you know, use your raise hand icon. And of course, once you are called upon, please be sure that you unmute to ask that question. Uh, but our last panel of alumni is actually going to be a panel consisting of students who are in attendance at our current campus, Rancho Viejo. Um, and the moderator for this panel is going to be Dr. Laura Evans, who is the uh, founding director of the Research Center for Contemporary Native Art. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Laura. OCO, Daguadoa Hia, Laura Evans. Hello, I'm Dr. Laura Evans. I'm Cherokee. I'm art history faculty in the museum studies department, as well as the director of the new research center for contemporary native arts here at IAIA. And I am honored to be here today with a selection of um, very willing alumni who are speaking about their time here on the Rancho Viejo campus. And I'll start off with introducing them. Uh, we have people joining us via Zoom, including Mylan Tutusis, who is Nahuapiat Plains Cree Nakota from Poundmaker Cree Nation, located in the Treaty 6 territory. Upon completing his Indigenous Liberal Studies degree at IAI, he completed his Master's of Arts in Indigenous Governance at the University of Victoria in British Columbia in 2013. He is currently a doctoral candidate in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Saskatchewan, working part-time in his local area as a guidance counselor at a local reserve school, and positions much of his work within the context of the Prairie region and his traditional territory. Also joining us via Zoom is Tacey Atsiti Diné. She was born in Logan, Utah, grew up in Kirtland, New Mexico, and is currently from Cove, Arizona. She holds bachelor's degrees from Brigham Young University and the Institute of American Indian Arts. And her second BFA from IAI is in creative writing. Atsidi continued on to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and earned her MFA in creative writing and poetry. She's a PhD student in creative writing at Florida State University in Tallahassee, where she lives with her husband, Bruce Gonzalez, of Venezuela and Peru. Atsidi is a recipient of the Truman Capote Creative Writing Fellowship, the Corison Browning Poetry Prize, Morning Star Creative Writing Award, and the Philip Frund Prize. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Poetry Epoch, Kenyan Review Online, Prairie Schooner, excuse me, Prairie Schooner, and more. Also joining via Zoom is Mary Deliri, Anishinaabe Kwe from Deshkanzibing, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. She attended IAIA from 2005 to 2010 and received a BFA in Museum Studies. Since then, she earned her MA in Tribal Government from the University of Minnesota Duluth and is currently a PhD candidate in Native American Art History at University of Oklahoma. Before attending OU, she was visiting faculty at the Institute of American Indian Arts and served as coordinator of the Balzer Contemporary Edge Gallery, curating over a dozen shows for students, faculty, and staff. Her research focuses on Anishinaabe arts of the Great Lakes region and recovering material and visual culture that originates from Deshkanzibing. Mary maintains ties to her home, First Nation, as an elected member of Deshkanzibing Kino Magamik Board of Education and is committed to supporting Native arts. She is currently in Ontario, Canada, with the support of a Social Sciences Research Center Dissertation Completion Fellowship to conduct museum and archival research. She lives in Norman, Oklahoma, with her life partner, Blue, and sons, Aiden and Loja. And Cara Romero here, in person with us. 
sorry, I have so many pages. Kara is a contemporary fine art photographer, an enrolled citizen of the Chemehuevi Indian tribe. Romero was raised between contrasting settings, the rural Chemehuevi Reservation in Mojave Desert, California, and the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Kara Romero attended IAI and University of Houston. Uh, since 1998, Romero's expanses of have been informed by formal training in film, digital, fine art, and commercial photography. Maintaining a studio in Santa Fe, Romero regularly participates in Native American art fairs and panel discussions, and was featured in PBS's Craft in America in 2019. Her award-winning work is included in many public and private collections internationally. Married with three children, she travels between Santa Fe and the Chemehuevi Valley Indian Reservation, where she maintains close ties to her tribal community and ancestral homelands. Um, I'm also going to add that the first public showing of a 27-minute 20 documentary film produced by II Research Center for Contemporary Native Arts will be airing as part of the Santa Fe International Film Festival this Sunday. Um, it's both good news and bad news. The showing is already completely sold out. So now on to the topic um, for this panel. So the, the campus where we are right now, where we are broadcasting from, um, is, is a place that I moved to in two, the year 2000 to this permanent 140-acre campus and simultaneously expanded the academic programs to include baccalaureate degrees, introducing a BFA in creative writing, studio arts, and new media arts, as well as a BA in museum studies and indigenous liberal studies. Um, that one was added in 2006. This new campus made room for several state-of-the-art buildings, such as a library, an academic and administrative center, a resident center, family housing, a student life center, and a cultural learning center. So all new things, very different from previous facilities at uh, the College of Santa Fe and before that, the Santa Fe Indian School. And then again, in 2010, I added another 60,000 square feet of building space um, with the uh, Center for Lifelong Education, which is where we're broadcasting from right now, um, the Barbara and Robert L. Science and Technology Building, and the Allen Hauser Hauser's Sculpture and Foundry Building. All right, so I'm going to, let's do a, can we, we have our speakers also on Zoom? Great. So I'm going to start off with our, our first question, which is pretty general. Have you thinking about when you first got to this campus? Um, I'll ask you, what is your fondest memory of your time here on this campus? Maybe somebody from Zoom wants to chime in first. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Ani, everyone. Bonjour. So, for going to school, Kray, there's no cause. They should see things and don't jabar and get go down when it's not big way. And now, Shagan, she knows me and Mary. So, I just wanted to oh, interview myself, or not interview myself, uh, introduce myself um, in the language. And I think, you know, thinking of back on my fondest memories, there's a couple. And there, there is somebody that I, I think of when I first got to the Institute of American Indian Arts um, as a student in 2005 in that class. And I'm not too sure if Tasty and Mylan, I can't remember if we started at the same time, um, but I remember meeting Diani. And she was there first and she had a little one, I had a little one. Uh, so we were able to kind of, you know, connect that way. Um, and uh, she became a really great friend uh, throughout uh, my time at IAI. But I think um, one of the, the, the fondest memories that has the greatest impact on my time now is working in the gallery and interning at Mokno. Um, and those places, uh, both of them created a sense of purpose for me, which was what I needed as somebody who was very shy and very insecure. Um, and they allowed me to get hands-on experience 
amongst peers and professionals. So it was really this meeting place that that allowed me uh, to go and and um, I had my work study there. Um, so the gallery and and Mokna were kind of some key places for me um, on campus. And I think um, when I started work study um, on at the gallery is when I gained a really great mentor and that was Jesse Riker Crawford. So that was kind of, um, you know, uh, that relationship, she, she became a mentor and then a really good friend, uh, saw a lot of things in myself that I didn't see um, and just really supported me um, so much. And I feel like I, you know, she is one of the reasons why I am where I am. Good. Yeah, um, so I'm really happy to see, you know, Mylan and, and Mary here. We, we did, I think, start all around the same time and um, glad to see Kara as well. I, Kara and I have never met, but she's the artist for my book cover um, for my first book of poetry. So I'm excited to see her here tonight, too. Um, when I was thinking back about my fondest memories, it, it kind of, it was, it was random, but not random. Like, I... I remembered one of my fondest memories was every Saturday I would go and do laundry on campus. I was an off-campus student. I just lived like three minutes away there in Rancho Viejo. Um, but I would go and do laundry and Ken Taylor was always there at like 5.36 in the morning. And he had, he was also a creative writing student. He's Kiowa, if I remember right. Um, he was an older gentleman, cowboy, uh, just, gosh, he was just, he was so great. But he was always there early and he had a regimen on um, Saturdays and every Saturday I would see him and every Saturday he would tell me his same regimen. He was there cleaning the bird baths and he was there bringing them some food and he might've been doing his laundry too, but then he would go over to IHOP and he would you know, flirt with the, the waitresses. And every now and then I would go and join him for breakfast afterward. But um, I just remember the sunrises and I remember how calm and peaceful it was. And I remember um, just you know, those, those really wonderful moments where I was able to get to know the students and get to know people like Ken and just kind of see them, you know, nobody knew that Ken cleaned out the bird baths and, and that he bought, you know, put them clean water and gave them food and, you know, nobody knew that, but, you know, who else was going to be up at 530 in the morning, but um, anyway, that was one of my fondest memories. Um, another memory that I really enjoyed was, so I, like I said, I lived maybe like a quarter mile away and um, I love singing. I sing Navajo songs, I sing powwow, I sing other uh, tribal songs, you know, and um, I remember sometimes it's very, it was very quiet in my home and sometimes I would hear singing and I was like, oh, kid singing. <laughs> and it wasn't like regular, you know, that he would sing. And so I would run out, hop in my truck and then like drive over real quick and find Kit. And then I would just um, go and sing with him. And I just, you know, memories like that were, we, it was like we, it was like we were called, right? We were, and it's metaphor in terms of like, I felt called to IA. It was always a place that I had wanted to go and I just had a really wonderful time there. That's cool. a beautiful story. Yeah, I, I'd love to chime in on some of the fondest memories at uh, the Rancho Viejo campus. Um, really what comes up for me in general was, was simply the creative environment and talking to other alumni who are in academia, uh, like me being a doctoral candidate now, um, the unique creative environment that exists at IAI um, is next to none. Like I haven't really experienced uh, academic environment where there's so many creatives as there are at IAI. 
actively discussing, actively working. Um, I remember evening times, you know, walking over to the studio to visit and then back to the library to study. And that creative energy was really unique. And I feel like it's something I really haven't had since then. Um, so that general atmosphere of all these creatives coming together in terms of writing, art, and, you know, even the Indigenous Liberal Studies program, um, it was a really unique experience. And, um, you know, some of the other fondest memories, too, was, was we got to observe the construction of some of the new buildings early on, like the new dorms and, and things like that, and uh, the transition to uh, the new cafeteria. I was there a few years ago before the pandemic, and I remember students complaining about the food. <laughs> and I had to laugh because they don't remember the food prior to, to the new cafeteria. Um, but, you know, those epic transitions that we had as, uh, as undergraduate students there and observing the development of that campus under Dr. Martin's uh, governance and leadership, it was, it was a really cool experience to observe that transition take place. Um, and also the library. I, I miss IAI library. I know Mary highlighted her affiliation with the studio and the museum spaces, but for me as a scholar, um, the uh, library there was next to none, in my opinion, and kind of dating myself now. I'm at that age where I could say that, but I even remember you could order DVDs through the library <laughs> and they would get them for you like a week later. And uh, that was unique, like being able to order your resources and, you know, having that personal relationship with the librarians in terms of what you're studying and, and how your studies are going. That, that was an amazing environment. So that creative energy, that supportive energy is something that that I remember most standing out at, as my experience down there as an undergraduate. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Kara Romero, and I arrived here in December of 2000 and started in the spring semester of 2001. And it was my first time attending a tribal school, tribal college, and I remember arriving on campus for registration, and they, you know, had the powwow drum out. Um, and we could hear it from the parking lot. And it was just a profound moment that, you know, it felt like uh, I was in the right place, you know, and I'm sure a lot of us arrived here and met lifelong friends. Um, some of my favorite memories, you know, when I was here before I knew um, some of the other profound moments where I loved Steve Fadden's native art history class. You know, we used to watch slides of historic and contemporary artists on the old uh, carousel slides. And he was so animated and such a fantastic storyteller. But it was really the you know, first time we got to you know, formally study Native artists and see ourselves and see the history that had been made um, at this school and across Native America, um, where I hadn't really ever seen that before. Um, you know, Mateo Romero, my now brother, was my drawing instructor, and I remember, you know, sitting down in class and getting comfortable and meeting the only other California Indian girl that was here at IAIA, so I sat next to drawing, next to Jamie Okuma. Um, I, you know, took every opportunity that I had, you know, we had a lot of uh, visiting artists that had, um, you know, legacy and a big impact on us. I had a ghost print from Billy War Soldier Sosa from the printmaking studio that I used to manage. Um, Lee Marmon came and signed posters for us at school. You know, all of these, I think, you know, beautiful memories together um, really uh, sit at a time in my heart. That's one of the best times of my life. So. Mm. Wonderful. So the, the next question is, uh, what was your greatest challenge as a student in your time at IAI on the Rancho Viejo campus? Do you want me to go? Sure. Okay. Um, I lived off campus, um, but I do remember that, you know, transportation back then was a, a big deal for students getting back and forth um, from, you know, what was a somewhat isolated campus back then between here and, and downtown. So uh, always looking for ways um, to get into the city and integrate and see the galleries and see the museums um, was a challenge for students. Uh, and, you know, for me, um, I at the time desperately needed drug and alcohol counseling. 
Um, and so that is just something that I hope that the institute and the faculty and all the student and staff continue to advocate because a lot of us come from um, you know, intergenerational trauma and backgrounds where that's just an incredibly important part of our healing journey. And uh, I was able um, to, uh, you know, cross that threshold and heal, but while I was here at the Institute, um, it was difficult and I needed help. Cool. Um, I'll go next. Um, so, some of my greatest challenges um, involved being a young mom, um, a young single mom. Um, and when I started II in 2005, my son Aiden, who's behind me, my mom painted this, um, he was uh, less than a year old. So um, I don't think at the time there was family housing, um, but that came a little bit later, which really helped um, me in the, the later part of my time there. Um, so yeah, being a, a, a young a young mom and securing childcare, I remember always having to, you know, get state support, do the runaround before every academic year to make sure that he, you know, could get in daycare. Um, and I was like, why, why was that so hard? Because uh, and I was like, well, oh yeah, I had to leave every summer because I couldn't, I couldn't afford to stay in Santa Fe. I couldn't afford to live in Santa Fe on student wages, um, and I couldn't uh, afford to, to pay for daycare. So I had to leave. So I had to come home uh, for the summers. And I, I remember, you know, Santa Fe Community College daycare was like the best, you know, and it was close at the time. And it got to the point where the director, you know, started, you know, what we I had to have to reapply. Um, I think was debating on it, not letting me come back. I'd have to enroll in classes over there to keep the spot type of thing. So it was just a lot of extra obstacles to, to jump through. Um, on top of that, being, you know, First Nations from Canada, um, not being able to access uh, Indigenous health or Indian health services, um, healthcare was a big barrier for me, um, being a young woman um, and not really, I guess, having the resources to to get, you know, quality health care during that time. Um, so I think those were the, the two greatest challenges that I faced and was constantly worried about. Um, yeah, and, and I guess housing could be thrown in on top of that um, when you want to bring your children. And um, there, were, there were times where I had to uh, leave my son home with my mom so that I could come get established. But it was always a always a cycle and things to jump through. So, good. Um, yeah. So I think for me, I'm I. I've always been pretty social. I've always really enjoyed getting to know people and. Um, and so that's, that was, you know, I was, I was a writing tutor at the CLE. I was a student ambassador one year. I was part of the Red Woman Society drum group. I was, you know, singing with Kit and them informally. I was attending talking circle and reading poetry. I was, I was doing a lot of like social things. And I had just come from Taiwan. I was living in Taiwan and teaching English there for a year. And, um, I remembered I, I received some little handwritten notes from one of my coworkers back in Taiwan of my students who had all, you know, wrote notes saying, oh, teacher Tacy, we miss you and, um, and all this stuff. I remember I was walking from the circle. I don't, I can't remember what you call it. Kenny, oh, um, from like the center circle part of campus towards the cafeteria back then. And, um, and I remember just bawling and I was like, what was I was like, I need to go back to Taiwan or yeah, I can't remember what my exact thought was that I, but I think essentially what I'm trying to say is that I was lonely. And um, 
I was lonely for a number of reasons. I was a little bit older than a lot of my peers. Um, I didn't come straight from high school. I had already had a um, degree from Brigham Young University. I had already lived and taught abroad. Um, and also, I'm, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and so I, I don't drink, and I don't smoke, and I don't party, and any of that, and so that kind of set me apart from a lot of the students. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I ran around with a lot of the non-traditional students like Ken Taylor at five in the morning, right? Um, or, you know, other students who, who weren't, um, you know, living that lifestyle. And, and so I think that for me, like, in, and even, um, even at, at my, let's see, even at my, um, even at my church there in Santa Fe, you know, I was one of the only Native American um, members of the church. And so that, that was hard in a way. And so I, yeah, so I think that Santa Fe, I, 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 I love my experience there, but it was also one of the loneliest times in my life. Um, but I, I appreciate, still appreciate, and I appreciated all the friendships and and everything that I did receive there because it really helped. They really helped. The community was um, a big part of my life and, and still is a big part of my life. Yeah, and, and I could really relate to that because as, as an undergraduate and also similar to Mary coming down from Canada, um, I didn't go that far to, to fail, so to speak. So like, I really dedicated myself to the studies, but at the same time, the, the lonesome, lonesomeness and the isolation of, of, you know, being away from home, being far from home was something that really came up a lot. And I remember there was a few weekends, my first year where I only went down with like a bag of clothes and, and like a box of stuff. And I remember secretly loading up my car thinking, well, it's Friday, classes are over. I'm just gonna go home. Like, this is it, I'm packing it in, not gonna work out. And I remember calling my late dad and uh, him saying, well, just wait till Monday, do one more week of classes. And if you still wanna come home, I'll, I'll fly down and we'll, we'll drive up together. And I think he had to do that like twice, three times, where it was just like it wasn't working out for me. But I, I pushed through, and I'm really glad I did. But but I, I being a tribal college, and you know, young students leaving their communities and their home to to be in that space, um, that lonesomeness does creep in, and it is a little bit of a culture shock and learning curve on on how you're going to push through that. And and for me, it never really got easier. You you simply learned how to to cope with it and and to keep yourself busy. Um, and that was that was some really challenging times there too. And and also I think another challenging dynamic that unfolded for me there too was um, was being able to uh, find the the resources in the community that that you could you know build off of and that could provide those support system support systems. And I know activities was doing their thing, but I mean you know finding access to a, a more extended community um, was a bit of a challenge. And, uh, and I think that's probably why our generation, me and Mary and like all our, like that generation and, and Tacey, we, we knew each other fairly well because we would be talking after class. Like some of my fondest memories are leaving class in the evening and everybody standing outside the library, probably for like 30 or 40 minutes, like debriefing the day and the week. And then sometimes going to eat, right? Atomic Cafe downtown was usually the one open or going to burrito spot when like, I remember burritos being $5 when I was down there. <laughs> so you could basically live off that. <laughs> um, so everyone would drive through and um, yeah. And so that, that after hour support, I think was something that, that we had to fill, fill a, a gap uh, for. And, and, and we did, we were successful at that. And a lot of us are still friends and communicate as a result of having to hold each other up when, when things were challenging in terms of lonesomeness and missing home. You. So were there particular things that helped you through these challenging times? The loneliness, the counseling, the... Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess for some of my challenges, um, you know, there was uh, Dr. J and, you know, Diane Reyna really helped. Um, they were, you know, just profound individuals here on faculty, a tremendous amount of caring about the success of the students, and then just 
you know, leaning into the art. I mean, art has always been so many of our best friends and, um, you know, provides solace and, you know, provides, you know, healthy habits and things to do. Uh, I was a work study and I managed both the um, printmaking studio and the photography studio. And um, way back then, <laughs> they used to stay open 24 hours. So we were allowed to, um, you know, stay up and in, in those studios kind of all night long. And sometimes there were just a few of us, but, uh, you know, there's still, you know, some of my best friends to this day are the people that were in those studios um, 24 hours, you know, all night long. And um, that was how I got through, was art. It's still how I get through. Did anyone else on Zoom want to chime in on that? Or should we go to the next question? OK. Um, so what was life like on the Rancho Viejo campus? You know, like on a kind of like, think about like daily patterns and, and the, the, the norms maybe that you experienced that maybe wouldn't be totally obvious to people um, who weren't here at the time. Mary, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, I, so I, you know, as I'm hearing the other panelists talk, I, I now remember seeing Mylon always in the library. Um, we would go in there and he'd be at those little round tables in the middle of the library and, you know, have a chance to, to hang out or catch up and enjoying the time after class to be able to talk things out. They were just really, you know, good little groups, pockets of, of people and friends, you know, and and I'm guessing a lot of people made some really good lifelong friends there, um, because I did. And um, so uh, I guess life on campus, I, it was fun. It could be hectic and busy, um, you know, <laughs> went to some great parties, <laughs> made some great friends that I keep in touch with today. Uh, campus, of course, is a lot smaller. Um, you know, we were there before the new dorms were built, so everybody was in, you know, the, I don't know if they're family dorms now, but um, uh, they were, everybody were, was in those dorms. Of course, I, at the time, I didn't live on campus either. Um, and uh, because I had work study in the gallery, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in the gallery uh, and in the library. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of what, what campus life was like for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I don't smoke anymore, but I was a smoker and I would go uh, sit and, you know, there would always be a group of somebody out there and that's when you would just go visit. You know, there was always somebody to visit with, I felt like, when you needed it. And there were definitely times um, where, you know, I debated quitting, you know, and going home. There were family things going on back home um, and it was just a lot to, to manage emotionally uh, and mentally being so far away from home. So community, community support, community, um, ways to connect with and build community were just some really important things that kind of helped me stay grounded uh, being so far from home. Do you want to go? Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, when I was here, you know, the Balzer Gallery was our library, <laughs> so it was much smaller. Um, being in that first class, it was really just the building with the studios, and um, that's really where we spent a lot of our time. We traded a lot of skills. Uh, you know, we all came from all over the United States, so, you know, the kids from the Southwest, if you were in jewelry class, were, you know, giving tutorials, they had, like, advanced backgrounds and silversmithing, and um, we spent a lot of time, you know, learning from each other uh, in our different practices. In the photo studio, you know, we were out here on campus, we were learning to use our cameras, we were photographing each other. Um, I still go through those old negatives and just, you know, reminisce on the friendships and, um, you know, the foolishness and, and it was, you know, really just a really safe place to learn and to be yourself. Um, 
around other people from similar backgrounds. And I think, you know, while we all were away from our communities and far away, and there was some of those feelings of isolation, I think there's kind of like also a balance to it um, that, you know, we all um, wanted to be here, you know, and we all wanted to be learning art. And so we really leaned into each other and our friendships and, um, you know, I got to learn, you know, about my friends that were from, you know, deep in Athabasca, Alaska, and watch them go off and, you know, be successful at the San Francisco Art Institute. And I got to travel with my friends to Oklahoma on the II rec van and see my first, you know, black leggings powwow and Memorial Day powwow with, um, you know, my friends that were here from Oklahoma, all kinds of experiences um, to meet people from other tribal communities that were, you know, so different from mine, but, you know, also so similar, right? We had all experienced, um, you know, loss. We all had, we were, you know, rich with, you know, cultural history and were excited to, you know, learn about each other and, and where each other were from. And um, that was kind of day to day here. You know, there was, a, at the time, only um, associate's degrees is what we were graduating with. Um, so I guess that's, you know, one thing that I wish that they had, uh, we had all gotten to stay together a little bit longer, that class of 2002 and 2003. Um, we had to go off to other places to seek, um, you know, bachelor's degrees. Um, but yeah, the friendships here, um, the day to day. And, you know, I also provide space to, you know, make changes. Our um, cafeteria was terrible, you know, starting out. And um, it was really the student and the associated student government, you know, that made that change, that advocated for healthy food. Um, and I come to the, you know, cafeteria now and I'm just amazed at what the students have. Um, I is constantly making improvements, you know, creating and finding accessibility to technology and tools um, that they didn't have before. So I don't know. It's just uh, it's a really good place to be, and I've always felt it kind of uh, gives back as much as you give to I. Yeah, I I definitely echo that. Um, Life on life on campus on IAI campus it was gorgeous. It was still. It was peaceful, um, and it, it was just quiet. That's I mean that's that was my experience. And when I think back on it, it's um, I remember and and I feel like even with that like quiet, that silence, it, it was filled, like it, it was this kind of very visceral feeling of um, fullness in terms of creativity. I, I remember, you know, when midterms came around or when finals came around, um, I get to walk down the main, you know, I don't even know, I'm seriously, like don't remember the names of buildings, the main building that there was the administrative offices and you know the art studio area and they would have all of the art on the wall on the left and right and i remember like looking at the art just being so impressed and like oh my goodness that's like joe schmo's work you know and he's just like this boy in you know jeans and a t-shirt with his you know um, headphones and <laughs> just like wow i mean you you look at the creator and you look at the created and you're just so blown away and and so that so i i remember thinking like even as quiet as the campus always was for me it, it was filled with such vibrancy and, and creativity and it, it was a beautiful place and it still is i feel like every time i go back i'm just i love that it feels like the earth um and and that's what I that's one of the things that I really loved about it and and like Kara was talking about was community. Um, you know when I when I left to Cornell, um, I had um, well the campus we had you know um, some some deaths that had happened and you know the year before I left at IA we had. Um, um, student, some students who had passed away on campus. And I just, I remember 
the difference in how a Western and Indigenous institutions handle those deaths. And, and I missed, I, I, for that reason, I missed the community. I missed the fire. I missed grieving together. And I missed um, just the love and support that, you know, um, everyone was able to offer each other. But also, you know, those spaces were given to us and those times were given to us, we know by our administrators and people who understood the way that, um, you know, indigenous ideologies, they, they understand that. And so I was really grateful for that in my time there. Yeah, um, life on, on campus, it was, it was really unique. Like there's nothing like um, a Santa Fe sunset, to be honest, even though up here in Saskatchewan, we have beautiful sunsets. But I remember leaving, you know, in the eve afternoon, walking to the old dorms or walking to the cafeteria and, and just being mesmerized by this epic sunset or seeing the storms roll in. Again, that was that was the vibe at IAI on the Rancho Viejo campus was, you know, observing the mountain and, and seeing the weather roll in. It, it really did impact you psychologically, um, you know, building off the environment and the space there. And it, it was a really cool space to be in. And, you know, life on campus, I did live in the dorms and then transitioned to off campus. Um, it's, it's, it's unique, like the experiences there are super unique, um, lifelong friendships. Um, you know, even even friendship breakdowns, which are which were normal too. Um, but at the same time, you, you're still a part of a community, and uh, fostering that and maintaining that all through undergrad was was something that you weren't conscious of doing until you left. Like you don't really realize the environment and the friendships and the community you had until it's absent in your life, and then the hindsight clarity kicks in, and you're like, oh wow, that was cool. That was a unique experience. And I remember just telling my partner like a few weeks ago that I remember the last time we all went out to eat together, me and my friend group, like a week before grad. And I and I remember that being specifically, you know, last time we were we were in that undergraduate paradigm and energy. And then after that it completely changed. Um, so yeah, it's it's a blessing in, in that way um, to to be on that campus and to be in that creative energy and 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 to live in that is is even a, a more of a bonus because even you know the studio spaces the creative energy, I remember you know just chilling in my dorm and someone knocking on my door saying they have a final project due uh, on on Monday and it was Saturday night and they needed to film a short movie, and you know that had to be like <laughs> that was fun. I mean, as a as an instructor now I'm kind of like whoa we were doing. Some some pretty last minute stuff but uh, <laughs> but you know experiences like that they're they're really unique and and I never really had anything like that in any other academic institution I've, I've been to since then so yeah so the, this last question um, what do you want current IAI students to know about what it is like to be an IAI alum We're family. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how I feel, honestly. I, I do feel like that. I feel like um, I just, I have so much pride when other IA alumni succeed in, in everything that they're doing. I, I really do. Um, because I know that they're part of my family, you know? And um, yeah, I just, excited for them to join. I mean, they're there, right? They're having their um, their experiences now and they're making their memories. And um, and I think that now, you know, as, as current IA alumni, it's, it's a wonderful thing, I feel like, to be part of this community and to know that, you know, if, if any of us need help in whatever, you know, project we're working on or whatever things that we, we might need, in our lives that we can reach out to each other because we're, well, I am, right? We're all here to still support each other because we were all supported at once by other people here, um, there at IAIA. And so it's it's a lot of um, wonderful, like blessings that come, but there's also responsibility. And, uh, but it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing for me. I just, we're family, yes.
I uh, echo what Tacey was saying, that um, you really become not only part of a family, but a community, a legacy of um, intergenerational you know, caretaking of each other. And it provides accessibility to the people that came before you and you know so many of us um, you know stay in communication and we look back at our years at IAI and you know my husband Diego and I you know often say I changed our life you know um, for the for the best you know it really was a turning point to end up here so the time that you're here um, is important you know what you're doing whether you're away from your home community for a little while or you know gathering um, intertribally for the first time coming from a city um, those are all really important things you know the idea sharing is important um, finding your voice you know getting really solid in your native identity all of those things um, are not only healing for you as an individual but healing for you know our small communities and our large communities so um, that's what I would like, you know, young students to know is that uh, it will forever change your life to be here for the better. Um, I, I agree with, with all of that, what Kara and Tacey were saying about family and, and community and what I, I means and you know, I, I has such an amazing and rich history and has meant so much for Native people, um, I guess I want to say all over the world. And, you know, through that had meant so much for Native communities and, of course, Native art. Um, and that they, the students are now part of that history and it's something to be a proud of. And um, it links you to a whole network of people that that you can identify with um, and possibly work with in the future and then you all share we all share kind of a similar experience you know at some point in time um, so i am very proud you know to be an, an alumni of iai um, this little guy back here is going to be graduating high school soon and we are encouraging him to go you know to consider going to iai so um, i guess i should say that you know when i first came to iai um, I was, you know, I was brought down to Santa Fe uh, at, uh, I resisted all the way, uh, but I came with my mom because she wanted to go to IAI. Mm -hmm. So she started at IAI and then I guess when, you know, me and my younger sister Eva came of college age, we both went to IAI. We've all graduated. Um, mom went and got her master's. My younger sister has her doctor of social sciences. I'm completing a doctorate. And my younger brother came to IAI for, for a little bit of time, but he found his, his work in, um, in learning Anishinaabe one. So learning the language and teaching our language here in our community. So, you know, I think I, if I look back and think about this, I guess I, I, guess I can say success now, but I, I'm still on this journey uh, of, 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 you know, education and, and lifelong learning. And I don't know if I'll ever be done, but, I don't know if I could have got that anywhere else, you know, or would have got the support I needed. Um, it was definitely hard sometimes, um, but I don't think I would have succeeded um, in a larger institution or a non-native, you know, uh, educational institution. Um, so I think, uh, you know, with that, uh, the 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 time is what you make it. Um, so you know, use it to foster good relations and relationships with your mentors and your peers um, as a student because, um, yeah, you'll, those will continue as you go forward. Yeah, um, I would have to say that one thing you have to keep in mind with IAI as an undergrad is that transition sneaks up on you. Like you don't realize it's gone until it's gone and uh, that you've moved on in life and you're, you're going to have a new set of goals. Um, people are going to, in my experience, you know, people are kind of shocked to know that, you know, there's a tribal college in Santa Fe still. 
um, and that you're going to be an alumni of that place. So when you are an alumni, you know, be willing to to flex a little bit and let people know that you do have an amazing degree from an amazing universe or college, uh, an amazing institute, um, because uh, we sort of uh, show up and surprise people that, you know, we're tribal college alumni. And, and unfortunately, in this day and age, that's that in some cases, that's kind of coming in as an underdog. Um, sometimes, you know, I've been in situations where it's not taken as seriously. Uh, and then, you know, having to basically, you know, like I said, flex and, and assert what you know and what your experience is, because obviously the education there is quality. I mean, you, you heard Mary refer to um, her sister, Eva, Dr. Eva Jewell, who's now, you know, teaching in Toronto, me finishing my, my uh, program and Mary also. I mean, we're capable scholars and we're capable intellectuals and having to stand in the truth of that and represent your uh, Institute of American Indian Arts and the work you've done there. Um, that's coming down the pipeline. So cherish that experience and build those friendships and, and take what you learn and be willing to unleash it onto the world. Thank you. And that's perfect timing. Um, we're now ready to take questions from the audience and from on Zoom. Anyone have a question? Yes. How many master's degree programs do you have? How many master's degree programs do we have? I see Felipe is gesturing back there. Yes, there are three. Um, the first program was the MFA in creative writing. Um, and, and all of the master's degree programs are low residency models. Um, after the uh, MFA in creative writing, we began an MFA in studio art. And just recently, we had our first cohort begin the MFA in cultural administration. Cool. <laughs> Another question? Yes. The, the comment is about the uh, sense of family that keeps coming up in each of the sessions today, the, the family, the relationships. Um, and uh, the question is out to uh, the members of the audience is, do you feel that same way? I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> So I wonder what, what we are doing right. And maybe that's a good question for, for uh, our panelists. Well, like how, how did that happen? Or, or did you just bring it with you? I think one of the things that I've heard, um, you know, through other college administrations is they have a really hard time retaining Native students. And I think that um, at least when I was here at the Institute, you know, so much of our background and how diverse and, you know, we're coming from, you know, all kinds of different places. Uh, the administration here really kind of already understands that, you know, and so um, I think that it's a little bit like, um, like really careful steps in creating a safe environment for students that are, you know, coming straight from the reservation and trying to create support services or, you know, there's an understanding that some, you know, people are urban natives and have never been to their homelands and that sort of thing. And um, all of that is, I think, you know, just psychologically helpful for the young students that arrive here and, um, you know, creates a sense of security and, and that sense of family that you're, you know, you keep hearing about. and. I think that it's a um, really important thing, you know, at the Institute and, you know, at Haskell and all the other tribal colleges is, you know, many of us find love here. You know, many of us have children um, beyond uh, the Institute and, you know, we, meet, we need more Native babies, you know? And um, that is another beautiful thing. I mean, we really do create bigger family, you know, both of, you know, all three of my children wouldn't have been born without this place.
I, I can chime in because um, I, I I see that at other universities are, you know, bigger universities with higher student populations that that um, indigenous people are still a minority, um, that we have to carve out spaces at these bigger institutions. And sometimes those spaces still aren't safe spaces. Like, for example, you know, University of Saskatchewan has soup and bannock once a week for the indigenous students, but the majority of people who show up aren't necessarily indigenous utilizing the services. So you kind of have to carve out and find those community spaces. Whereas at Institute of American Indian Arts, you're, you're not the minority, that you're, you're predominantly the majority. And it, it's kind of this weird, cool flip where, you know, a, a non-person of color or a non-indigenous person would be the minority in an indigenous studies class or be in a minority in, in you know, all the other classes. So it's, it's an autonomous space in that way that I think, you know, we have to maintain and foster that is that, that we're coming in with a lived and shared experience of being indigenous people um, going through colonization, going through colonialism and learning how to navigate forward. And so those personal narratives sync up really good with your friends and colleagues that you, you make there, it, it relatable. Um, and also the, the journey to Santa Fe is completely relatable because people are coming there wanting to succeed. It's, it's out of our natural uh, homelands and environments. So like the efforts there to, to want to push through. Um, and again, you know, that unique recipe of uh, Indigenous student population, uh, community, unique small campus and a, and a new place really does foster that, that unique identity that is IAIA. Um, but yeah, that family, I mean, I haven't really experienced that in any other program I observed or, or I have been in since then. So it's, it's something really unique, yeah. So Erica Lord, who is in the audience, and she was on the previous panel, just remarked that uh, one of the things that makes IAI unique is that she has had um, three generations of students who are attending IAI. So like grandparents, parents, and then their children um, going through IAI. So it's a very different kind of legacy relationship than in a, a traditional, say, an Ivy League institution. Um, so it's... I, a unique uh, aspect of IAIA. Um, are there any, uh, uh, let's have another question. There's plenty of time. Is there any questions from Zoom, from the Zoom audience? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the question is about the Balzer Contemporary Edge Gallery, which Mary Deliri was here at a crucial moment in its development. Um, so Mary, can you tell us more about how that happened and what the impact has been? Um, I guess how, how it evolved or how it came to be. <laughs> it's emergence in, into the library space. <laughs> Uh, geez, I think, you know, the, the, the space was reclaimed and maybe I think uh, it was a group of students, uh, pr probably Jesse remembers, uh, I think I might have heard the story. Um, and if I remember correctly, it was, uh, a, you know, students just went in and reclaimed the space, it didn't have any budget. Um, and eventually, over time, it, you know, it kind of came into being and uh, it didn't have any full time staff. So whoever was the chair of the museum studies department uh, had to take on the gallery and was in charge of, you know, setting up the shows. Um, and then I think by the time I had graduated in 2010, um, you know, uh, I think Jesse, of course, was the chair of museum studies, uh, got some funding and carved out a spot for, for a gallery coordinator. And, uh, you know, it was a, I mean, it was probably a third of the size of what it is now, um, because behind that was the conservation lab. And I think, you know, even as small as the space was, we, we managed to do some pretty incredible things 
been there. Some really great shows and I've, you know, met some, you know, a lot of the the artists who came through II and got to handle their work and um, take care of it, I guess. Um, I, um, I kind of lost my train of thought. I think I did that for about two years. Um, and then I, I left, took an opportunity somewhere else. Uh, and the gallery continued uh, to thrive. And I think when I left is when Felipe came on and they got some grant funding to transform the space. Um, and uh, uh, which, you know, doubled it in size and we were able to get, you know, uh, some, some false walls in there, got the floor redone. And I'm sure the space has transformed uh, since then. Um, and then when I came back in 2014, um, you know, it was another, uh, took another stab at uh, coordinating that space and curating that space. So um, it's changed a lot of hands and, and I know it's meant a lot to a lot of people who were in there working, painting walls. We painted so many, <laughs> we painted it so many times, hung up a lot of artwork, you know, we had good laughs, you know, and of course it wasn't without its conflict, but that's con that comes with relationships. But um, yeah, it just meant to a lot of people. And um, I, I haven't been back um, to campus since we left. Or maybe one time I went back um, and it was still, you know, a bustling gallery and doing wonderful things. Um, and it's only been getting better. I hope that answers the question. So before it was the Balzer Gallery, what was it? Were you, were you here then? Were you part of that? Well, I think it was... Uh, part of the library. It was the library. It was the Primitive Edge yeah. Gallery. Oh, it was a Primitive Edge Gallery. Some mm -hmm. students named it. Uh, but then before Primitive Edge, uh, that was before me. It was the library and the computer lab combined. So after the library was built, then that space was vacated and, yeah. and taken over. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, so you all uh, talked about how profound the experience was here. Can you remember from that experience a moment when you changed and what changed you as a kind of as someone who came here to learn and develop and become artistic or practitioner or academic? Do you have a, a moment of change that you specifically remember? So the question is, uh, do you have a particular moment of change that you can identify? Everyone spoke about um, how I changed you. Is there a particular moment that comes to mind that you would be willing to share? I think that what comes up um, for me and uh, was the senior show, which, you know, here again, it was just a two-year program. Um, but we did uh, put together a senior show, and then before the Balzer Gallery, we did that at Mokna downtown, the Museum of Contemporary Native Art. And we had a gallery um, as students to uh, create an exhibit down there, and the museum um, purchased my three silver gelatin prints that were um, in the show, and I could have just you know, died and gone to heaven at that point. Um, to have some pieces in uh, the museum forever was a moment that um, I felt changed. I think for me it was, um, I, I don't know if there were there was like one particular moment really I, I feel like it was a bunch of those little memories you know the ones that I had mentioned earlier and um, I remember once Ruben Chinana and I he was also a creative writer he you know we were hanging out after you know classes and the literary magazine um, had just come out from you know IAI and we'd all work on it and and we would um, read you know, a stanza or a line. And then the other person had to guess who the poet was because we all knew each other's work, right? Like how well did we know each other's work? We were like, oh, that's Lily. Oh, that's Kathy. Oh, that's Santee or, you know. And so the, those moments 
they all kind of um, just stacked upon one another. And I feel like, you know, since I am a poet and was part of that, you know, I, I just felt like this little, like, this little girl coming into like all these really wonderful poets, like, like, um, you know, Laylee and Orlando and Sherwin. And, and I was just there kind of in that last little, you know, moment before, you know, they, they got done. But for me, that was really wonderful because I got to see how much they admired Arthur Z. And, you know, I spoke recently at his, you know, um, his naming of the, the room there. Um, but I saw how much they admired him and I saw how much they looked up to him and I saw how much he admired us in return, right? He really lifted us up um, as writers and gave us the encouragement that we needed. He validized, validized, is that a word? <laughs> he gave us, he, I, why, help me with the word somebody. Validated. Thank you. <laughs> The poet does not know the word validated, yes. Um, <laughs> he validated our work and, um, and, and that was like the big difference right, right there. And just really, you know, community within the community, you know, is, is what I felt like with, with all of the, the poets there. And um, yeah, I can't even remember the question, but that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> We've got three minutes. If anybody else wants to talk about a particular moment that, that they felt the change happen. I got like two particular moments that I recognize in hindsight as, you know, an instructor now. Um, the first particular moment where you sort of have that specific moment of change is when you see the next incoming undergraduate show up and you realize that that was you one year before or two years before. And then, and then you kind of, you, you, you feel a bit more mature. And then the second moment of change is when you get to your 200, 300, 400 level courses and you're having those conversations with your instructors and you're realizing that you, you are making an improvement in terms of your, 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 your writing or your research or you know what, the reason why you're there. Um, and you know that that magic in terms of you know transitioning being recognized and affirmed came for me when when I was taking a, a course with Gerald Visner, and Gerald Visner, this you know amazing scholar and writer, was you know giving us feedback on our papers, and we're sitting in this really intimate space with him, and he was really validating the learning and the experience we were bringing into the room, and you know that that role as an instructor at IAI, those are very pivotal moments that I recognized that I haven't really experienced from other you know faculty that I've. Had had after I, I it's more so like you're you're attending the class it's more like a robotic routine that exists in mainstream institutions but at I, I it's really organic and there is a level of intimacy in those transitions as you develop similar to what, what Tacey was saying where where it, it becomes like recognizable you're picking up on the energy of change that's going on great thank you um, one last comment is that um, at 5 p.m. today, for those of you who are here in person, or if you're on Zoom and you're in Santa Fe and you can get here at 5 p.m., we have an artist in residence dinner. So you can go over to the academic building and you will be served dinner. This is free. Um, we welcome people from the community and from the local community to join us, meet our artists in residence after dinner, uh, tour their studios. Any last reminders I need to give here? Carly Fetterson, Melissa Shaganoff, and Lindley Logan are the artists in residence. Cool. And they're alums. <laughs> Great. So we have a break before our next session. Thank you, everyone. Can I see you? Thank you. Good to see you guys. Bye, Ma P. Good to see you guys too. Take care. Bye.
actually going to have a short video. So as you've probably seen uh, on the website, the program, um, this panel is going to be looking at the present and future. So of course, we spent the day looking into the far past, the near past, hearing those amazing stories from our alumni. And now we're going to start to set the stage for the next 60 years. So with that, if we can begin the video, and then uh, we will start with uh, Nena Martinez and Aya, Dean of Students. A place to embrace the past, enrich the present, and create the future. The Institute of American Indian Arts. IAIA offers an MFA in Creative Writing, BFAs in Cinematic Arts, Creative Writing, Indigenous Liberal Studies, Museum Studies, Performing Arts, and Studio Arts, and several certificate programs. Empower your creativity today. Visit www.iaia.edu. Okay, welcome. I, I'm Nena Martinez Anaya. I'm the Dean of Students, and I'm going to share a PowerPoint uh, presentation with you today regarding our student service programs. Okay, next slide, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, as we know, um, IAI was established in 1962 and we are currently sitting on our 140 acre campus. We're one of 37 tribal colleges and we're the only four year degree fine arts institution in the nation devoted to contemporary Native American arts and Alaska Native arts. We're also nationally credited by the Higher Learning Commission. Our mission, to empower creativity and leadership in Native arts and cultures through higher education, lifelong learning, and outreach. Our degrees and certificates. Um, we have associate and bachelor's degrees in cinematic arts and technology, creative writing, indigenous liberal studies, museum studies, performing arts, and studio arts. We have four certificate programs, business and entrepreneurship, broadcast journalism, museum studies, and Native American art history. The video didn't um, indicate so, but we have two new MFA programs in cultural administration, studio arts, and of course, creative writing. Okay. This fall semester, um, uh, our demographics are as follows. Our median age is 24. Our student to faculty ratio is nine to one. We have 312 undergrad students and 68 graduate students. Our total headcount um, as of probably mid-September mid was 846, and our full-time equivalent is 540. Our students represent 36 states and three foreign countries. Our top states are New Mexico, Arizona, California, Oklahoma, and Washington. Our students also represent 97 federally recognized tribes, and our top tribes are the Navajo Nation, Ogallala Sioux Tribe, and the Hickoria Apache Nation. Student life. Um, our campus facility, go ahead, the next slide. Campus facilities, so here um, I'm highlighting some of our uh, facilities. We have our state-of-the-art uh, studio uh, facilities. We have our sculpture foundry building, gym and weight room, digital dome, our residence hall, family housing, our garden to include our greenhouse, and we have a bee farm here on campus, our dance circle, our traditional hogan, our black box theater, Welcome Center, Student Success Center, Student Union Building, and our pantry. And our pantry serves our students 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. On, 
campus housing. Um, right across from us is our residence center. And um, we have 77 rooms. Um, and each of those rooms fits two students. So we have a capacity to house 174 students. Um, each room is furnished with um, a bed, closet, drawers, desk, and a private restroom. We have a communal kitchen space on each floor, laundry rooms, and we have a, a gender neutral wing, and of course, Wi-Fi and ethernet. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm Associated Student Government. The students at the Institute of American uh, Indian Arts are members of the Associated Student Government, ASG. The ASG is funded by the student government fee that all students pay each semester. The ASG was chartered to give students representation in the college community and offers a variety of services and opportunities for expression, leadership, and involvement. It represents the student in decision-making and is an important link between the student, faculty, and administration. The ASG president is also an ex officio member of the Board of Trustees. Clubs. So ASG also funds and sponsors our student-led clubs, and here is a list of some of the clubs this semester. Archery, beating, performing arts. We have a men's and women's basketball team, cheer team, uh, royal, stitching royalty club, skateboarding, hand games, a powwow, museum, and a competitive fitness club. Okay, Student Success Center. This uh, facility is in our library building, and um, we have a variety of student support services that I'm gonna chat about today, chat with you about today. Next slide. The Learning Lab. Our Learning Lab um, consists of five master degree level tutors. It's free, online and in person, seven days a week for our students. We have writing, math, writing and math specialists, and we also have workshops regarding time management, organizational skills, and study skills. Our mentorship program. Um, our mentorship program consists of staff, faculty, and alum, along with peer mentors. Students work with mentors to help them with their academic and personal goals. Students also receive a monetary stipend to participate. The goal is to create a professional and active relationship between the mentor and the mentee. And we want to fully support, wholly support the students, again, with their academic and their personal goals. Financial aid. We at this office is also part of the Student Success Center. Um, and we have several scholarship opportunities. Um, our institutional um, scholarship opportunities include the Tribal Scholarship, the IAIA Merit Scholarship, the IAIA Named Scholarships. We also work very closely with the American Indian College Fund, and we partner uh, regarding our scholarships um, through Full Circle. Um, which is a guaranteed scholarship for the, for the entire time the student is with IAI or other tribal colleges if they decide to transfer. And then new this semester is our Opportunity Scholarship. And this is um, through, uh, it's the New Mexico Opportunity Scholarship and it can pay for 100% of tuition and fees. And this semester um, we have 83 students on that Opportunity Scholarship, which really helps with um, tuition and fees. Um, the Lottery Scholarship is something we've been uh, participating in for the past several years, and, and this scholarship pays tuition after a successful semester um, in college, a 2.5 GPA, and completion of at least 12 college credits. This semester, um, we awarded a little over a million dollars in scholarships um, to our students, and that's for the academic year. That's for the fall and the spring semester, so we're really pleased um, with the awards. The American Indian College Fund um, allotted $192,000 in scholarship opportunity. Dual credit, so this program, um, 
uh, started here at II in 2009, we had 10 students. Um, and we worked with Walatoa Charter High School in Hemis Pueblo. And um, we offered a low tuition rate. Today, um, for the past several years, um, every New Mexico high school student has the opportunity to take dual credit classes. And we've really grown our program. Um, we work with over 20 high schools and districts, and we have, next slide please, we have, we are serving 420 students um, through dual credit classes. And what this allots is the opportunity for students to get a jump on, on college credit and to also learn about the programs that we have here at II. The credit they take duly will transfer in, or not transfer in, it's part of our degree programs here at II. internship opportunity. This program has really grown um, in the past several years as well. Our students right now are currently working um, through internships with the Jane Goodall Foundation, the Roots and Shoots, Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, the Museum of the American Indian, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, Disney Imagineering, and the Meow Wolf here in Santa Fe. We're also working uh, with future opportunities with Neiman Marcus Group, Nike, Jordan, and Converse, Meow Wolf in Denver and Las Vegas, Nevada, and also the Ralph Lauren Internship Program. Okay, our summer bridge, our freshman bridge program. This is a really nice opportunity for incoming freshmen. We offer three, a three-week program that allows our students to earn three college credits in the Indigenous Sustainability course. They get to move into the residence hall early they explore Santa Fe and local areas, and then they attend um, group activities um, here on campus with their IAI peers. Um, it's a free program, room and board, and uh, tuition is also free. The past few years, we've been offering our students a cash incentive as well, just to get them on board um, through, uh, through donations from the American Indian College Fund. Cultural, cultural programs. So um, coming out of pandemic, um, we uh, started our ceremonial council again so that we can um, assist students um, with traditional, um, with their traditional values. We have, uh, we host two annual powwows. We had one October 1st, Saturday, October 1st, and then we also have a powwow right after our graduation ceremonies. Here on campus, we have a sweat lodge, a traditional hogan, and uh, we have planning to, uh, we're planning for elder guest speakers to uh, perform ceremony and lectures here on campus this semester and spring semester. Okay, continuing ed. Um, this is another program, um, and this program is run by Lori Logan Brayshaw and Patty Armstrong, our continuing ed manager. And it's really an exciting opportunity um, for everyone to learn about IAI. Um, they offer um, continuing ed classes that are non-degree, um, but are for the professional. Um, and they're often low cost or free tuition. Um, some of the classes that they're offering this semester, uh, book promotion, your way, the essay, the lyric prose, self-publishing 101, the art of critiquing, and et cetera. Um, and, and this chart just goes to, sh goes to show um, the length of where we um, are expanding with continuing ed all over the world, actually. Okay, and that's it. Um, thank you for listening, and um, I believe we'll have questions. At the end. Yeah, at the end. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our beautiful campus. My name is Larry Maribal and I'm the Vice President of Operations here at IAIA. So I get to oversee finance, HR, IT facilities, and our auxiliary programs. Um, IAIA moved to its current and permanent home on this 140-acre campus site in 2000. Once the college relocated, the campus build-out began in earnest. Since that time, the college has added over 280,000 square feet of new facilities with the newest being the Lloyd Keevan U Welcome Center and our Performing Arts and Fitness Center. 
uh, one of a kind of its type anywhere in the state of New Mexico. In 2019, the college once again embarked on an update of its master plan. The purpose of this update would be to reflect and capture the many changes to the campus since 2010, while also establishing a comprehensive direction and vision for the campus into the next decade. The goal was to create an orderly yet flexible development for the future while respecting the planning and intent of the original master plan that was created. During this recent planning process, all existing buildings were plotted, site topography was surveyed, utilities were assessed, and a comprehensive solar master plan was developed for the entire campus. IAIA's strategic plan, at the time, Plan 2022, was at the forefront of the decision-making process throughout. After a series of meetings with campus stakeholders, a final draft of the campus master plan was approved by the Board of Trustees in May of 2020. And it included several key priorities. A 9,000 square foot addition to the academic building, which has since been completed and serves as phase one of our new research center addition to the campus. An ADA accessible pathway to our Hogan, providing pedestrian access and also spaces for outdoor learning and reflection. A campus loop road for better access and safety and the largest of these projects, a mixed-use facility that includes student housing as well as studios to replace the current family housing units. This will be a 16,000 square foot facility that will not only serve as living space, but will be a place where students can complete independent work without having to go to the academic building studios late at night. This project will begin soon, with design charrettes commencing in the coming months. In addition to constructing new spaces, the college is committed to its sustainability principles, including designing most buildings to lead standards. Further evidence of this commitment can be found in IAIA's multi-phase campus solar master plan, as well as water harvesting infrastructure that's being incorporated in several areas of the campus. To date, the college has added a ground-mounted solar array, in addition to arrays atop three very large buildings on campus. The next phase of this project will commence very soon with the college eventually placing arrays atop eight buildings with a total solar output of 1.4 million kilowatt hours per year. So as you can see, we've been busy and continue to stay busy as we build on IAIA's legacy of providing a world-class arts education and a facility that's second to none. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Patsy Phillips. I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and I'm the director for the IAI Museum of Contemporary Native Arts downtown. I wanna thank Felipe for inviting me today and for organizing this day. I've enjoyed it and um, I know a lot about IAI. I'm in my 15th year, but I learned more today, so thank you. I came from the Smithsonian, the National Museum of the American Indian and Dr. Martin recruited me and the Smithsonian has a saying that people go there to die. Now, what that means is you can go there for the rest of your career and they can't fire you no matter what. So I took a chance 15 years, almost, well, 14 plus years ago. So anyway, it's been an honor and I've really enjoyed serving as the director. So I'm gonna talk about a few things and it's gonna sound like I'm bragging, but I'm not because I'm gonna first give credit to everyone who's worked at the museum past and present. And what I'm gonna talk about is taking everyone and also IAIA. We've had a lot of support at IAIA. I liked what Alfred Youngman said this morning. He said, artists make the school. It's not the school that makes the artist. So I'm going to say, artists make the museum. It's not the museum that makes the artist. And we have shown exceptional artists over the years. And hopefully all of you have visited. If not, please come visit. So in November last year, we created a strategic plan. And we included students, faculty, um, academic dean, uh, Felipe came, Dr. Martin came. Many of us were there over two days. And we really worked on our direction for the museum. Uh, we re-identified our mission statement to 
to elevate contemporary indigenous art through exhibitions, collections, programs, partnerships, and new research. That's pretty broad, but we really can be effective in all those categories. Our vision is to be the leading museum for interpreting, exhibiting, collecting, and empowering the most progressive contemporary indigenous art globally. In 2019, the museum received accreditation from the American Alliance of Museums. Now that's really significant. It's the first time it received accreditation and less than 1% of the museums nationally have this uh, recognition. So it was a lot of work. And again, it was many years of work, but the team in the end all came together and we, re and we received that accreditation. USA Today, who is the, uh, they, they do a study every year. It's called the Visitor's Choice. And uh, they rated us in the top five museums of art museums over the last two years. Last year we were three, this year we came down or up, whatever, to five. But still, we're up in the top five. Um, so we, we continue to elevate indigenous, uh, contemporary indigenous arts in the field. And really the museum has received a lot of recognition over the years. And I like to always point out our most recent exhibition called Exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology. So what that does is look at indigenous communities globally and how they're affected by nuclear waste and uranium mining. And that is a huge topic. It really affects indigenous peoples. So we have a superb exhibit that came out of that and also a catalog. And now it's traveling to three major venues. It's currently, let's see, it's currently in Saginaw. I think I have somewhere here where all it's going. It's uh, going to the Armory in LA and it's going to the El Paso Mu Museum of Art. And um, these are all non-native venues. And so our goal is to educate audiences both about indigenous art and about the Insti Institute of American Indian Arts. So our fundraising has also been unprecedented. We fundraise, we receive federal dollars and sometimes state dollars. And then we also fundraise. We've gotten money from the Andy Warhol Foundation, from Art Bridges. We have a long list of them. But where it's really unprecedented these days is we have, uh, we received a Mackenzie Scott. So we received $3 million from Mackenzie Scott. And if you don't know who that is, it's Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, and she's giving her billions to small organizations that are making a difference. So it's literally a phone call. We want to give you $3 million. Like, whoa, <laughs> that's more than our budget. So anyway, it's really exceptional. And, uh, and also, I, I got five million the year before that. This was a couple years we got McKinsey Scott. Also, the Ford Foundation recognized the museum as one of 20 BIPOC organizations in the, in the country. And they're calling us America's Cultural Treasures. And they too reached out. It was a phone call. We had worked with the Ford Foundation for many years, but it was a phone call and they said, we want to give you $1.7 million. And I'm like, okay, we'll take it. So there are only two native organizations that have this recognition. All the others are major art organizations, performing arts, et cetera, around the country. And uh, we're part of this consortium that will be for the next four years. They're gonna give us, the other thing that's so important about these dollars is they're unrestricted. So it's exceptional. I've been a fundraiser my whole career. It's exceptional to get unrestricted funds. Um, so we decided, uh, the museum has never had an endowment, and so we decided to set up an endowment. So we put two million of the McKinsey Scott money into an endowment, and uh, we may put more, we just don't know yet. We're also doing some renovations at the museum. So the um, Ford Foundation, we're also really small staffed. I don't know who knows us uh, very closely, but we're, we really have just maybe, maybe there are six or seven, us, seven of us that do the core work. The others are um, security and the museum store. So with the Ford Foundation, we hired a program membership assistant 
curatorial assistant and a security guard. And we had to, we had to hire people in order to do work that all this, all this money was coming in, so we had to hire. Also, the Mellon Foundation called me, and again, it was out of the blue, and they said, uh, you have a week to apply for this grant, and that's unusual. So, of course, we applied, and they gave us what we asked, which was 340000 And IAI is already really successful with the Mellon Foundation, and so once you're in the door, they really support you, so hopefully they continue. But we hired two staff. These are all grant-funded staff. Um, an assistant registrar and a project manager for co conservation. Uh, we also uh, have received CARES Act funding, and so we're doing major renovations. I guess some may not call them, major. Larry may not call them major re <laughs> renovations, but we're changing some spaces at the museum. So we don't have an education space, for example. And so we're, um, renovating a space that now will become an education center so we can educate K through 12, for example, and also invite IAI to come back down and start teaching again. We're also re renovating some spaces because we don't have enough office space for all of our new employees. So we're, we're changing some spaces around. So I already mentioned exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology is a traveling show. And we also have Action Abstraction Redefined. And that's a major show. Dr. Laura Evans was one of the curators. It came from, it's from our collection, essentially. And Art Bridges is a major foundation, and they're funding uh, museums to get their collections out in the field. So we received some of that money, and it allowed us to build crates. And now it's traveling maybe to five or six venues. And they're, again, all non-native. Colorado Springs Fine Art, St. Louis Fine Art, and Arkansas Museum of Art are some of them that are, they're traveling to. But again, that gives us the opportunity to educate non-native audiences. So that's, that's a pretty big deal for us. I always like to say when I talk with people, they say, well, how is the museum connected with IAIA? And I say, although I don't know if people believe me, but everything we do is for the students and for our future generations. So I'm going to list a few things that we're doing in that regard. Mokna's leadership and working with students directly affects them when they get into the field. We, um, they get to see some of the best artwork in the world. So one of our shows recently, we had the Inuit from Greenland. We had the Aboriginal from Australia. We had Ainu from Japan. We brought all that work here, and that's the work that's traveling now, exposure. I would never see that work, and I travel, and I look at major shows. So students, the students get to come to the museum and look at these works. And I'm always learning. I just recently learned about an artist. I'm like, how come I don't know that artist? Because <laughs> I've been in the field so long. I, I don't know the young people like I used to, <laughs> but I know the older people. So, you know, there's nowhere else in this town for students to see this kind of work. And so that's their opportunity. When we bring, when we bring artists into town, we will have them come out and lecture, for example. So they come and uh, they get to hear these artists from around the world. Um, we curate a student BFA show every spring, and we do it at that time so that when the graduating seniors graduate, their parents who are in town can come see their work in a museum. We also always work with a student, and we assist the, we, we teach the student how to curate, so it's an assist, assistant curator. Students always help with deinstall and install, always. And I, I get a lot of feedback, they love it. And we love them helping. So they're either interns or they're work study, and sometimes they're volunteers. We always hire students. We have right now, I'd have to think it through, but we probably have four or so uh, alum, I, I, I alum who are working for us. Um, so we, we mentor, uh, 
IAI has an official mentoring program and we mentor students. And so I always am part of the mentor program, for example, and I encourage my staff to as well. We all have an open door policy and, and I always, when I lecture, when the, other, when the other staff lecture, we tell students that if you wanna learn more about what we're doing, if you wanna follow us around. Now, of course, it's the student's responsibility to take us up on this. And they don't always do it, but sometimes they do. So there are other, other things that we do, but we always try to include the students. One of the things that I've done since I've been here is I take students on international experiences. So like the Venice Biennale, I run a competition, I get a committee with like Philippe and others, and we select the students to go on that. We recently went to Prague, where we went to the International Council of Museums conference. We took two students and a faculty. And it's just such an exceptional opportunity. So we specifically selected museum study students so they could have that experience. I've taken students to Documenta, which is in Germany. I've taken them to Sydney, Sydney, Australia, to the Biennale there. So every couple, three years, I run a competition and then take. It also relies on fundraising. So I have to come up with the funds generally. But now that we're kind of flush, but don't tell anybody, <laughs> I can use some of those funds, which is what we recently did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so what I wanna say that we're working on, that the field really needs, and that is we need more curators and we need more educators. Now, I've always known about curators because I've been in the field so long and you know we all talk, and so we know about curators. It's hard to find indigenous curators. Either they're teaching or else they're in positions they don't wanna leave. So we've been recently looking for an educator and um, they're not out there either, not many of them at least. So what I want to do, and I was talking about, talking with Carrie Bell, Billy this morning, and she was telling me that NMAI had part of their legislature is to educate curators. And I never knew that. I mean, I was an insider and I never knew that. I'm like, really? So I'm gonna work with NMAI. The Getty has had a program. So, and also IAI, obviously, for training. So we really need to train uh, educators and uh, curators. So we just need, you know, we need more indigenous peoples in the field. And that's what I was told when I first got in the field, which is now 30 plus years ago. But I'm gonna say that still today. We need more indigenous peoples in the field working. So that's our kind of our long-term goal, and I think an important goal that we have in mind, so thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, hello again, everyone. I'm Felipe Estudio Colón. I'm the academic dean here at the Institute of American Indian Arts. I've uh, been here for about 10 years. My background is actually in museums. I started as a uh, curator uh, and somebody who worked for a number of, of museums working in particular with indigenous communities and more specifically Puebloan communities. I'm a Laguna Pueblo member myself. Uh, it was the focus of my graduate work and so uh, of course I, I kind of became a no-brainer and in my 10 years here of course I've acted as faculty, department chair for museum studies and most recently the last few years as our academic dean. Uh, and I am very fortunate, and really the entire academic division is incredibly fortunate to be really the beneficiaries of the work of those who you've heard from on the panel, uh, as well as Dr. Martin, our board of trustees, and our foundation board. It's really through the work of, of these departments and these individuals that academics gets to do the amazing work that it does, and gets to build upon the amazing legacies that we uh, were fortunate to hear about today. Um, so in total, the academic division actually encompasses six undergraduate departments, uh, spanning dozens of disciplines, uh, three graduate departments, as well as several academic support departments, including, of course, our library, um, which holds the world's largest collection of written materials on contemporary indigenous art and culture. 
the online learning department, which uh, facilitates our online hybrid and high flex classes and curriculum, which allows IAIA's curriculum to reach students really around the world. And as you can imagine, especially in the last two years, our online learning department has been central to our transition to predominantly online during the pandemic. A small crew, but incredibly influential in keeping our, co our community connected and keeping our coursework going. And as you've heard uh, here and there throughout, uh, uh, the academic division also oversees the Research Center for Contemporary Native Art, which is currently under construction in the ELS Science and Technology Building. Uh, as Larry mentioned, it's really a three-phase process in the construction of that. First, the vacating of some of our older spaces and the creation, actually, of some bespoke spaces for those classrooms that had vacated there. Second, we'll be renovating that space uh, in its physical format to accommodate a new, uh, I think it's roughly 9,000 square foot, is it? <laughs> uh, archive, reading room, uh, resource space, including classrooms. Um, and then the third phase is actually to upgrade within that building all of our HVAC in order to accommodate um, the best possible standards for the preservation of the incredible collection that we have here that it really forms the basis for our curriculum, forms the basis of really our history and our identity. And of course, this uh, symposium, as well as our ongoing alumni profiles and our work that we will continue, presumably for the rest of time, about collecting our stories from our alumni, is really a cornerstone of that collection in the Research Center. And again, the academic division is incredibly um, honored and incredibly blessed to be in a place with so much knowledge, so much experience, uh, so much hard work that all of our departments, all of our divisions put in. Um, of course, as you've heard, really, the uh, Rancho Viejo campus gave IAI a new lease on life. Without this place, we really would not exist as an institution, and I like to think we've really taken advantage of that. Of course, you've heard, as you know, Larry shared, we've had a master plan. We've developed, under Dr. Martin's leadership, numerous buildings and expansions and upgrades, and again, all with an eye towards benefiting the students, benefiting our academic mission as an institution, being that place where we can gather, we can talk, we can learn, and we can share. Um, within, the H or, excuse me, within the academic division itself, we've dedicated ourselves to a lot of improving over the years, learning about what's happening in the field, learning about what the opportunities are for our students. We've made major investments in infrastructure, including things like HVAC, but also in acquiring really cutting edge technologies and equipment, things that now I'm hearing from the alumni couldn't probably have even imagined having back at our SFIS and our CSF campus. Um, you know, some good examples of this, and you may all be familiar with, of course, is our cutting edge equipment in the dome, uh, 3D rendering uh, for games, for virtual environments, for really experiencing art in a way that is almost unheard of at any other institution in the world. Um, our new fab lab, uh, which was a part of, again, phase one of our research center, the creation of a dedicated space for things like laser cut and 3D printing, really taking the imagination of our students and making it physical reality. Um, and also things like our motion capture system, which was actually upgraded over this summer. Uh, and we have the first cohort of students learning for the first time how to create immersive virtual environments, again, with an eye towards storytelling, with being able to share that indigenous history in a way that is receivable to a 21st century audience of interest. And of course, in this amazing time with all of these amazing opportunities to really teach our students how to better express their artistry, their history, and their culture to the world. Um, as we look to our future, we have actually a lot going on, as you can imagine. Um, you know, first and foremost, again, we've been incredibly blessed these last few years with a lot of interest. Not to say that the world hasn't been interested in IAI in the past, but I think we're really at the, at the incredible moment where everybody is looking to IAI, and the result of that has been some incredible partnerships with organizations like CalArts and a, a future exchange program where we're actually going to send students out to California. They're also sending their students to us in recognition of the fact that the students out in California can learn as much from the native community, the native art, the native cultures, and the work we do here as we might learn from an institution with such a, a renown and such an amazing name behind it. We also, of course, have uh, intensified our refinement of our programs, and especially in light of the pandemic, the integration of more online, hybrid, high-flex learning is not only something that, of course, prepares our students for the world that they're entering, which is increasingly digital, but also gives a whole new generation of students who might have been disenfranchised from the IAI experience to now experience it in their home communities. 
We never want to take our students out of their culture, out of their community. You know, much of what we do here is about instilling in them the value of that culture, of that community, and teaching them how to be leaders in those communities. And things like our virtual learning give a student an opportunity to actually learn from their home community, to not have that separation. Of course, we love to have them here. We love to celebrate here in this place with them. But we understand, and as you heard from many of the alumni, leaving home is a difficult thing to do. And the new technologies are making it increasingly easier for us to work with them, through them, and with our constituent communities, which, as you heard from Nena, 97 separate tribal nations represented in our student body. This is truly an international school. This is a school with incredible reach, incredible potential that our alumni have taken incredible opportunity with and that we hope that the current generation of students and future generation of students do the same. In terms of a lot of our programs, um, of course, we again have intensified. We have looked to our curriculum. We have revised our curriculum. We've engaged in what we call indigenous assessment, which is looking truly at the outcomes of the work, not just what looks like on paper, not just what our accreditation agency thinks is valid and important that we teach our students here, but really truly looking at what it is that they get from the classes. What is it that they get from the experience here at IAI? And we were very fortunate. We had a few incredible scholars, uh, one of which is still with us, one of who is emeritus. But uh, Dr. Stephen Wall and Dr. Laura Evans put together this template for, that we now call indigenous uh, assessment. And it's actually something that is taking off around higher education all over the country. Other institutions are looking to us and saying, hey, these natives have a good idea. Maybe our quantitative analysis isn't enough. Maybe we really need to look at these outcomes and maybe this is something that we really need to think about integrating in our own institutions. The product of that, again, has been really a refinement of a lot of our programs. Uh, in some cases, jettisoning some classes that are maybe just too old. Um, classes that we're talking about technologies that aren't really relevant anymore. But of course, a lot of our sort of history is about really adding classes, <laughs> adding new opportunities, adding new things to the learning of our students. And to that end, we've expanded our programs, expanded our requirements, expanded and deepened really a lot of what the students are learning here. And I'm really happy to say that over the last uh, few years in particular, of course, we've had the uh, beginnings of our new MFA programs and studio arts and cultural administration, programs that are really designed not just to sort of elevate the technical abilities and skills of our students, but to really teach them how to be successful and functional professionals, how to work with museums and galleries, how to be leaders in their communities, how to take the mission and the work of IAI and spread it across, again, the hundreds of indigenous communities that are represented, as well as really communities all over the world. We've also, over the last few years, started a number of new certificate programs. As you've probably seen at many higher education institutions, certificates are not only a way to really heighten education around a specific topic, but we find it as a great way to attract students to IAIA. Um, increasingly, students who are entering our institution, they're not just going for a single major, they're diversifying. They're really following, in many ways, the encouragement of our predecessors, like Linda Lamaoftoa, who, if you recall this morning, said, take as many classes as you can, take them in as in many different disciplines as you can. Our students are really learning from that, and they're doing that. And the certificates are an amazing way for them to expand upon that. So we now have new certificates in areas like uh, broadcast journalism. We have certificates in areas of gaming and animation. We have certificates that have been enhanced, in particular lately, in business and entrepreneurship, te teaching really the full range of skills to make successful artists, to make successful professionals who are not, again, losing their indigeneity, but using it as an asset in a world that really is in desperate need of indigenous values and indigenous understanding. We're also on the cusp of a number of really exciting developments, some of which are a little further along than others, but I'm gonna give the full list and hope that everybody stays tuned for what's to come next. Uh, we are looking currently at a graphic narrative certificate and minor program, an interdisciplinary program that's gonna bring together our creative writing and studio arts, graphic narrative being a particularly um, in, of, of interest to our students as well as our faculty, and again, in the expression in particular of stories. Uh, we are also in the process, um, and Rosemary, you're going to be happy about this one, of looking at a certificate program in fashion. And <laughs> this is going to be a program that's going to incorporate fashion, textile, and design. So again, a very interdisciplinary program. As you heard from Nena, some of our upcoming partners for internships, many of them are in the industry. It's Ralph Lauren, it's Neiman Marcus, it's Nike. All of these are folks who have come to us. They've said, 
In our industries, the voice that is missing is the indigenous voice, and we don't want to just extract that. We don't want to just um, appropriate that. We want to work with those artisans. We want to work with those students. We want to work with those who have, again, that cultural and artistic knowledge. So very exciting developments on that area. And uh, we are also in the process now, and we're, I'm going to say, four to five years out from this, but starting the process of developing the very first PhD program at IAIA. This is something that, uh, under, again, the leadership of Dr. Martin, our board of trustees, uh, and all of our faculty and staff and all of our supporting uh, departments who work with us uh, have really made a possibility and a reality. We have come a very long way since moving to this Rancho Viejo campus only 20 years ago. We've gone from the first undergraduate programs to our three graduate programs, and now we're talking about PhDs. And of course, our graduate programs and our PhD in particular, they will always have that indigenous core. It is not about separating the art and the culture, it's about bringing it together. And that way, this PhD program, as we're envisioning it, is going to be really one of a kind, um, something that is really gonna produce the next generation of the top tier scholars across the indigenous Americas, across, of course, every institution where they go to work, really changing the landscape of the way that indigenous people are thought about and talked about and the way that their art is understood in the world. So that's a little taste of what's to come, and I encourage you all to stay tuned. Uh, of course, our website is the best place to find out more about how we develop and what we do. Um, and again, we look forward to continuing to grow with our communities. And last but not least, I wanted to introduce, and I think he's on the Zoom, uh, from this morning, for those who joined us, will probably recognize uh, Lauren Kiva. He is our board chair. Uh, Going to share a bit about, again, today in the future. Well, um, <laughs> I am so excited and energized by, uh, particularly Jason's uh, description and, or and Felipe's description of, of what we're doing, um, and I don't know how to really add upon that. Um, other than to say that, as I say, Dr. Martin has collected, assembled what I think is the best collection of scholars, faculty, staff, assistants that we've had in our history. Um, uh, Patsy's description of what's going on is, 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 you know, the museum is, you know, you think of 12 cylinders, well, we're about 15 cylinders and adding on one every day uh, to our engine. Um, Nena has, has done an excellent job in terms of our enrollment management. Um, and uh, we've got great aspirations to perhaps grow that, uh, constrained only by the fact that we don't have enough dorm space, but that, again, is another issue. Um, Larry Maribal has been really the best um, financial director that we've had in our history. Uh, everything that he gives us, every presentation is spot on. Uh, we are so well run. Uh, I don't think we've had a spec on our audit reports for the last 10 years or so, um, and the, the management reports we get from our auditors are, are, are first rate. Um, I don't really know what to say beyond that. Um, if anybody has any questions of me uh, representing the Board of Trustees, I also like to say that, that I think um, working with the White House, uh, we have the best Board of Trustees. I'm probably going to insult somebody in the past, but I think we have the most um, uh, cohesive functional set of, of, of trustees representing Native America across the board in, in our history. And I'm particularly proud of, of, of the work uh, that we've done working with the White House to get those people on our board. Uh, these are all people that are what they call roll up your sleeves. They're not absentee trustees. They all want to participate and they participate mightily in our committee work and our structure work. Um, I'd like to call a special a shout out. I don't know if she's in the, in the room to uh, Joanne Balzer, uh, who is our Energizer Buzzy. Uh, she does so much for Santa Fe for Native American arts and cultures. Uh, I again have to recognize our, our foundation. Um, they are um, the heart and soul of our fundraising um, efforts, apart from, you know, calls out of the blue to people like, you know, from Mackenzie Scott Bezos and the Ford Foundation. We'll take those calls any day of the week. But I think that, that our fundraising really comes from our brand. Um, the reason that they give us this money is that they know it's going to be put to very good use, um, whether it's in the museum, whether it's in our programs, whether it's in, in building up our infrastructure. Um, this place is run as a first-rate educational institution, as a first-rate academic institution, and really as a first-rate 
I, I hesitate to use the term, but business, because it is run, uh, you know, with, with all the checks and balances of, of, of how you run a, 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 a business. And we are in the business of educating students. That's what our job is. And I think, as I say, um, I am so proud of, of the work that everybody does. And as I said earlier this morning, um, I go on campus literally every single time and I get a big grin. And I just want to say, you know, what an amazing place this has come. This has come. Um, and I'm looking forward. I don't think I'll be around in the next 60 years, but I think our legacy is going to be uh, very much imprinted on, on what goes forward today. So I'd just like to thank all of the day's participants and pass it back to Felipe or whoever I pass it back to, uh, unless anybody has any questions. Yeah, thank you. Right, right on time there, Lauren. So we wanted to open up in the last 10 minutes for questions and answers. So if anybody on Zoom or in the room has any questions for the panel, please feel free to raise them. People are tired. <laughs> yeah, it has been quite a day. Oh, Pat. Um, where can people volunteer to add to what's going on at IAI? What are the different roles where they could volunteer? Yeah, yeah. so the question was about uh, what, what opportunities, what roles do we have for folks that want to be a part of the community, have to, to volunteer and work with us? Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll lead off with the academics. So, um, you know, a lot of our focus right now coming out of the pandemic is in bringing together those folks whose voices might have been marginalized in the last few years, those voices in particular amongst the art and indigenous communities. And I know that of course we have a lot of folks who are represented in that community uh, joining us today and a lot of folks who have amazing contacts in that community. So a lot of our volunteering opportunities on the academic side right now is to helping us to diversify the experience that our students have, putting us in contact with those folks, those artists, those organizations, those institutions um, who can really lend uh, a hand in helping to, again, prepare the next generation of indigenous leaders and artisans. We have a volunteer program at the museum. Uh, we have docents and volunteers. And so you can, if you're interested, we, we do all kinds of things. We have them research for us, for our exhibitions. Uh, they can work events and just a variety of things. And we have a, before COVID, we had quite a few docents and now we don't have as many. So we, we would like more docents in particular. And for student services, um, we have our mentorship program, so um, we're happy to accept volunteers mentoring our students. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Larry, do you need any volunteer bookkeepers? We can always <laughs> use volunteer bookkeepers. <laughs> <laughs> and facilities folks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would hap I'd be happy to take down your information. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the question was actually from one of our, our former faculty um, at our Cerritos campus, and it's asking how now in, in, in his later, <laughs> how he can re reconnect. Um, yeah. And so, you know, certainly, as I mentioned, there's, there's opportunities certainly within the academic program to connect. And I think in your case in particular, um, you know, let's talk about connecting with the department chairs for the areas that you're most of interest in. You know, we have opportunities for guest speakers, guest presenters, you know, again, artist lectures. Uh, and of course, this event and a lot of the work we're doing is leading into the collection of more stories about our history as an institution. And I, I could see, I'm sure you have amazing stories to tell about the experiences you had as a faculty and, and 
that would be a great thing to add into our resources and our research center. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's definitely connect, and I'll, I'll take I mean, down your it's information. When I was here, that was the Brit Shoulder, well, all of us, mm -hmm. you know, the whole crew was here. Yeah. And that wonderful photograph, mm -hmm. the poster that the governor had in her office of that thing, I'm the guy all the way over to the right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we actually do have a puppetry class here, so I think you'll be a hot commodity <laughs> for the next time that runs. Yeah, let's definitely connect. Yeah, yeah thank you. Now nah, this is it. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, we will certainly call on you, and thank you again for coming. Oh, yes. Good question. So the, the question was with regard to um, it within the IEI's planning, um, does it have a plan for how it will stand with the indigenous communities who are you know quickly evolving in their 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 sense of, of of self and their indigeneity, their nationhood? Is that along the lines of, of what you were? So in the early days, IIA was seen as a magnificent jewel that it, it was taken, these programs the way it was put together, it was taken and distributed worldwide to the other indigenous communities. <laughs> I do not know offhand how many of those communities still exist and still are using that plan or readapted and mm -hmm. are still making it work. Mm -hmm. but the thing is, it's a beautiful scene that we have Yeah, so the, the question is uh, uh, about how IEI um, relates to the other indigenous communities, how it will use its, its, its place um, to help further uh, the, the important work that's taking place really around the globe uh, for indigenous communities. Um, so, you know, certainly, uh, and Dr. Martin, did you want to talk a little about our 25 strategic plan? Um, Using technology to, to teach, and uh, 
to finding that a lot of students aren't, or individuals now aren't willing to invest four to six years in, in a college education. They want to accelerate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think using technology, we can reach other, and, and we have been through our, our program, reaching indigenous audiences worldwide. And there's mm -hmm. certain, there's a connectivity, there's a similarity, there are parallels, mm -hmm. and we can learn from them and they can learn from us as well. So we would, we would encourage that yeah. going yeah. forward. Yeah, so for, for those online, Dr. Martin was sharing that, you know, the, the pandemic has accelerated the amount of technological interconnectivity that IEI does with indigenous communities and, and students really around the world. Um, and I think too, uh, my, my alluding to the 2025 strategic plan is, is uh, <clears throat> one of our strategic directions is to really impact uh, indigenous art and culture globally. And it's the first time I think in some time, if, if not the first time ever, that we've included the word globally uh, into our work as an institution. And of course, Patsy's work, amazing work, you know, working with artists from indigenous communities around the world, um, you know, Larry's am amazing work in his area of really the campus greening and integrating into not just our curriculum, but really our activities here, a sense of our responsibility uh, to sustainability, um, to the longevity of this place that we call home, and using our platform to instill those same values uh, in our students who will then will go out through the world using that same technology to spread that same message from this place that carries so much uh, value and weight, and as you said, you know, a jewel, um, to, to do that, to spread that indigenous value, those indigenous voices through the world, and hopefully to, to help move things in a better direction, uh, to help move this earth towards uh, the kind of sustainability that indigenous people have espoused for time immemorial. And what we're doing with technology today is live stream this event, and every time we do that, whether it's our commencement or uh, the Jane Goodall uh, program that we, we launched, it, So again, reiterating that technology is the way we're reaching the world, uh, the way that we're getting this 60-year-old message out in a, in a new way for, for a new audience who, again, as we heard even from some of our panelists, might have some old-fashioned ideas about indigenous people and their values and their work. So thank you. Do we have any other questions? OK. Well, we're coming right up at 5 o'clock, uh, and as uh, Dr. Evans mentioned, we do have open studios and lots of food to share, so we welcome you all to stay with us here on campus, make your way over to the academic building, get to meet some of our amazing artists and residents, and uh, share in some food before you leave us today. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one more? Can I just add, uh, being involved in Yeah, so for those online, just a, a final thought, sharing. Oops, excuse me. That uh, you know, through through the leadership, through the work that we're doing here, through the instilling of leadership in our students, that we are really on the cusp of something pretty remarkable, monumental. Um, that we have momentum now, we have reach now, we have the ear of the world now in a way that we almost haven't had in our history, and that we're taking advantage of that. We're using the opportunity to spread the message, spread the word, and then spread indigeneity. Um, so. Thank you all again so much for attending. Uh, we'll also have a recording of this whole session available tomorrow, um, so please look out for that for any sessions that you might have missed. And again, continue to visit our website for lots of future opportunities to connect with IA. So thank you again. Good job, Felipe. Good job. You must want to go to sleep. Huh? <laughs>